Chapter 17 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 17 The discourse of the merchant had plunged our poor Renzo into an inexpressible agitation and alarm. There was no doubt that his adventure was noised abroad, that people were in search of him. Who could tell how many bailiffs were in pursuit of him? Who could tell what orders had been given to watch at the villages, inns, and along the roads? True it was that two only of the officers were acquainted with his person, and he didn't bear his name stamped on his forehead. Yet he had heard strange stories of fugitives being discovered by their suspicious air or some unexpected mark. In short, he was alarmed at every shadow. Although at the moment he quitted Gorgonzola the bell struck the Ave Maria and the increasing darkness diminished his danger, he unwillingly took the high road, with the intention, however, of entering the first path which should appear to him to lead in the right direction. He met some travellers, but, his imagination filled with apprehensions, he dared not interrogate them. "'The host called it six miles,' said he. "'If, in travelling through bypass, I make it eight or ten, these good limbs will not fail me, I know. I am certainly not going towards Milan, and must therefore be approaching the Ada. If I keep on, sooner or later I must arrive there. The Ada has a voice sufficiently loud to be heard at some distance, and when I hear it, there will be no longer any need of direction. If there is a boat there, I shall cross immediately. If not, I will wait until morning in a field, upon the ground like the sparrows, which will be far better than a prison. He saw a crossroad open to the left, and he pursued it. I play the devil, continued he. I assassinate the lords. A packet of letters, my companions keeping watch. I would give something to meet this merchant face to face on the other side of the Ada. Oh, when shall I reach the beautiful stream? I would ask him politely where he picked up that fine story. No, my good sir, that devil as I am. It was I who aided Ferrer and like a good Christian, saved your superintendent of provisions from a rough joke that those ruffians, my friends, were about to play on him. I, while you were keeping watch over your shop, and that enormous packet of letters, in the hands of the government. See, sir, here it is, a single letter written by a worthy man, a monk, a hair of whose beard is worth the, but in future learn to speak with more charity of your neighbors. However, after a while, these thoughts of the poor traveller gave way to more urgent considerations of his present difficulties. He no longer feared pursuit or discovery, but darkness, solitude, and fatigue combined to distress him and retard his progress. A chill north wind penetrated his light clothing, his wedding suit, and, uncomfortable and disheartened, he wandered on in hopes of finding some place where he might obtain concealment and repose for the night. He passed through villages, but did not dare ask shelter. The dogs howled at his approach, and induced him to quicken his steps. At single houses near the roadside his fatigue tempted him to knock for shelter, but the apprehension of being saluted with the cry of, Help! Thieves! Robbers! banished the idea from his mind. Leaving the cultivated country, he found himself in a plain covered with fern and broom, and thinking this a favorable symptom of the near vicinity of the river, he followed the path across it. When he had advanced a few steps he listened but in vain. The desolation of the place increased the depression of his spirits. Strange forms and apparitions, the birth of former tales and legends, began to haunt his imagination, and to drive them away he began to chant the prayers for the dead. He passed through a thicket of plum trees and oaks, and found himself on the borders of a wood. He conquered his repugnance to enter it, but as he proceeded into its depths every object excited his apprehensions. Strange forms appeared beneath the bushes, and the shade of the trees, trembling on his moonlit path, with the crackling of the dead leaves between his footsteps, inspired him with dread. He would have hastened through the perilous passage, but his limbs refused their office. The wind blew cold and sharp, and penetrating his weakened frame almost subdued its small remains of vigor. His senses, affected by undefined horrors, appeared to be leaving him. Aroused to his danger, he made a violent effort to regain some degree of resolution in order to return through the wood, and seek shelter in the last village he had passed through, even if it should be in an inn. As he stopped for a moment before putting his design in execution, the wind brought a new sound to his ear. 
the murmur of running water. Intently listening to ascertain if his senses did not deceive him, he cried out, It is the other. His fatigue vanished, his pulse returned, his blood flowed freely through his veins, his fears disappeared, and guided by the friendly sound, he went forward. He soon reached the extremity of the plain, and found himself on the edge of a steep precipice, whence looking downward he discovered through the bushes the long-desired river, and on the other side of it villages scattered here and there, with hills in the distance, and on the summit of one of these a whitish spot, which in the dimness he took to be a city. Bergamo, certainly. He descended the declivity, and throwing aside the bushes with his hands, looked beyond them, to spy if some friendly bark were moving on the flood, or if he could not by listening hear the sound of oars cleaving the water. But he saw, he heard nothing. If it had been any stream less than the Ada, he would have attempted to ford it, but this he well knew to be impracticable. He was uncertain what plan to pursue, to lie down on the grass for the next six hours and wait until morning, exposed to the north wind and the damps of the night, or to continue walking to and fro to protect himself from the cold until the day should dawn. Neither of these held out much prospect of comfort. He suddenly recollected to have seen in a neighboring part of the uncultivated heath a cascinotto. This was the name given by the peasants of the Milanese to cabins covered with straw, constructed with the trunks and branches of trees, and the crevices filled with mud, where they were in the habit of placing the crop gathered during the day until a more convenient opportunity for removing it. They were therefore abandoned except at such seasons. Renzo found his way thither, pushed open the door, and, perceiving a bundle of straw on the ground, thought that sleep, even in such a place, would be very welcome. Before, however, throwing himself on the bed Providence had provided for him, he kneeled and returned thanks for the blessing, and all the assistance which had been this day afforded him, and then implored forgiveness for the errors of the previous day. Then, gathering the straw around him as some defense against the cold, he closed his eyes to sleep. But sleep was not so soon to visit our poor traveler. Confused images began to throng his fancy. The merchant, the notary, the bailiffs, the cutler, the host, Ferrer, the superintendent, the company at the inn, the crowds in the streets, assailed his imagination by turns. Then came the thought of Don Abondio, Roderick, Lucy, Agnes, and the good friar. He remembered the paternal counsels of the latter, and reflected with shame and remorse on his neglect of them. And what bitter retrospection did the image of Lucy produce? And Agnes, poor Agnes! How ill she had been repaid for her motherly solicitude on his behalf! An outcast from her home, solitary, uncertain of the future, reaping misery from what seemed to promise the happiness of her declining years. Poor Renzo! What a night didst thou pass! What an apartment! What a bed for a matrimonial couch! Tormented, too, with apprehensions of the future. I submit to the will of God, said he, speaking aloud. To the will of God. He does only that which is right. I accept it all as a just chastisement for my sins. Lucy, however, is so good. The Lord will not long afflict her with suffering. In the meantime, he despaired of obtaining any repose. The cold was insupportable. His teeth chattered. He ardently wished for day, and measured with impatience the slow progress of the hours. This he was enabled to do, as he heard every half hour, in the deep silence, the heavy sound of some distant clock, probably that of Trezzo. When the time arrived which he had fixed on for his departure, half benumbed with exposure to the night air, he stretched his stiffened limbs, and opening the door of the cascinotto, looked out to ascertain if anyone were near, and finding all silent around, he resumed his journey along the path he had quitted. The sky announced a beautiful day. The setting moon shone pale in an immense field of azure, which, towards the east, mingled itself lightly with the rosy dawn. Near the horizon were scattered clouds of various hues and forms. It was, in fact, the sky of Lombardy, beautiful, brilliant, and calm. If Renzo had had a mind at ease, he would no doubt have stopped to contemplate this splendid ushering in of day, so different from that which he had been accustomed to witness amidst his mountains. But his thoughts were otherwise occupied. He reached the brow of the precipice where he had stood the preceding night, and looking below perceived through the bushes a fisherman's bark, which was slowly stemming the current near the shore. He descended the precipice, and standing on the bank, made a sign to the fisherman to approach. He intended to do this with a careless air, as if it were of little importance. But in spite of himself, his manner was half supplicatory. The fisherman, after having for a moment surveyed the course of the water, as if to ascertain the practicability of reaching the shore, directed the boat towards it. Before it touched the bank, 
Renzo, who was standing on the water's edge, awaiting its approach, seized the prow and jumped into it. Do me a service, and I will pay you for it, said he. I wish to cross to the other shore. The fisherman, having divined his object, had already turned his boat in that direction. Renzo, perceiving another oar in the bottom of the bark, stooped to take it. Softly, softly, said the fisherman, but seeing with what skill the young man managed the oar. Ah, ah, added he. You know the trade. A very little, replied Renzo, and he continued to row with a vigor and skill beyond that of a mere amateur in the art. With all his efforts, however, the bark moved slowly. The current, setting strong against it, drove it continually from the line of its direction, and impeded the rapidity of its course. New perplexities presented themselves to the mind of Renzo. Now that the Ada was almost past, he began to fear that it might not, at this place, serve for the boundary between the states, and that, this obstacle surmounted, there would yet be others remaining. He spoke to the fisherman, and pointing to the white spot he had noticed the night before, and which was now much more distinct. "'Is that Bergamo?' said he. "'The city of Bergamo,' replied the fisherman. "'And the other shore, does it belong to Bergamo?' "'It is the territory of St. Mark.' "'Long live St. Mark!' cried Renzo. The fisherman made no reply. The boat reached the shore at last. Renzo thanked God in his heart as he stepped upon it, and turning to the fisherman, took from his pocket a berlinga and gave it to him. The man took it in silence, and with a significant look, placed his forefinger on his lip, and sang, "'A good journey to you,' returned to his employment. In order to account for the prompt and discreet civility of this man towards a perfect stranger, we must inform the reader that he was accustomed to render similar favors to smugglers and outlaws, not so much for the sake of the little gain which accrued to him thereby, as not to create enemies among these classes of people. He rendered these services, therefore, when he was sure of not being seen by the custom-house officers, bailiff, or spies. Thus he endeavored to act with an impartiality which should give offense to neither party. Renzo stopped a moment to contemplate the shore he had quitted, and where he had suffered so much. "'I am at last safely beyond it,' was his first thought. Then the remembrance of those he had left behind rushed over his mind, overwhelming it with regret and shame. For, with the calm and virtuous image of Lucy, came the recollection of his extravagances in Milan. He shook off, however, these oppressive thoughts, and went on taking the direction of the whitish mass on the declivity of the mountain, until he should meet someone who could direct him on his way. And now with what a different and careless air he accosted travellers! He hesitated no more. He pronounced boldly the name of the place where his cousin lived to ask the way to it. From the information given him by the first traveller he met, he found that he had still nine miles to travel. His journey was not agreeable. Without referring to his own causes of trouble, Renzo was affected every moment by the sight of painful and distressing objects, so that he foresaw that he should find in this country the poverty he had left in his own. All along the way he was assailed by mendicants, mendicants of necessity, not of choice. Peasants, mountaineers, tradesmen, whole families reduced to poverty, and to the necessity of begging their bread. This sight, besides the compassionate excited, made him naturally recur to his own prospects. Who knows, thought he mournfully, if I shall find work to do. Perhaps things are not as they were in preceding years. Bartolo wishes me well. I know. He is a good fellow. He has made money. He has invited me many times to come to him. I am sure he will not abandon me. And then Providence has aided me until now, and will continue to do so. Meanwhile, the walk had sharpened his appetite. He could indeed have well waited to the end of his journey, which was only two miles farther, but he did not like to make his first appearance before his cousin as a hungry beggar. He therefore drew all his wealth from his pocket, and counting it on the palm of his hand, found that he had more than sufficient to procure a slight repast, after paying for which he would still have a few pence remaining. As he came out of the inn at which he had rested to proceed on his journey, he saw, lying near the door, two women. The one was elderly, the other more youthful, with an infant in her arms, which was in vain seeking sustenance from its exhausted mother. Both were of the complexion of death. By them stood a man whose countenance and limbs gave signs of former vigor, now lost from long inanition. All three stretched forth their hands, but spoke not. What prayer could be so moving as their appearance? Renzo sighed. There is a providence, said he, as he placed in the nearest hand the last remnant of his wealth. The slight repast he had made and the good deed he had performed, 
for we are composed of body and soul, had equally tended to refresh and invigorate him. If, to afford relief to these unhappy persons, Providence had kept in reserve the last farthing of a fugitive stranger, would he leave the wants of that stranger unsupplied? He looked with renewed hope to the future. He pictured to himself the return of abundant harvests, and in the meantime he had his cousin Bartolo and his own industry to depend on, and moreover he had left at home a small sum of money, the fruit of his economy, which he could send for if needed. Then, said he, plenty will eventually return, and trade will be profitable again. The Milanese workmen will be in demand, and can set a high price on their labor. I shall have more than enough to satisfy my wants, and can lay by money, and can furnish my nice house. And then write to Agnes and Lucy to come, and then... Uh, but why wait for this? We should have been obliged to live had we remained at home. We should have been obliged to live during this winter, upon my little savings, and we can do the same here. There are curates everywhere, and they can come shortly. Oh, what joy it will be to walk together on this same road, to go to the borders of the Ada, where I will point out to them the place where I embarked, the woods through which I passed, the spot where I stood watching for a boat. He reached at last the village of his cousin. At its entrance he saw a very high house with numerous windows, and perceived it to be a silk manufactory. He entered, and amidst the noise of the water and machinery loudly demanded, If Bartolo Castaneri was within. Signor Bartolo, there he is. Signor, that's a good sign, thought Renzo. He perceived his cousin, and ran towards him, exclaiming, I am come at last. Bartolo made an exclamation of surprise, and embraced him. He then took him into another chamber, apart from the noise of the machinery, and the notice of the inquisitive, and said, I am glad to see you. But you are a droll fellow. I have invited you many times to come hither. You have always refused, and now choose a most unfavorable moment. Oh, what shall I say to you? I have not now come of my own free will, said Renzo, and he briefly, and with much emotion, related the mournful story. That's another affair, truly, said Bartolo. Poor Renzo! You have relied on me, and I will not abandon you. To say truth, workmen are not in much demand at present, and it is with difficulty that those already engaged are kept by their employers. But my master regards me, and he has money, and besides, without boasting, we are equally dependent on each other. He has the capital, and I the skill, such as it is. I am his first workman, his factotum. Poor Lucy Mondella! I remember her as if it was but yesterday that I last saw her. An excellent girl, always so modest at church, and if you passed by her cottage, I see it now, the little cottage beyond the village, with a large fig tree against the wall. No, no, said Renzo. Do not speak of it. I meant to say that if you passed it, you always heard the noise of her reel. And Don Roderick, even before I left, showed symptoms of his character. But now it seems he plays the devil outright, until God shall put a bridle on his neck. Well, as I said, we suffer here also the consequences of scarce harvests. But, apropos, are you not hungry? It is not long since I have eaten, said Renzo. And how are you off for money? Renzo extended the palm of his hand and shook his head. No matter, said Bartolo. I have plenty. Cheer up. Things will change for the better soon, and then you can repay me. I have a small sum at home, and I will send for it. Well, in the meanwhile, depend on me. God has given me wealth to spend for others, and, above all, for my relations and friends. I knew that you would befriend me, said Renzo, affectionately pressing his cousin's hand. Well, what a fuss they have made at Milan, continued Bartolo. The people seem to be mad. The report has reached us, but I shall be glad to know the particulars from you. I think we shall have enough to talk about, shall we not? 
here however things are conducted with more judgment the city purchased two thousand loads of corn from a merchant of venice the corn comes from turkey now what do you think happened the governors of verona and brescia forbade the transit of the corn what did the people of bergamo do then do you think they sent to venice a man that knew how to talk i can tell you he went to the doge and made a speech which they say deserves to be printed immediately an order was sent to let the corn pass the governors were obliged to obey the country too has been thought of another good man informed the senate that the people here were famishing and the senate granted us four thousand bushels of millet which makes very good bread and then if there is no bread you and i can eat meat god has given me wealth i tell you now i will conduct you to my patron i have often spoken of you to him he will make you welcome he is a native of bergamo a man of excellent disposition tis true he did not expect you at this time but when he learns your story and then he knows how to value a skilled workman because scarcity lasts but a little while and business must finally go on but i must hint to you one thing that you know what name they give to us milanese in this country what name they give us they call us simpletons that is certainly not a very agreeable name what matters it whoever is born in the territory of milan and would gain his living in that of bergamo must put up with it as to the people here they call a milanese a simpleton as freely as they call a gentleman sir they say so i suppose to those who will suffer it my good fellow if you are not disposed to submit to be called simpleton till it becomes familiar to your taste you must not expect to live in bergamo you would always be obliged to carry your knife in your hand and when you had killed three or four you might be killed yourself and have to appear before the bar of god with three or four murders to answer for it and a milanese who understands his trade it is all the same he would still be a simpleton do you know how my master expresses himself when he talks of me to his friends heaven has sent me this simpleton to carry on my business if it was not for this simpleton i should never get on it is the custom it is a silly custom to say the least of it and especially as it is we who have brought the art hither and who carry it on is it possible that there is no remedy none time may accomplish it the next generation may be different but at present we must submit and after all what is it why if there is no other evil ah now that you are convinced all will be well let us go to my master be of good courage in fact the promises of bartolo were realized and all was well it was truly a kind providence for we shall see how little dependence renzo could place on the treasure he had left at home the savings of his labor end of chapter seventeen Chapter 18 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 On this same day, the 13th of November, there arrived a courier extraordinary to the Signor Podesta of Lecco. The courier brought an express from the head of police, containing an order to make every possible search for a young man of the name of Lorenzo Dramalino, silk weaver, who, having escaped from the hands, of the illustrious head above cited had probably returned to the territory of lecco that in case of his discovery he should be committed to prison and an account rendered to the police of his wicked practices his ostensible means of procuring subsistence and his accomplices and furthermore that an execution should be put into the house of the above said lorenzo tramalino and everything taken from thence that might aid in throwing light on his nefarious deeds the signor podesta after ascertaining as well as he could that renzo had not returned to the village took with him the constable of the place 
and obeyed these injunctions, accompanied by a large escort of notary, constable, and officers. The key of the house was not to be found. The door was accordingly forced. The report of this transaction spread around and soon reached the ears of Father Christopher. The good man was surprised and afflicted, and not being able to gain satisfactory information with regard to Renzo, he wrote to the Father Bonaventura for intelligence concerning him. In the meanwhile, the relations and friends of Renzo were summoned to give in their testimony with regard to his depravity of character. To bear the name of Tramellino became a disgrace. The village was all in commotion. By little and little, it was understood that Renzo had escaped from the hands of justice, even in the heart of Milan, and had disappeared. It was whispered that he had committed some enormous crime, the nature of which remained unknown. The more enormous, however, the less it was believed, for Renzo was known by everybody to be a worthy youth. The greatest number thought, therefore, that it was a machination of Don Roderick to ruin his poor rival. Thus it is true that, judging from inference, and without the indispensable knowledge of facts, we often wrongfully suspect even the wicked. But we who have the facts in our hands can affirm that if Don Roderick had no share in creating these misfortunes, he rejoiced in them as if they had been his own work, and made them a subject of merriment with his friends, and above all with Count Attilio, who had been deterred from prosecuting his intended journey to Milan by the account received of the disturbances there. But this order from the police gave him to understand that things had resumed their usual course. He then determined to depart immediately, and exhorting his cousin to persist in his undertaking and to surmount every obstacle, he promised to use his efforts to rid him of the friar. Attilio had hardly taken his departure when Griso arrived, safe and sound, from Monza, and gave in his report to his master of all he had been able to collect. He told him that Lucy had been taken into the convent under the protection of the signora, that she lived there as secluded as if she were a nun, never putting her foot without the walls, that she assisted at the ceremonies of the church behind a grated window, and that it was impossible to obtain a view of her. This relation put the devil into Roderick, or rather rendered the one more controllable that sojourned there already. So many favorable circumstances concurring to forward his designs inflamed the medley of spleen, rage, and infamous desire, which he dignified by the name of love. Renzo absent, expelled, banished, every measure against him became lawful. His betrothed herself might be considered in some sort as the property of a rebel. The only man who could and would take her under his protection, the friar, would soon be deprived of the power to do so. But amid so many unlooked-for facilities, one obstacle appeared to render them unavailable. A monastery of Monza, even if there were no signora there, was an obstacle not to be surmounted even by Don Roderick. He in vain wandered in his imagination around this asylum, not being able to devise any means of violating it, either by force or intrigue. He was upon the point of renouncing the enterprise, of going to Milan, of mixing in its pleasures, and thus drowning all remembrance of Lucy. But, in place of relief, would he not find there fresh food for vexation? Adelio had certainly told the story and every one would ask him about the mountain girl. What reply would he be obliged to give? He had been outwitted by a capuchin and a clown, and, moreover, when a happy unexpected chance had rid him of the one and a skillful friend removed the other, then he, like a simpleton, abandoned the undertaking. There was enough in this to prevent his ever lifting up his head in the society of his equals, or else to compel him to go among them sword in hand. And on the other hand, how could he return and remain in this spot, where he would be tormented by the remembrance of his passion and the disgrace of its failure? How resolve? What do? Shall he go forward? Shall he draw back? A means presented itself to his mind by which his enterprise might succeed. This was to call to his aid the assistance of a man whose power could accomplish whatever he thought fit to undertake, and for whom the difficulty of an enterprise would be only an additional motive for engaging in it. But this project had nevertheless its inconveniences and dangers, the consequences of which it was impossible to calculate. No one could foresee the termination of an affair, when they had once embarked in it with this man, a powerful auxiliary, assuredly, but a guide not less absolute than dangerous. Such reflections kept Don Roderick many days in a state of painful irresolution. He received in the meanwhile a letter from his cousin, informing him that the intrigue was prospering. After the lightning came the thunder. One fine morning he heard that Father Christopher had left the convent of Pescarenico. Such complete and prompt success, and the letter of Attilio, who encouraged him by his advice and vexed him by his jokes, inclined him to hazard everything. And what above all confirmed him in his intention was the unexpected intelligence that Agnes had returned to the village, and was at her own house. We will relate these two events for the information of the reader. Lucy and her mother had hardly entered their asylum when the news of the terrible insurrection at Milan spread through Monza, and even penetrated the walls of the convent. The accounts were various and contradictory. 
The portress, who from necessity went much abroad, heard all the news, and related them to her guests. "'They have put several in prison,' said she. "'Some were taken before the bakers of the crutches, others in front of the house, inhabited by the superintendent of provision. But listen to this. There was one who escaped it, who was from Leco or thereabouts. I don't know his name, but I will ascertain it from someone perhaps you may know him this intelligence joined to the circumstance that renzo must have arrived in milan precisely on this fatal day gave some uneasiness to lucy and her mother judge what must have been their feelings when the portress came again to tell them he that fled to avoid hanging is from your village a silk weaver one tramaglino do you know him lucy was seated busy at her work it fell from her hands she turned pale, and her emotion must certainly have attracted the attention of the portress, had she not been too eagerly engaged in delivering her report to Agnes, who was standing by the door at some distance from the poor girl. Agnes, notwithstanding she was much agitated, avoided any exhibition of her feelings. She made an effort to reply that in a small village everyone was known, but she could hardly believe this to be true of Tramalino, as he was a quiet, worthy youth. She asked if it was true that he had escaped, and if it was known where he was. Escaped. He certainly has, for everyone knows it. But where no one knows? Perhaps they may take him again. Perhaps he is in safety. But if your peaceful youth falls into their hands... Here, very fortunately, the portress was called away. You may imagine the feelings of Agnes and her daughter. The poor woman and the desolate Lucy remained more than a day in cruel uncertainty, imagining the details and probable consequences of this unhappy event. Tormented with vain hopes and anxious fears, their only relief was in each other's sympathy. At length a man arrived at the convent and asked to see Agnes. He was a fishmonger of Pescarenico, who was going, according to custom, to Milan to sell his fish. The good Christopher had desired him to stop at the convent, to relate what he knew of the unhappy affair of Renzo, to Lucy and her mother, and to exhort them in his name to have patience and to confide in God. As for him, he should certainly not forget them, and would seize every possible opportunity to aid them. In the meanwhile, he would not fail to send them news every week, by this or some other means. All that the messenger could tell them further of Renzo was that it was considered certain that he had taken refuge in Bergamo. Such a certainty was a great balm to the affliction of Lucy. Her tears flowed thus bitterly, and she experienced some comfort in discursing upon it with her mother. And they united in heartfelt thanks to the great being who had saved them from so many dangers. Gertrude made Lucy often visit her in her private parlour and conversed much with her, finding a charm in the ingenuousness and sweetness of the poor girl, and delighted with listening to expressions of gratitude from her mouth. She changed insensibly the suspicions of Lucy with regard to her into a sentiment of the deepest compassion, by relating to her, in confidence, a part of her history, that part of it which she dared avow. Lucy found in the relation reasons more than sufficient to explain what had appeared strange in the manners of her benefactress. She was very careful, however, not to return the confidence Gertrude placed in her by speaking of her new fears and misfortunes, lest she should thereby extend the knowledge of Renzo's supposed crime and disgrace. She avoided as much as possible replying to the repeated enquiries of the signora on that part of her history which preceded the promise of marriage. To her modesty and innocence it appeared an impossible thing to converse freely on such a subject. Gertrude was often tempted to quarrel with her shyness, but how could she? Lucy was nevertheless so respectful, so grateful, so trusting. Sometimes her shrinking and susceptible modesty might displease her from other motives, but all was lost in the sweetness of the thought that to Lucy, if to no other human being, she was doing good. And this was true, for besides the asylum she afforded her, her conversation and endearments encouraged the timid mind of the maiden, whose only other resource was constant employment. The nuns, at her solicitation, furnished her with occupation, and, as from morning till night she plied her needle, her reel, her beloved but now forsaken reel, recurred to her memory, bringing with it a throng of painful recollections. The following week another message was received from Father Christopher, confirming the flight of Renzo, but with regard to the extent or nature of his misdemeanor there was no further information. The friar had hoped for satisfaction on this point from his brother at Milan, to whom he had recommended him, but had received for answer that he had neither seen the young man nor received the letter, that someone from abroad had been at the convent to ask for him, and not finding him there, had gone away. The third week there was no messenger, which not only deprived them of a desired and expected consolation, but also produced a thousand uneasy suspicions. Before this, Agnes had thought of taking a journey home, 
and this disappointment confirmed her resolution. Lucy was unwilling to be separated from her mother, but her anxiety to gain more satisfactory intelligence of Renzo and the security she felt in her sacred asylum reconciled her. It was therefore agreed between them that Agnes should wait on the road the following day for the return of the fishmonger from Milan, and should ask the favour of a seat in his cart, in order to go to her mountains. Upon seeing him approach, therefore, she asked him if Father Christopher had not sent any message by him. The fishmonger had been occupied the whole day before his departure in fishing, and had received no message from the friar. She then preferred her request, and having obtained a compliance with it, bade farewell to her daughter and the signora, promising a speedy return. The journey was without incident. Early in the morning they arrived at Pescarenico. Here Agnes took leave of her conductor, with many thanks for the obligation he had conferred on her, and as she was before the convent gates, she determined to speak with the good friar before she proceeded homeward. She pulled the bell. The friar Galdino, whom we may remember as the nut-collector, appeared to answer it. "'Oh, good dame, what good wind brings you here?' "'I come to see Father Christopher.' "'Father Christopher? He is not here.' "'No. Will it be long before he returns? Where is he gone?' "'To Romini.' "'To... "'To Romini.' "'Where is that?' "'Eh, eh, eh.' replied the friar, extending his arms as if to indicate a great distance. "'Miserable that I am! But why did he go so suddenly?' "'Because the Father Provincial would have it so.' "'And why did they send away one who did so much good here? Oh, unhappy me!' "'If our superiors were obliged to give reasons for what they do, where would be our obedience, my good woman?' "'But this is such a loss!' Shall I tell you how it has happened? They have probably wanted a good preacher at Rimini. They have them in every place to be sure, but sometimes a particular man is needed. The father provincial of that place has written to the father provincial of this, to know if there were such a person in this convent. The father provincial returned for answer that there was none but Father Christopher who corresponded to the description. Oh, unfortunate! When did he go? The day before yesterday. Oh, if I had only come a few days sooner as I wished to do! And do they not know when he will return? Why, my dear woman, the Father Provincial knows, if any one does. But when one of our preachers has taken his flight, it is impossible to say on what branch he will rest. They want him here, they want him there, for we have convents in the four quarters of the world. Father Christopher will make a great noise at Romini, with his Lent sermon. The fame of this great preacher will resound everywhere, and it is our duty to give him up, because we live on the charity of others, and it is but right we should serve all the world. Oh, misery, misery, cried Agnes, weeping. What shall I do without this good man? He was a father to us. What a loss! What a loss! Hear me, good woman. Father Christopher was truly a good man, but we have others equally so. There is Father Antanasio, Father Hirolamo, Father Zaccaria. Father Zaccaria is a worthy man, and you must not wonder, as some ignorant people do, at his shrill voice and his little beard. I do not say that he is a preacher, because every one has his talent but to give advice he is the man oh holy patience cried agnes with the mixture of gratitude and vexation one feels at an offer containing more good will than suitableness what is it to me what another man is when he who is gone knew our affairs and had everything prepared to help us then you must have patience i know that excuse the trouble i have given you that is of no consequence my good woman I pity you. If you decide upon asking advice of one of the fathers, you will find the convent still in its place. But let me see you soon when I collect the oil. God preserve you, said Agnes, and she proceeded homeward, confused and disconcerted as a blind man who had lost his staff. Having more information than Friar Galdino, we are enabled to relate the truth of this affair. Attilio, immediately on his arrival at Milan, performed his promise to Don Roderick and visited his uncle of the secret council. This was a committee composed of thirteen members, whose sanction was necessary to the proceedings of the government. In case of the absence or death of the governor, the council assumed temporarily the control. 
the count one of the oldest members of the council enjoyed in it some authority which he did not fail to make known on all occasions his language was ambiguous his silence significant he had the art of flattering without absolutely promising of menacing without perhaps the power to perform but these flatteries and menaces produced in the minds of others an impression of his unlimited power which was the end and purpose of all his actions towards this point he lately made a great stride on an extraordinary occasion he had been sent on an embassy to madrid and to hear him describe his reception there among other honors the count duke had treated him with particular attention had admitted him to his confidence so far as to ask him in the presence of the whole court if he were pleased with madrid and to tell him on another occasion at a window that the cathedral of milan was the most magnificent church in the king's dominions after having paid his duty to the count and presented the compliments of his cousin attilio with a seriousness which he knew well how to assume said i believe it to be my duty to inform the signor my uncle of an affair in which roderick is concerned and which requires the interference of your lordship to avert the serious consequences that ah one of his pranks i suppose in truth i must say that the injury has not been committed by roderick but he is exasperated and none but my uncle can what is it what is it there is in his neighbourhood a capuchin friar who sets himself in array against my cousin who hates him and the matter stands thus how often have i told you both to let the friars manage their own affairs it is enough for those to whom it belongs but you you can avoid having anything to do with them signor uncle it is my duty to inform you that roderick would have avoided it if it had been possible it is the friar who has quarrelled with him and he has used every means what the devil can the friar have in common with my nephew first of all he is known to be a quarrelsome fellow he protects the peasant girl of the village and regards her with a benevolence to say the least of it very suspicious i comprehend said his uncle and a ray of malice passed over the depth of dullness which nature had stamped on his countenance for some time continued attilio the friar has suspected roderick of designs on this young girl he has suspected indeed i know the signor roderick too well myself not to need to be told that he is incorrigible in such matters that roderick signor uncle may have had some trifling conversation with this girl i can very well believe he is young and moreover not a capuchin but these are idle tales not worth engaging your attention the serious part of the affair is that the friar speaks of roderick as if he were a villain and instigates all the country against him and the other friars they do not meddle with it because they know him to be hot-headed though they have great respect for roderick but then on the other hand the friar passes for a saint with the villagers and i imagine he does not know roderick is my nephew does he not know it it is that precisely which animates him to this course of conduct how how he takes pleasure and he tells it to every one he takes the more pleasure in vexing roderick because he has a protector as powerful as your lordship he laughs at the nobility and at diplomatists and exults at the thought that the girdle of st francis can tie up all the swords and that oh the presumptuous man what is his name friar christopher of said attilio the count drew his portfolio towards him and inscribed the name meanwhile attilio proceeded he has always had this character his life is well known he was a plebeian and having some wealth wished to associate with the gentlemen and not being able to succeed killed one of them for rage and to escape the gallows he assumed the habit of a friar bravo well done we will see we will see said the count in a fume now continued attilio he is more enraged than ever because he has failed in a project he had much at heart it is by this that your lordship can see what kind of a man he is he wished to have this girl married to remove her from the dangers of the world you understand and he had found his man a fellow whose name you have doubtless heard because i have understood that the secret council has been obliged to take notice of the worthy youth who is he a silk weaver lorenzo tremolino 
He who... Lorenzo Tramaligno? cried the Count. Well done, friar. Truly. Now I remember. He had a letter for a... It is a pity that. But no matter. And pray, why did Don Roderick say nothing of all this? Why did he suffer things to go so far before he acquainted one who has the power and the will to support him? I will tell you also the truth with respect to that. Knowing the multitude of cases which you have to perplex you, he has not been willing to add to them. And, besides, since I must say it, he is beside himself on account of the insults offered him by the friar, and would wish to wreak summary justice on him himself, rather than obtain it from prudence and the power of your lordship. I have tried to cool his ardour, but finding it impossible, I thought it my duty to inform your lordship, who, after all, is the prop and chief column of the house. You ought to have spoken sooner. That is true. But I hoped the affair would finish of itself, or that the friar would regain his reason, or that he would leave the convent, as often happens to these friars, who are sometimes here, sometimes there. And then all would have been settled. But... The arrangement of the business now rests with me. That is what I thought. I said to myself, the Signor our uncle is the only one who can save the honour of Don Roderick. He has a thousand means that I know not of. I know that the Father Provincial has a great respect for him, and if our uncle should think that the best thing for this friar would be a change of air, he can in a few words... Will your lordship leave the care of the business to him to whom it appertains? said the Count sharply. Ah, that is true, cried Attilio. Am I the man to give advice to your lordship? But the regard I have for the honour of the family made me speak, and I am afraid I have committed another folly, added he, affecting a pensive air. I am afraid I have injured Don Roderick in your opinion. I should have no rest if you doubted Roderick's confidence in you, and submission to your will. I hope the Signor our uncle will believe that in this case it is truly— Well, well. You two will be always friends, till one of you become prudent. Ever in fault, and relying on me to repair it. You give me more trouble than all the affairs of state. Continued he, with an expression of grave importance. Attilio proffered a few more excuses, promises, and compliments, and took his leave, with a parting injunction from his uncle to be prudent. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni Translated by George William Fenshaw This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 The Signor Count formed the resolution to make use of the Father Provincial to cut the knot of these perplexities. Whether he would have thought of this had it not been suggested by Attilio, it is impossible to determine, inasmuch as he would never have acknowledged this to be the case. It was important that one of his family, his nephew, should not be obliged to yield in an open controversy. It was a point essential to the reputation of his power, which he had so much at heart. The satisfaction which his nephew might himself take of his adversary would be a remedy worse than the disease. Should he order him to leave his castle when obedience would seem like flying from the field of battle? Legal force could have no power over the Capuchin. The clergy were entirely exempt from secular jurisdiction. All that he could attempt against such an adversary was to endeavor to have him removed, and the power to do this rested with the Father Provincial. Now the Count and the Father Provincial were old acquaintances. They saw each other rarely, but always with great demonstrations of friendship and reiterated offers of service. When all was matured in his mind, the Count invited the Father Provincial to a dinner where he found a company of choice guests, noblemen who, by their deportment, their native boldness and lordly disdain, impressed those around them with the idea of their superiority and power. There were also present some clients, who, attached to the house by hereditary devotion and the service of a life, sat at their lord's table, in a spirit of implicit submission, devouring his discourse and his dinner with unqualified and equal approbation. At table the Count led the conversation to Madrid. He spoke of the court, the Count Duke, the ministers, the family of the governor, of the bullfights, which he could well describe having seen them from a distinguished place, of the Escurial, of which he could speak in its most minute details because a page of the Count Duke had conducted him to every nook of it. 
For some time all the company were attentive to him alone. Then they divided into separate parties. He continued for a while to relate a number of anecdotes, as in confidence to the father provincial who was seated near him. But suddenly he gave a turn to the conversation, and spoke of Cardinal Barberini, who was a Capuchin, and brother to the reigning pope, Urban the Eighth. As they left the table, the Count invited the Father Provincial to go with him into another apartment. The noble lord gave a seat to the Reverend Father, and taking one himself, said, Considering the friendship that exists between us, I thought I was authorized to speak to your reverence of an affair equally interesting to us both, and which shall best be concluded between us without going farther which might, and I will tell you frankly what it is, as I am certain we shall have the same opinion on the subject. Tell me, in your convent of Pescarinico, is there not a father, Christopher, of— The father provincial bowed assent. I pray your reverence to tell me, frankly, as a friend, this man, this father. I have no personal acquaintance with him, it is true. I know many fervent, prudent, humble Capuchins, who are worth their weight in gold. I have been the friend of the Order from infancy, but in a numerous family there is always some individual, and I have reason to think that Friar Christopher is a man, a little fond of quarrelling, who has not all the prudence he might have. I imagine he has caused your reverence much anxiety. I perceive there is some intrigue, thought the Father Provincial. It is my fault. I knew that this holy man should have been sent from pulpit to pulpit, and not have been suffered to remain six months in a convent in the country. Oh, said he aloud, I am truly sorry that your excellency has conceived such an opinion of Father Christopher, for I know that his conduct in the convent is exemplary, and that he is esteemed by everybody. I understand very well. Your reverence ought... However, I would as a friend inform you of a matter which it is necessary you should know. This Father Christopher has taken under his protection a young man of that country, one of whom your reverence must have heard, him who recently escaped from the hands of justice on the terrible day of Saint Martin, Lorenzo Tramellino. I had not heard of this, said the Father Provincial. But your excellency knows that it is the duty of our order to seek those who have gone astray for the purpose of leading them back. That is true, but I thought it best to give you this information, because if ever his holiness, the intelligence of it may have been sent to Rome. I am much obliged to your excellency for the information. However, I am certain that if the affair is inquired into, it will be found that Father Christopher has had no connection with this man but for the purpose of doing him good. I know the father well. Your reverence knows, then, better than I, what he was in the world, and the pranks of his youth. It is the glory of our habit, Signor Count, that whatever a man may have been in the world, once clothed with that, he is quite another person, and since the Father Christopher has belonged to our order— I believe it from the bottom of my heart, I believe it, but sometimes, as the proverb says, the habit does not make the monk. The proverb was not much to the purpose, but the Count had cited it in place of another which occurred to him. The wolf may change his skin, but he does not become a dog. I have certain information, pursued he. If your excellency knows positively that the father has committed a fault, we are all liable to err, I wish you would inform me of it. I am his superior, unworthily, tis true, but it is my duty to watch over, and, if necessary, correct— Besides the circumstance of his granting protection to the man I have mentioned, this same Father Christopher has undertaken to contend, but we can settle it together with my nephew, Don Roderick. Oh, I am sorry for that, I am sorry for that, truly. My nephew is young, rash, and not accustomed to provocation. It becomes my duty to obtain the best information on the subject. Your Excellency, with your experience of the world, knows better than I that we are all frail, liable to error, some one way, some another, and if our father Christopher has failed, 
for these are things which had better be settled between ourselves to spread them abroad would only increase the evil these trifles are often the cause of numerous embarrassments and difficulties which might have been prevented by some decisive act in the commencement that is now our business my nephew is young the monk from what i hear has still the spirit the inclinations of a young man but we who are advanced in years too true is it not reverend father must have prudence to act for the young and apply a remedy to their follies happily there is yet time we must remove the fire from the straw an individual who does not do well in one place may in another your reverence might see to his being removed might find a suitable station for the friar at a sufficient distance or maybe easily arranged or rather there's no harm done the father provincial had expected this conclusion from the commencement of the conversation i perceive thought he where you would lead me when a poor friar gives you one of the least umbrage the superior must make him march right or wrong when the count had finished the provincial said aloud i understand what the signor count would say but before taking a step it is a step and it is not a step very reverend father it is only a natural event such as might happen in the ordinary course of affairs and if we do not do it quickly i foresee a deluge of disorders a mountain of grievances if we do not put a stop to the affair between ourselves it is not possible it should remain a secret and then it is not only my nephew you raise a wasp's nest very reverend father we are a powerful house we have adherents the father bowed in assent the count proceeded you understand me they are all people who have blood in their veins and who in the world count as something they are proud of their honour the affair will become theirs and then even those who are the friends of peace it would be a grief of heart to me to be obliged i who have always had such a friendship for the capuchins the fathers for their ministry to be efficient should be in harmony with all men no misunderstandings besides they have relations abroad and these affairs of punctilio extend ramify i too have a certain dignity to maintain his excellency my noble colleagues it becomes a party matter it is true said the provincial that father christopher is a preacher i already had the intention i have even been solicited to do it but under these circumstances and just at this time it might be considered as a punishment and to punish without being well acquainted but it is not a punishment it is a prudent precaution an honest means of preventing evils that might i have explained myself the senior count and myself understand each other very well but the facts being those which your excellency has adduced it is impossible but that they should in part be known throughout the country there are everywhere firebrands or idle spirits who find pleasure in the contest of the monks and the nobility and love to make malignant observations each one has his own dignity to preserve and i in the character of a superior have an express duty the honour of the habit it is not my own affair it is a deposit which and since the signor your nephew is so irritated as your excellency has said he might take it as a satisfaction offered to him and i do not say boast of it but you jest reverend father surely my nephew is a cavalier of consideration in the world as he should be but in his relations with me he is but a child and will do neither more nor less than i prescribe to him and moreover he shall never know it the thing is done between ourselves there is no necessity for rendering an account to him let not that give you any uneasiness i am accustomed to keep silence on important subjects as to the idle talk of others 
what can be said? It is a very common thing to see a friar leave one place to go and preach at another. However, in order to prevent malicious observations, it would be necessary on this occasion that the nephew of your excellency should give some demonstration of friendship, of deference, not for us, but for the order. Certainly, certainly, that is but right. It is not necessary, however. I know that the Capuchins are highly esteemed by my nephew, as well as by her whole family. But in this case, something more signal is very proper. Leave it to me, very reverend father. I will give such orders to my nephew. That is to say, it shall be prudently suggested to him, that he may not suspect what has passed between us, because we need not apply a plaster where there is no wound. As to that which we have agreed on, the sooner it is done, the better. And if you had a place at some distance, to remove every occasion. They want a preacher at Rimini, and perhaps without this motive I should have thought... Well, that is very opportune, very opportune. And when? Since the thing is to be done, it shall be quickly. Certainly, certainly. Better today than tomorrow. And... Continued he, rising. If I, or my adherents, can render any service to the good Father Capuchins. We have often experienced the kindness of the house, said the Father Provincial, also rising and following his vanquisher to the door of the apartment. We have extinguished a spark, said the Count. A spark, very reverend Father, which might have excited a great conflagration. Between good friends, things are easily arranged. They then entered the next apartment and mixed with the rest of the company. The Count obtained his end. Friar Christopher was made to travel on foot from Pescarenico to Rimini, as we shall see. One evening a capuchin from Milan arrived at Pescarenico with a packet for the superior. It was an order for Father Christopher to repair to Rimini for the purpose of preaching the Lent sermons. The letter contained instructions to the superior— to insinuate to the friar that he should give up every attention to any business he might have on hand in the country he must leave, and that he should not maintain any correspondence there. The friar, who was the bearer of the order, was to be the companion of his journey. The superior said nothing that night, but in the morning he sent for Father Christopher, showed him the order, and told him to take his basket, staff, and girdle, and with the friar, whom he presented to him, commence his journey. Imagine what a blow this was for our good father. Renzo, Lucy, Agnes passed rapidly over his mind, and he thought, Great God, what will these unfortunate people do when I am no longer here? But raising his eyes to heaven, he placed his hope and confidence there. He crossed his hands on his breast and bowed his head in token of obedience. He then went to his cell, took his basket, his staff, and his breviary, and after having bid farewell to his brethren and obtained the benediction of his superior, took with his companion the route prescribed. We have said that Don Roderick, more than ever determined on the accomplishment of his infamous enterprise, had resolved to seek the assistance of a powerful man. We cannot give his name, nor even hazard a conjecture with regard to it. This is the more astonishing, inasmuch as we find notices of this personage in several histories of the time. The identity of the facts does not leave a doubt of the identity of the man. But there is evidently an extreme care to avoid the mention of his name. Francesco Rivola, in his life of the Cardinal Federico Borromeo, speaking of him, says, He was a lord as powerful from his wealth as illustrious from his birth. And nothing further. Giuseppe Ripamonti makes farther mention of him as a man, this man, a person, this person. I will relate, says he, in the case of a man who, belonging to the most powerful family in the city, chose the country for his residence, and there, assuring himself of impunity by the force of crime, he set at naught the law and the magistrates, the king and the nobles. Placed on extreme confines of the state, he led an independent life. He offered an asylum to the outlaw. He was outlawed himself, and then absolved from the sentence which had led... We will hereafter quote from this author passages which will confirm the history we are about to relate. To do that which was forbidden by the laws, to be the arbiter, the supreme judge in the affairs of others, without other interest than a thirst for power, to be feared by all, 
even by those who were the objects of fear to all men, these had ever been the controlling principles which actuated the conduct of this man. From his youth he had been filled with impatient envy at the power and authority of others, superior to the greater number in riches and retinue, and to all, perhaps, in birth and audacity. He constrained them to renounce all competition with him. He took some into his friendship, but was far from admitting any equality between himself and them. His proud and disdainful spirit could only be content with those who were willing to acknowledge their inferiority, and to yield to him on all occasions. When, however, they found themselves in any difficulty, they did not fail to solicit the aid of so powerful an auxiliary, and a refusal from him would have been the destruction of his reputation, and of the high station which he had assumed, so that, for himself and others, he had performed such deeds that not all his own power and that of his family could prevent his banishment and outlawry, and he was obliged to leave the state. I believe that it is to this circumstance Ripamonti alludes. He was obliged to leave the country, but his audacity was unsubdued. He went through the city on horseback, followed by a pack of hounds, and with the sound of the trumpet, passing by the court of the palace, he sent an abusive message to the governor by one of the guards. In his absence he did not desist from his evil practices. He maintained a correspondence with his friends. Who were united to him, says Ripamonti, in a secret league of atrocious deeds. It appears that he even contracted new habits, of which the same historian speaks with mysterious brevity. Foreign princes had recourse to him for important murders, and they even sent him reinforcements of soldiers to act under his orders. At last, whether the proclamation of his outlawry was withdrawn from some powerful intercession, or that the audacity of the man outweighed all authority, he resolved to return home, not exactly to Milan, but to a castle on the frontier of the Bergamascan territory which then belonged to the Venetian state. This house, says Ripamonti, was a focus of sanguinary mandates. The household was composed of such as has been guilty of great crimes. The cooks, and the scullions even, were not free from the stain of murder. Besides this notable household, he had men resembling them, stationed in different places of the two states on the confines of which he lived. All, however tyrannical themselves, have been obliged to choose between the friendship or enmity of this tyrannical man, and it fared ill with those who dared resist him. It was in vain to hope to preserve neutrality or independence. His orders to do such or such a thing or to refrain were arbitrary and resistance was useless. Recourse was had to him on all occasions, and by all sorts of people, good as well as bad, for the arrangements of their difficulties, so that he occasionally became the protector of the oppressed, who could not have obtained redress in any other way, public or private. He was almost always the minister of wickedness, revenge, and caprice. But the various ways in which he had employed his power impressed upon all minds a great idea of his capability to devise and perform his acts in defiance of every obstruction, whether lawful or unlawful. The fame of ordinary tyrants was confined to their own districts, and every district had its tyrant. But the fame of this extraordinary man was spread throughout the Milanese. His life was the subject of popular tales, and his name carried with it something powerful and mysterious. Every tyrant was suspected of alliance with him, every assassin of acting under his orders. At every extraordinary crime, of the author of which they were ignorant, the name of this man was uttered, whom, thanks to the circumspection of our historians, we are obliged to call the unknown. The distance between his castle and that of Don Roderick was not more than six miles. The latter had long felt the necessity of keeping on good terms with such a neighbor, and had proffered his services and entitled himself to the same sort of friendship as the rest. He was, however, careful to conceal the nature and strictness of the union between them. Don Roderick liked to play the tyrant, but not openly. Tyranny was with him a means, not an end. He wished to live at ease in the city, and enjoy the advantages, pleasures, and honors of civilized life. To ensure this, he was obliged to exhibit management, to testify a great esteem for his relations, to cultivate the friendship of persons in place, in order to sway the balance of justice for his own peculiar purposes. Now, an intimacy with such a man would not have advanced his interests in such points, and especially with his uncle, but a slight acquaintance with him might be considered unavoidable under the circumstances, and therefore in some degree excusable. One morning Don Roderick, equipped for the chase, with an escort of retainers, among whom was Grizo, took the road to the castle of the unknown. End of chapter 19
Chapter Twenty of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty. The castle of the unknown was situated above a narrow and shady valley on the summit of a cliff, which, belonging to a rugged chain of mountains, was nevertheless separated from them by banks, caverns, and precipices. It was only accessible on the side which overlooked the valley. This was a declivity rather steep but equal, and continued towards the summit. It was occupied as a pasture-ground, and its lower borders were cultivated, having habitations scattered here and there. The bottom was a bed of stones, through which flowed, according to the season, a small brook or a large torrent, which served for a boundary between the two territories. The opposite chain of mountains, which formed, as it were, the other wall of the valley, was slightly cultivated towards its base. The rest was composed of precipitous rocks without verdure, and thrown together irregularly and wildly. The scene was altogether one of savage grandeur. From this castle, as the eagle from his eyrie, its lawless owner overlooked his domain, and heard no human sound above him. He could embrace out of view all the environs, the declivities, the abyss, the practicable approaches. To the eyes of one viewing it from above, the winding path which ascended towards the terrible habitation could be perceived throughout its whole course, and from the windows and loopholes the signor could leisurely count the steps of the person ascending, and examine him with the closest scrutiny. With the garrison of bravos which he kept at the castle, he could defy an army, which he would have crushed in the valley beneath before an individual could reach the summit. But none, except such as were friends with the master of the castle, dared set foot even in the valley. Tragical stories were related of some who had attempted the dangerous enterprise, but these stories were already of times long past, and none of the young vassals could remember to have encountered a human being in this place, except under his lord's authority. Don Roderick arrived in the middle of the valley, at the foot of the cliff, at the commencement of the rugged and winding path. At this point was a tavern, which might have been called a guard-house. An old sign, with a rising sun painted on both sides, was suspended before the door, but the people gave the place the more appropriate name of Malanotte. At the noise of the approaching cavalcade a young boy, well furnished with swords and pistols, appeared on the threshold of the door, and casting a rapid glance at the party, informed three ruffians, who were playing at cards within the house, of its approach. He who appeared to be the chief among them arose, and recognizing a friend of his master, saluted him respectfully. Don Roderick returned the salutation with much politeness, and asked if the signor was at the castle. The man replied in the affirmative, and he, dismounting, threw his horse's bridle to Aimwell, one of his retinue. Then, taking his musket from his shoulder, he gave it to Montanarolo, as if to relieve himself from a useless encumbrance, but in reality because he knew that on this cliff none were permitted to bear arms. Drawing from his pocket some berlinghe, he gave them to Tanabuzo, saying, Wait here till my return, and in the meantime amuse yourself with these honest people. Then presenting to the chief of the band some crowns of gold for himself and his companions, he ascended the path with Grizo. Another bravo belonging to the unknown, who was on his way to the castle, bore him company, thus sparing him the trouble of declaring his name to whomsoever he should meet. When he arrived at the castle, Griso was left at the gate, he was conducted through a long succession of dark galleys, and various halls hung with muskets, sabres, and other weapons of warfare. Each of these halls was guarded by a bravo. After having waited some time, he was admitted to the presence of the unknown, who advanced to meet him, replying to his salutation, and at the same time, as was his custom even with his oldest friends, eyeing him from head to foot. He was tall in stature, and from the baldness of his head and the deep furrows of his countenance appeared to be much older than sixty, which was his real age. His countenance and movements, the firmness of his features, and the fire which sparkled from his eyes indicated a vigor of body as well as of mind, which would have been remarkable even in a young man. Don Roderick told him he had come for advice and assistance, that, having embarked in a difficult enterprise, from which his honor did not suffer him to withdraw, he had remembered the promises of one who never promised in vain. And he then related his abominable intrigue. The unknown, who had already heard something of it, listened with much attention to the recital, both because he naturally loved such relations, and because Friar Christopher, that avowed enemy of tyrants, was concerned in it. Don Roderick spoke of the difficulty of the undertaking, the distance of the place, a monastery, the signora, but the unknown, as if prompted by the demon in his heart, interrupted him, saying that he took the charge of the affair on himself. He wrote down the name of the poor Lucy, and dismissed Don Roderick, saying, In a little while 
You will receive news from me. The reader may remember the villain Egidio, who lived near the walls of the monastery into which Lucy had been received. Now he was one of the most intimate colleagues in crime of the unknown, and this accounts for the promptness with which this lord assumed the charge of the undertaking. However, no sooner was he left alone than he repented of his precipitation. He had for some time experienced not remorse, but a vague uneasiness on account of his crimes. At every new addition to them, the remembrance of those he had previously committed passed upon his memory, if not upon his conscience, and loaded it with an intolerable weight. An undefinable repugnance to the commission of crime, such as he had experienced and subdued at the outset of his career, returned with all its force to overwhelm his spirit. The thoughts of the future contributed to render the past more painful. To grow old, to die, and then? In the image of death, which he had so often met undaunted, in face of an enemy, and which seemed to inflame his courage and double his energy, this same image now, in the midnight silence of his castle, quelled his spirit and impressed him with an awe which he in vain endeavored to resist. Formerly the frequent spectacle of violence and murder, inspiring him with a ferocious emulation, had served as a kind of authority against his conscience. Now the confused but terrible idea arose in his mind of individual responsibility at the bar of God. The idea of having risen above the crowd of vulgar criminals, and of having left them far behind, an idea which once flattered his pride, now impressed him with a sentiment of fearful solitude, and experiencing at certain moments of despondence the power and presence of that God whose existence he had hitherto neither admitted nor denied, having been wholly immersed in himself, his accumulated crimes rose up, to justify the sentence which was about to condemn him to eternal banishment from the divine presence. But this uneasiness was not suffered to appear either in his words or his actions. He carefully concealed it under the appearance of more profound and intense ferocity. Regretting the time when he was accustomed to commit iniquity without remorse, without any other solicitude than for its success, he made every effort to recall these habits and feelings, to take pleasure in wickedness and glory in his shame, in order to convince himself that he was still the same man. This accounts for the promptitude of his promise to Don Roderick. He wished to deprive himself of the chance of hesitation. But, scarcely alone, he felt his resolution fail, and thoughts arose in his mind which almost tempted him to break his word, and expose his weakness to an inferior accomplice. But with a violent effort he put an end to the painful conflict. He sent for Nibio, one of the most skillful and resolute ministers of his atrocities, and of whom he had made use in his correspondence with Egidio, and ordered him to mount his horse, to go to Monza, to inform Egidio of the affair he had undertaken, and to require his assistance for its accomplishment. The messenger returned sooner than his master expected him with the reply of Egidio. The enterprise was easy and safe. The unknown had only to send a carriage with two or three bravos, well disguised. Egidio took care of the rest. The unknown, whatever passed in his mind, gave orders to Nibio to arrange everything, and to set out immediately on the expedition. If, to perform the horrible service which had been required of him, Egidio had depended only on his ordinary means, he would not certainly have sent back so explicit an answer. But in the asylum of the convent, where everything appeared as an obstacle, the villain had a means known to himself alone. And that which would have been an insurmountable difficulty to others was to him an instrument of success. We have related how the unhappy Signora once lent an ear to his discourse, and the reader may have surmised that this was not the last time. It was only the first step in the path of abomination and blood. The same voice which then addressed her, become imperious through crime, now imposed on her the sacrifice of the innocent girl who had been entrusted to her care. The proposition appeared frightful to Gertrude. To lose Lucy in any manner would have seemed to her a misfortune, a punishment, and to deprive herself of her with criminal perfidy. To add to her crimes by dealing treacherously with the confiding girl was to take away the only gleam of virtuous enjoyment which had shone upon her mysterious and wicked career. She tried every method to avoid obedience, every method except the only infallible one that was in her power. Crime is a severe and inflexible master, against whom we are strong only when we entirely rebel. Gertrude could not resolve on that, and obeyed. The day agreed on came. The hour approached. Gertrude, alone with Lucy, bestowed on her more caresses than ordinary, which the poor girl returned with increasing tenderness, as the lamb licks the hand of the shepherd who entices it without the fold into the murderous power of the butcher who there awaits it. I want you to do me a great favor. Many are ready to obey me, but there is none but yourself whom I can trust. I must speak immediately on an affair of great importance which I will relate to you some other time. 
to the superior of the Capuchins who brought you hither, my dear Lucy. But no one must know that I have sent for him. I rely on you to carry a secret message. Lucy was astonished at such a request, and alleged her reason for declining to perform it. Without her mother, without a companion, in a solitary road, in a strange country. But Gertrude, instructed in an infernal school, showed great astonishment and displeasure at her refusal, after having been loaded with so many benefits. She affected to treat her excuses as frivolous. In open day, a short distance, a road that Lucy had travelled a few days before. She said so much that the poor girl, touched with gratitude and shame, inquired, What was to be done? Go to the convent of the Capuchins. Ask for the superior, tell him to come here immediately, but to let no one suspect that he comes at my request. But what shall I say to the portress, who has never seen me go out, and will ask me where I am going? Endeavor to pass without being seen. And if you cannot, say you are going to some church to perform your orisons. A new difficulty for Lucy, to tell a falsehood. But the signora was so offended at her refusal, and so ridiculed her for preferring a vain scruple to her gratitude, that the unhappy girl, alarmed rather than convinced, replied, Well, I will go. May God be my guide and protector. Gertrude, from her grated window, followed her with anxious looks, and when she saw her about to cross the threshold, overcome by irresistible emotion, she cried, Stop, Lucy! Lucy returned to the window, but another idea, the one accustomed to predominate, had resumed its sway over the mind of the unhappy Gertrude. She affected dissatisfaction at the direction she had given, described the road again to Lucy, and dismissed her. Do exactly as I have told you, and return quickly. Lucy passed the door of the cloister unobserved, and proceeding on her way with downcast eyes, found, with the aid of the directions given, and her own recollections, the gate of the suburb. Timid and trembling, she continued on the high road until she arrived at that which led to the convent. This road was buried, like the bed of a river between two high banks bordered with trees, whose branches united to form an arch above it. On finding it entirely deserted, she felt her fears revive. She hurried on, but gained courage from the sight of a traveling carriage which had stopped a short distance before her. Before the door of it, which was open, there stood two travelers looking about, as if uncertain of their way. As she approached, she heard one of them say, "'Here is a good girl who will tell us the way.' As she came on a line with the carriage, this same man addressed her. "'My good girl, can you tell us the way to Monza?' "'You are going in the wrong direction,' replied the poor girl. "'Monza lies there.' As she turned to point to it, his companion, it was Nibio, seized her by the waist and lifted her from the ground. Lucy screamed from surprise and terror, the ruffian threw her into the carriage. A third, who was seated in the bottom of it, seized her and compelled her to sit down before him. Another put a handkerchief over her mouth and stifled her cries. Nibio then entered the carriage. The door was closed, and the horses set off at a gallop. He who had asked her the perfidious question remained behind. He was an emissary of Egidio, who had watched Lucy when she quitted the convent, and had hastened by a shorter road to inform his colleagues, and wait for her at the place agreed on. But who can describe the terror and anguish of the unfortunate girl? Who can tell what passed in her heart? Cruelly anxious to ascertain her horrible situation, she wildly opened her eyes, but closed them again at the sight of those frightful faces. She struggled in vain. The men held her down in the bottom of the carriage. If she attempted to cry, they drew the handkerchief tightly over her mouth. In the meanwhile, three gruff voices, endeavoring to assume a tone of humanity, said to her, Be quiet. Be quiet. Do not be afraid. We do not wish to harm you. After a while, her struggles ceased. She languidly opened her eyes, and the horrible faces before her appeared to blend themselves into one monstrous image. Her color fled, and she fell lifeless into their arms. Courage, courage, said Nibio, but Lucy was now beyond the reach of his horrible voice. The devil! She appears to be dead, said one of them. If she should really be dead, Puh, said the other. These fainting fits are common to women. They don't die in this way. Hush, said Nibio. Be attentive to your duty and do not meddle with other affairs. Keep your muskets ready, because this wood we are entering is a nest for robbers. Don't keep them in your hands. The devil, put them behind you. Do you not see that this girl is a tender chicken who faints at nothing? If she sees that you have arms, she may die in reality. 
when she comes to her senses, be careful not to frighten her. Touch her not, unless I tell you to do so. I can hold her. Keep quiet, and let me talk to her. Meanwhile, the carriage entered the wood. Poor Lucy awoke as from a profound and painful slumber. She opened her eyes, and her horrible situation rushed with full force upon her mind. She struggled again, in vain. She attempted to scream, but Nebio said to her, holding up the handkerchief, "'Be tranquil. It is the best thing you can do. We do not wish to harm you, but if you do not keep silence, we must make you.' "'Let me go. Who are you? Where are you taking me? Why am I here? Let me go. Let me go.' "'I tell you, don't be frightened. You are not a child, and you ought to know that we will not harm you. We might have murdered you before this, if such had been our intention. Be quiet, then.' "'No, no. Let me go. I know you not.' "'We know you well enough, however.' "'Oh, holy virgin, let me go for charity's sake. Who are you? Why have you brought me here?' "'Because we have been ordered to do so.' Who? Who? Who ordered you to do it? Hush, said Nibio in a severe tone. Such questions must not be answered. Lucy attempted to throw herself from the door of the carriage, but finding the effort vain, she had recourse again to entreaties, and with her cheeks bathed in tears and her voice broken by sobs, she continued, Oh, for the love of heaven and the holy virgin, let me go. What harm have I done you? I am a poor creature who have never injured you. I forgive you all that you have done, and will pray to God for you. If you have a daughter, a wife, or a mother, think what they would suffer in my situation. Remember that we must all die, and that one day you will hope that God will show mercy to you. Let me go! Let me go! The Lord will guide me on my way. We cannot. You cannot? Great God! Why can you not? Where are you taking me? We cannot. Your supplications are useless. Do not be frightened. We will not harm you. Be quiet. No one shall harm you. More than ever alarmed to perceive that her words produced no effect, Lucy turned to him who holds in his powerful hand the hearts of men, and can, if he sees fit, soften the most ferocious. She crossed her arms on her breast, and prayed from the depth of her heart, fervently then again vainly implored to be set free. But we have not the heart to relate more at length this painful journey, which lasted four hours, and which was to be succeeded by many hours of still deeper anguish. At the castle the unknown was waiting her arrival, with extraordinary solicitude and agitation of mind. Strange that he who had coldly and calmly disposed of so many lives, and had regarded as nothing the torments he inflicted, should now feel an impression of remorse, almost of terror, at the tyranny he exercised over an unknown girl, a humble peasant. From a high window of his castle he had for some time looked down upon the valley beneath. At last he saw the carriage approaching slowly at a distance, as if the horses were wearied with their rapid journey. He perceived it, and felt his heart beat violently. "'Is she there?' thought he. "'What trouble this girl gives me! I must free myself from it!' and he prepared himself to send one of his ruffians to meet the carriage, and tell Nibio to conduct the girl immediately to the castle of Don Roderick. But an imperious no, which made itself heard by his conscience, caused him to relinquish his design. Tormented, however, by the necessity of ordering something to be done, and insupportably weary of waiting the slow approach of the carriage, he sent for an old woman who was attached to his service. This woman had been born in the castle, and had passed her life in it, she had been impressed from infancy with an opinion of the unlimited power of its masters, and her principal maxim was implicit obedience towards them. To the ideas of duty were united sentiments of respect, fear, and servile devotion. When the unknown became lord of the castle and began to make such horrible use of his power, she experienced a degree of pain, and at the same time a more profound sentiment of subjection. In time she became habituated to what was daily acting before her, the powerful and unbridled will of such a lord she viewed as an exercise of fated justice. When somewhat advanced in years, she had espoused a servant of the house, who, being sent on a hazardous expedition, left his body on the high road, and his wife a widow in the castle. The revenge that her lord took for his death imparted to her a savage consolation, and increased her pride at being under his protection. From that day she rarely set foot beyond the castle walls, 
and by degrees there remained to her no other idea of human beings than that of those by whom she was daily surrounded. She was not employed in any particular service, but each one gave her something to do as it pleased him. She had sometimes clothes to mend, food to prepare, and wounds to dress. Commands, reproaches, and thanks were equally mingled with abusive raillery. She went by the appellation of the old woman, and the tone with which the name was uttered varied according to the circumstances and humor of the speaker. Disturbed in her idleness and irritated in her self-love, which were her two ruling passions, she returned these compliments with language in which Satan might have recognized more of his own genius than in that of her persecutors. "'You see that carriage below there?' said the unknown. "'I do,' said she. "'Have a litter prepared immediately, and let it carry you to Malino. Quick, quick! You must arrive before the carriage. It approaches with the slow step of death. In this carriage there is, there ought to be, a young girl. If she is there, tell Nibio from me that he must place her in the litter, and that he must come at once to me. You will get into the litter with her, and when you arrive here, you must take her to your room. If she asks you where you are leading her, whose is this castle, be careful. Oh, do not doubt me, said the old woman. But, pursued the unknown, comfort her, encourage her. What can I say to her? What can you say to her? Comfort her, I tell you. You have arrived at this age and know not how to administer consolation to the afflicted? Have you never had any sorrow? Have you never been visited by fear? Do you not know the language that consoles in such moments? Speak this language to her, then. Find it in your remembrance of your own misfortunes. Go, directly. When she was gone, he remained some time at the window, gazing at the approaching carriage. He then looked at the setting sun and the glorious display of clouds about the horizon. He soon withdrew closed the window, and kept pacing the apartment in a state of uneasy excitement. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni Translated by George William Fenshaw This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 the old woman hastened to obey, and gave orders under authority of that name which, by whomsoever pronounced, set the whole castle into motion, as no one imagined that any one would dare to use it unauthorized. She reached Malanotte a little before the carriage. When it was near at hand, she left the litter, and making a sign to the coachman to stop, approached the window, and whispered in the ear of Nibio the will of her master. Lucy, sensible that the motion of the carriage had ceased, shook off the lethargy into which she had for some time been plunged and in an agony of terror looked around her. Nibio had drawn himself back on the seat, and the old woman, resting her chin on the window, said to Lucy, Come, my child. Come, poor girl, come with me. I have orders to treat you kindly, and to offer you every consolation. At the sound of a female voice, the unfortunate girl felt a momentary relief, which was, however, succeeded by deeper terror, as she looked at the person from whom it proceeded. "'Who are you?' she said, anxiously fixing her eyes upon her. "'Come, come, poor girl,' repeated the old woman. Nibio and his two companions, inferring the designs of their master from the extraordinary deportment of the old woman, endeavored to persuade the poor girl to obey, but Lucy kept gazing at the wild and savage solitude around, which left her no ray of hope. However, she attempted to cry out. But seeing Nibio give a look to the handkerchief, she stopped, trembled, was seized, and then placed in the litter. The old woman was placed beside her, and Nibio left the two villains for their escort, and hastened forward at the call of his master. Lucy, aroused to momentary energy by the near approach of the deformed and withered features of her companion, cried, "'Where am I? Where are you taking me?' "'To one who wishes you well. To a great. You are a lucky girl. Be happy. Do not be afraid. Be happy. He has told me to encourage you.' You will tell him that I have done so, will you not? Who is this man? What is he? What does he want with me? I do not belong to him. Tell me where I am. Let me go. 
tell these men to let me go to take me to some church oh you who are a woman in the name of the holy virgin i entreat you this holy and tender name so often pronounced with respect in her early years and for so long a time neglected and forgotten produced on the mind of the wretched woman who had not heard it for so long a time a confused impression like the remembrance of lights and shadows on the mind of one blind from infancy meanwhile the unknown standing at the door of the castle looked below and saw the litter slowly ascending in nebio walking a few steps in advance of it at the sight of his master he hurried forward come here said the signor to him and led the way to an inner hall well said he stopping all has been done according to your wishes replied nebio bowing the order in time the young girl in time no one near the place a single cry no one alarmed the coachman diligent the horses swift but but what but to say truth i would rather have received orders to plunge a dagger in her heart at once than to have been obliged to look at her and hear her entreaties what is this what is this what do you mean i would say that during the whole journey yes during the whole journey she has excited my compassion compassion what dost thou know of compassion what is compassion i have never understood what it is until to-day it is something like fear if it takes possession of one one is no longer a man let me hear then what she has done to excite your compassion oh most illustrious signor she wept implored and looked so piteously then turned pale pale as death then wept and prayed again and said such words i will not have this girl in the castle thought the unknown i was wrong to embark in this business but i have promised but i have promised when she is far away and looking imperiously at nebio now said he put an end to your compassion mount a horse take with you two or three companions if you wish go to the castle of don roderick thou knowest it tell him to send immediately immediately or otherwise but another no more imperious than the first whose sound was heard in the depth of his soul prevented his proceeding no said he in a determined tone as if expressing the command of this secret voice no go to bed and to-morrow morning you shall do what i shall then order this girl must have some demon who protects her thought he as he remained alone with his arms crossed on his breast regarding the fitful shadows cast by the rays of the moon on the floor which darted through the grating of the lofty windows she must have some demon or an angel who protects her compassion in nibio to-morrow morning to-morrow morning at the latest she shall be sent away she must submit to her destiny that is certain and continued he with the tone of one who gives a command to a wayward child under the conviction that he will not obey it we will think of it no more this animal don roderick must not come to torment me with thanks for i do not wish to hear her spoken of i have served him because i promised to do so and i promised because it was my destiny but don roderick shall pay me with usury let us see and he endeavoured to imagine some difficult enterprise in which to engage don roderick as a punishment but his thoughts involuntarily recurred to another subject compassion inibio what has she done i must see her no yes i must see her he passed through several halls and arriving at the apartment of the old woman knocked with his foot at the door who is there open at the sound of this voice the old woman quickly obeyed and flung the door wide open the unknown threw a glance around the chamber and by the light of the lantern which stood on the table saw lucy on the floor in one corner of it why did you place her there said he with a frowning brow she placed herself there replied she timidly i have done all i could to encourage her 
but she will not listen to me. Rise, said he to Lucy, who at the sound of his step and at the sound of his voice had been seized with new terror. She buried her face in her hands and remained silent and trembling before him. Rise, I will not harm you. I can befriend you, said the signor. Rise, repeated he in a voice of thunder, irritated at having spoken in vain. As if alarm had restored her exhausted strength, the unfortunate girl fell on her knees, clasped her hands on her breast, as if before a sacred image, then, with her eyes fixed on the earth, exclaimed, Here I am. Murder me if you will. I have already told you that I will not harm you, replied the unknown in a more gentle tone, gazing at her agonized and altered features. Courage, courage, said the old woman. He tells you himself that he will not harm you. And why? resumed Lucy, in a voice in which indignation and despair were mingled with alarm and dismay. Why make me suffer the torments of hell? What have I done to you? Perhaps they have not treated you kindly? Speak. Oh, kindly treated. They have brought me hither by treachery and force. Why? Why did they bring me? Why am I here? Where am I? I am a poor creature. What have I done to you? In the name of God. God. God always God, said the unknown. Those who are too weak to defend themselves always make use of the name of God, as if they knew something concerning him. What? Do you mean by this word to make me— And he left the sentence unfinished. Oh, senor, what could I mean, a poor girl like me, except that you should have pity on me? God pardons so many deeds for one act of mercy. Let me go. For pity, for charity, let me go. Do not make a poor creature suffer thus. Oh, you who have it in your power, tell them to let me go. They brought me hither by force. Put me again in the carriage with this woman, and let it carry me to my mother. Oh, holy virgin, my mother, my mother! Perhaps she is not far from here. I thought I saw my mountains. Why do you make me suffer? Carry me to a church. I will pray for you all my life. Does it cost you so much to say one word? Oh, I see that you are touched. Say but the word, say it. God pardons so many deeds for one act of mercy. Oh, why? Is she not the daughter of one of the cowards who outlawed me? Thought the unknown. I should then enjoy her sufferings. But now— Do not stifle so good an inspiration, pursued Lucy, on seeing hesitation in the countenance of her persecutor. If you do not grant me mercy, the Lord will. He will send death to relieve me, and all will be over. But you? One day, perhaps, you also? But no. No, I will pray the Lord to preserve you from evil. What would it cost you to say one word? If ever you experience these torments? Well, well, take courage said the unknown, with a gentleness that astonished the old woman. Have I done you any harm? Have I menaced you? Oh, no. I see that you have a good heart, and that you pity a poor creature. If you chose, you could alarm me more than any of them. You could make me die with fear, and on the contrary, you have— you have given me some consolation. God reward you. Accomplish the work you have begun. Save me. Save me. Tomorrow morning. Oh, save me now, now. Tomorrow morning I will see you again, I tell you. Be of good courage. Rest yourself. You must need food. It shall be brought for you. No, no. I shall die if anyone comes into this room. I shall die. Take me away. God will reward you. A servant. We'll bring you something to eat, said the unknown. And you? Continued he, turning to the old woman. Persuade her to eat, and to repose on the bed. If she consents to have you sleep with her, well. If not, you can sleep very well on the floor. Be kind to her, I say, and take care that she makes no complaint of you. 
he hastily quitted the room before Lucy could renew her entreaties. "'Oh, miserable that I am! Shut, shut the door!' said Lucy, returning to seat herself in her corner. "'Oh, miserable that I am! Who shall I implore now? Where am I? Tell me, tell me, for charity, who is this signor? Who has been talking to me? Who is he?' "'Who is he? Do you wish me to tell you? You must wait a while first. You are proud because he protects you, provided you are satisfied, no matter what becomes of me. Ask him his name. If I should tell you, he would not speak to me so gently as he did to you. I am an old woman.' "'I am an old woman,' continued she, grumbling. But hearing the sobs of Lucy, she remembered the threat of her master, and addressing her in a less bitter tone. "'Well, I have said no harm. Be cheerful. Do not ask me what I cannot tell you. But have courage. How satisfied most people would be should he speak to them as he has spoken to you.' Be cheerful. Directly you shall have something to eat, and from what he said, I know it will be something good. And then you must lie down, and you will leave a little room for me, added she, with an accent of suppressed rancor. I cannot eat. I cannot sleep. Leave me. Approach me not. You will not go away? No, no, said the old woman, seating herself on a large armchair and regarding her with a mingled expression of alarm and rage. She looked down at the bed, and did not very well relish the idea of being banished from it for the night, as it was very cold, but she hoped at least for a good supper. Lucy felt neither cold nor hunger. She remained stupefied with grief and terror. Her ideas became vague and confused, as in the delirium of a fever. She shuddered at hearing a knock on the door. "'Who is there?' cried she. "'Who is there? Don't let anyone come in.' "'It's only Martha, bringing something to eat.' shut shut the door cried lucy certainly replied the old woman taking a basket from the hands of martha she placed it on the table and closed the door she invited lucy to taste the delicious food bestowing on it profuse praises and on the wine too which was such as the signor himself drank with his friends but seeing that they were useless she said it is your own fault you must not forget to tell him that i asked you i will eat however and leave enough for you, if you should come to your senses. When her supper was finished, she approached Lucy again, and renewed her solicitations. No, no, I wish nothing, replied she, in a faint and exhausted voice. Is the door shut? she exclaimed with momentary energy. Is it well secured? The old woman approached the door, and showed her that it was firmly bolted. You see, said she, it is well fastened. Are you satisfied now? Oh, satisfied? satisfied in this place said lucy sinking into her corner but god knows that i am here come to bed what would you do there lying like a dog how silly to refuse comforts when you can have them no no leave me to myself well remember it is your own fault if you wish to come to bed you can i have left room enough for you "'Remember, I have asked you very often.' Thus saying, she drew the clothes over her, and soon all was profound silence. Lucy remained motionless, with her face buried in her hands which rested on her knees. She was neither awake nor asleep, but in a dreamy state of the imagination, painful, vague, and changeful. At first she recalled with something of self-possession the minutest circumstances of this horrible day. Then her reason for a moment forsook its throne, vainly struggling against the phantoms conjured by uncertainty and terror. At last, weary and exhausted, she sunk on the floor, in a state approaching to and resembling sleep. But suddenly she awoke, as at an internal call, and strove to recall her scattered senses, to know where she was, and why she had been brought thither. She heard a noise, and listened. It was the heavy breathing of the old woman, in a deep slumber. She opened her eyes on the objects around her, which the flickering of the lamp, now dying in its socket, rendered confused and indistinct but soon her recent impressions returned distinctly to her mind, and the unfortunate girl recognized her prison, and with the knowledge came associated all the terrors of this horrible day, and, overcome anew by anxiety and terror, she wished earnestly for death. She could only pray, and as the words fell from her trembling lips, she felt her confidence revive. 
suddenly a thought presented itself to her mind, that her prayer would be more acceptable if united with an offering of something dear to her. She remembered the object to which she had clung for her happiness, and resolved to sacrifice it. Then, clasping her hands over her chaplet, which hung upon her neck, and raising her tearful eyes to heaven, she cried, Oh, most holy virgin, thou to whom I have so often prayed, and who hast so often consoled me, thou who hast suffered so much sorrow, and art now so glorious, thou who hast performed so many miracles for the afflicted, holy virgin, succor me, take me from this peril, mother of God, return me safely to my mother, and I pledge myself to remain devoted to thy service. I renounce for ever the unfortunate youth, and from this time devote myself to thee. After this consecration of herself, she felt her confidence and faith increase. She remembered the tomorrow morning uttered by the unknown, and took it as a promise of safety. Her wearied senses yielded to this new sentiment, and she slept profoundly and peacefully with the name of her protectress on her lips. But in this same castle was one who could not sleep. After having quitted Lucy and given orders for her supper, he had visited the posts of his fortress, but her image remained stamped on his mind, her words still resounded in his ears. He retired to his chamber and threw himself on his bed, but in the stillness around this same image of Lucy, in her desolation and anguish, took possession still more absolutely of his thoughts, and rendered sleep hopeless. "'What new feelings are these?' thought he. "'Nevio was right. But what is there in a woman's tears to unman me thus?' Did I never see a woman weep before? Ay, and how often I have beheld their deepest agonies unmoved. But now... And here he recalled, without much difficulty, many an instance when neither prayers nor tears were able to make him swerve from his atrocious purposes. But instead of deriving augmented resolution, as he had hoped, from the recollection, he experienced an emotion of alarm, of consternation, so that even, as a relief from the torment of retrospection, he thought of Lucy. "'She lives still,' said he. "'She is here, and there is yet time. I have it in my power to say to her, Go in peace. I can also ask her forgiveness. Forgiveness. I ask forgiveness of a woman.' Ah, if in that word existed the power to drive this demon from my soul, I would say it. Yes, I feel that I would say it. To what am I reduced? I am no longer myself. Well, well, many a time have such follies passed through my head. This will take its flight also. And to procure the desired forgetfulness, he endeavored to busy himself with some new project, but in vain. All appeared changed. That which at another time would have been a stimulus to action had now lost its charm. His imagination was overwhelmed with the insupportable weight of remembered crimes. Even the idea of continuing to associate with those whom he had employed as the instruments of his daring and licentious will was revolting to his soul. And, disgusted and weary, he found relief only in the thought that by the dawn of morning he would set at liberty the unfortunate Lucy. I will save her. Yes, I will save her. As soon as the day breaks, I will fly to her and say, Go, go in peace. But my promise, I, who is Don Roderick, that I should hold sacred a promise made to him? With the perplexity of a man to whom a superior addresses unexpectedly an embarrassing question, the unknown endeavored to reply to this his own, or rather, that was whispered by this new principle, that had of a sudden sprung up so awfully in his soul to pass judgment upon him. He wondered how he could have resolved to engage himself to inflict suffering, without any motive of hatred or fear, on an unfortunate being whom he did not know, only to render a service to this man. He could not find any excuse for it. He could not even imagine how he had been led to it. The hasty determination had been the impulse of a mind obedient to its habitual feelings, the consequence of a thousand previous deeds, and from an examination of the motives which had led him to commit a single deed, he was led to the retrospection of his whole life. In looking back from year to year, from enterprise to enterprise, from crime to crime, from blood to blood, each one of his actions appeared abstracted from the feelings which had induced their perpetration, 
and therefore exposed in all their horrible deformity, but which those feelings had hitherto veiled from his view. They were all his own. He was responsible for all. They comprised his life. The horror of this thought filled him with despair. He grasped his pistol and raised it to his head, but at the moment in which he would have terminated his miserable existence, his thoughts rushed onwards to the time that must continue to flow on after his end. He thought of his disfigured corpse, without sense or motion, in the power of the vilest men. The astonishment and confusion which would take place in the castle, the conversation it would excite in the neighborhood and afar off, and, more than all, the rejoicing of his enemies. The darkness and silence of the night inspired him with other apprehensions still. It appeared to him that he would not have hesitated to perform the deed in open day, in the presence of others. And, after all, what was it? But a moment, and all would be over. And now another thought rose to his mind. If that other life, of which they tell, is an invention of priests, is a mere fabrication, why should I die? Of what consequence is all that I have done? It is a trifle, but if there should be another life... At such a doubt he was filled with deeper despair, a despair from which death appeared no refuge. The pistol dropped from his grasp. Both hands were applied to his aching head. He trembled in every limb. Suddenly the words he had heard a few hours before came to his memory. God pardons so many deeds for one act of mercy. They did not come to him clothed in the humble tone of supplication with which he had heard them pronounced, but in one of authority, which offered some gleam of hope. It was a moment of relief. He brought to mind the figure of Lucy when she uttered them, and he regarded her not as a suppliant, but as an angel of consolation. He waited with anxiety the approach of day, that he might hear from her mouth other words of hope and life. He imagined himself conducting her to her mother. And then, what shall I do to-morrow? What shall I do for the rest of the day? What shall I do the day after, and the next day, and the night? The night which will so soon return. Oh, the night. Let me not think of the night. And plunged in the frightful void of the future, he sought in vain for some employment of time, some method of living through the days and nights. Now he thought of abandoning his castle and flying to some distant country where he had never been heard of. But could he fly from himself? Then he felt a confused hope of recovering his former courage and habits and that he should regard these terrors of his soul but as a transient delirium. Now he dreaded the approach of day, which should exhibit him so miserably changed to his followers. Then he longed for its light, as if it would bring light also to his troubled thoughts. As the day broke, a confused sound of merriment broke upon his ear. He listened. It was a distant chiming of bells, and he could hear the echo of the mountains repeat the harmony and mingle itself with it. From another quarter, still nearer, and then from another, similar sounds were heard. "'What means this?' said he. For what are these rejoicings? What joyful event has taken place? He rose from his bed of thorns and opened the window. The mountains were still half veiled in darkness. The heavens appeared enveloped in a heavy and vast cloud, but he distinguished, through the faint dawn of the morning, crowds passing toward the opening on the right of the castle, villagers in their holy-day garments. What are those people doing? What has happened to cause all this joy? And calling a bravo, who slept in the adjoining room, he asked him the cause of the commotion. The man replied that he was ignorant of it, but would go immediately and inquire. His master remained at the window, contemplating the moving spectacle, which increasing day rendered more distinct every moment. He saw crowds passing in succession, men, women, and children, as guided by one impulse, directing their steps in one direction. They appeared animated by a common joy, and the bells, with their united sound of merriment, seemed to be an echo of the general hilarity. The unknown looked on intently, and felt an eager curiosity to know what could have communicated such happiness to such a multitude of people. End of chapter 21The Bravo hastened back with the intelligence that the Cardinal Frederick Borromeo, Archbishop of Milan, had arrived the evening before at blank, and was expected to pass the day there. The report of his arrival being spread abroad, the people had been seized with a desire to see him, and the bells were rung in testimony of the happiness his presence conferred, and also to give wider notice of his arrival. The unknown, left alone, continued to look down into the valley. For a man, all crowding all eager to see a man, 
And nevertheless, each of them has some demon that torments him. But none, none, a demon like mine. Not one has passed such a night as I have. What is there in this man to excite such joy? Some silver which he will scatter among them. But all are not actuated by such a motive. Well, a few words. Oh, if he had a few words of consolation for me. Yes, why should I not go to him? Why not? I will go. What better can I do? I will go and speak to him. Speak to him alone. What shall I say to him? Why? Why that which? I will hear what he has to say to me. Having come to this vague determination, he threw over his shoulders a military cloak, put his pistol and dagger in his girdle, and took from the wall where it hung a carabine almost as famous as himself. Thus accoutred, he proceeded to Lucy's chamber, and leaving his carabine at the door, he knocked and demanded admittance. The old woman hastened to open the door. He entered, and looking around the room, saw Lucy tranquil and silent in the corner of it. "'Does she sleep?' asked he in a low voice. "'Why did you suffer her to sleep there? Were these my orders?' I did all I could, but she would neither eat nor come. Let her sleep then in peace. Be careful not to trouble her. When she wakes, Martha will be in the next chamber, and you must send her for whatever she may want. When she wakes, tell her I that the Signor has gone out for a little while, that he will return, and that he will do all that she wishes. The old woman was astonished. She must be some princess, thought she. The unknown departed, took his carabine, and gave orders to Martha to be in waiting, and to a bravo to guard the chamber, and not to suffer anyone to approach. Then, leaving the castle, with rapid steps he descended into the valley. The bravos whom he had met ascending the hill stopped respectfully at his approach, expecting and awaiting orders for some expedition, and were astonished at his whole appearance, and the looks with which he returned their salute. When he reached the public road, his presence made a very different impression. At his approach everyone gave way, regarding him with looks of suspicion and wonder. Each individual whom he met cast at him a troubled look, bowed and slackened his pace, in order to remain behind. He arrived at the village in the midst of the throng, his name quickly spread from mouth to mouth and a passage was instantly made for him to pass. He inquired of one near him where the cardinal was. "'In the house of the curate,' replied the person, respectfully pointing to it. He went to it, entered a small court, where there were several priests, who looked at him with astonishment and suspicion. He saw, opposite to him, a door open, which led to a small hall, in which were also a great collection of priests. He left his carabine in a corner of the court, and entered the hall. He was received here, likewise, with doubting looks and whispers and his name was repeated with infinite awe. He accosted one of them, asking to be directed to the cardinal, as he wished to speak with him. "'I am a stranger,' replied the priest, and looking around upon the assembly, he called the cross-bearer, who at the time was saying to one near him, "'He here? The famous? What can have brought him here? Make room!' At this call, which resounded in the general silence, he felt himself compelled to advance. He bowed before the unknown, raised his eyes in uneasy curiosity to his face, and understanding his request, he stammered out, "'I do not know if his illustrious lordship, at this time, is, can, however, I will go and see.' And he went, against his will, to carry the message to the cardinal. At this period of our history we cannot do otherwise than rest a while, as the traveller worn out and weary with a long journey, through a sterile and savage land, refreshes himself for a season under the shade of a tree, near a fountain of living water. We are about to introduce a person whose name and memory cause an emotion of respect and sympathy, and this emotion is the more grateful from our previous contemplation of wickedness and crime. We trust our readers will excuse our devoting a few moments to this great and good man. Frederick Borromeo, born in the year 1564, was one of those rare characters who have employed a fine genius, the resources of great wealth, 
the advantages of privileged rank and unceasing industry for the discovery and practice of that which was for the good of mankind. His life was like a stream, which, issuing limpid from its native rock, moves on undefiled over various lands, and, clear and limpid still, unites itself with the ocean. In the midst of the pomps and pleasures of the world, he applied himself from his earliest youth to study and obey the precepts of religion, and this application produced in his heart its legitimate fruits. He took truth for the rule of his thoughts and actions. He was taught by it not to look upon this life as a burthen to the many and a pleasure to the few, but as a scene of activity for all, and of which all must render their account, and the chief aim of his thoughts had ever been to render his life useful and holy. In 1580, He declared his resolution to devote himself to the ministry of the church, and he took the habit from the hands of his cousin Carlos, whom the public voice, even to the present day, has uniformly acknowledged as a saint. He entered a short time after into the college at Pavia, founded by that holy man, and which still bears the name of the family. There, whilst applying himself with assiduity to the occupations prescribed by its rules, he voluntarily imposed on himself, in addition, the task of instructing the poor and ignorant in the principles of the Christian religion, and of visiting, consoling, and aiding the sick. He made use of the authority which was conceded to him by all to induce his companions to second him in these deeds of benevolence. He steadily refused all worldly advantages, and led a life of self-denial and devotion to the cause of religion and virtue. The complaints of his kindred, who thought the dignity of the house degraded by his plain and simple habits of life, were unavailing. He had another conflict to sustain with the ecclesiastical authorities, who wished to impel him forward to distinction, and make him appear as the prince of the place. From all this, however, he carefully withdrew himself, although at the time but a youth. It would not have been astonishing that, during the life of his cousin Carlos, Frederick should have imitated the example, and followed the counsel of so good a man. But it was surprising that after his death, no one could perceive that Frederick, although only twenty years of age, had lost his guardian and guide. The increasing splendor of his talents, his piety, the support of many powerful cardinals, the authority of his family, the name itself to which Carlos had caused to be associated an idea of sanctity and sacerdotal superiority, all concurred to point him out as a proper subject for ecclesiastical dignity. But he, persuaded in the depth of his soul of that which no true Christian can deny, that a man has no real superiority over others but in devotion to their good, dreaded distinction, and sought to avoid it. He did not wish to escape from the obligation to serve his neighbor. His life was but one scene of such services, but he did not esteem himself worthy of so high and responsible an office. Governed by such feelings, in 1595, when Clement VIII offered him the archbishopric of Milan, he refused it without hesitation, but was finally obliged to yield to the express command of the Pope. Such demonstrations are neither difficult nor rare. It is no greater effort for hypocrisy to assume them than for raillery to deride them. But are they not also the natural expression of wise and virtuous feeling? The life is the test of sincerity, and though all the hypocrites in the world had assumed the expression of virtuous sentiments, yet the sentiments themselves will always command our respect and veneration, when their genuineness is evinced by a life of disinterestedness and self-sacrifice. Frederick, as archbishop, was careful to reserve for himself only that which was barely necessary of his time and wealth. He said, as all the world says, that the ecclesiastical revenues are the patrimony of the poor, and we shall see how he put this maxim into practice. He caused an estimate to be made of the sum necessary for his expenses, and for those employed in his service. Finding it to be six hundred sequins, he ordered that amount to be taken from his patrimonial revenues for the supply of his table. He exercised such minute economy with regard to himself that he did not relinquish any article of dress until it was entirely worn out. But he joined to these habits of extreme simplicity and exquisite neatness, which was remarkable in this age of luxury and uncleanliness. He did more. In order that nothing should be lost from the fragments of his frugal table, he assigned them to a hospital for the poor, and a servant came every day to gather the remnants for that purpose. From the attention which he paid to such minutiae, we might form a contracted idea of his mind as being incapable of elevating itself to more extensive designs, were it not for the Ambrosian Library, which remains a monument of his liberality and magnificence. To furnish it with books and manuscripts, besides those which he had already collected, he sent eight of the most skillful and learned men to make purchases of them in France, Spain, Germany, Italy, Flanders, Greece, Lebanon, and Jerusalem. He succeeded in collecting thirty thousand printed volumes and fourteen thousand manuscripts. He joined to the library a college of doctors. These doctors were nine in number, and supported by him as long as he lived. After his death, the ordinary revenues not being sufficient for the expense, they were reduced to two. Their duty consisted in the cultivation of the various branches of human knowledge, theology, history, belles lettres, 
ecclesiastical antiquities, and oriental languages. Each one was obliged to publish some work on the subject to which he had particularly applied himself. He added to this a college, which he called Trilingue, for the study of Greek, Latin, and Italian languages, and a college of pupils who were instructed in these languages to become professors in their turn. He united to these also a printing establishment for the oriental languages, for Hebrew, Chaldee, Arabic, Persian, and Armenian, a gallery of pictures, and another of statues, and a school for the three principal arts of design. For the latter he was at no loss to find professors, but this was not the case with regard to the eastern languages, which were at this time but little cultivated in Europe. In the orders which he left for the government and regulations of the library, we perceive a perpetual attention to utility, admirable in itself, and much in advance of the ordinary ideas of his time. He prescribed to the librarian the cultivation of a regular correspondence with the learned men of Europe, to keep himself acquainted with the state of science, and to procure every new and important work. He also charged him to point out to young students the books necessary for them, and, whether natives or foreigners, to afford them every possible facility in making use of those of the library. There is a history of the Ambrosian Library by one Pier Paolo Bosca, who was librarian after the death of Frederick, in which all the excellent regulations are minutely detailed. Other libraries existed in Italy, but with little benefit to the studious. The books were carefully concealed from view in their cases, and inaccessible to all except on rare occasions and with the utmost difficulty. A book might then be seen but not studied. It is useless to inquire what were the fruits of these establishments of Borromeo, but we must admire the generosity, judgment, and benevolence of the man who could undertake and execute such things, in the midst of the ignorance, inertness, and general indifference which surrounded him. In an attention to public, he was not unmindful of private benevolence. Indeed, his whole life was a perpetual almsgiving. On the occasion of the famine of which our history has spoken, we may have to relate more than one instance of his wisdom and generosity. The inexhaustible charity of the man shone as much in his private charities as in his splendid and magnificent public establishments already recorded. On one occasion he saved a young lady from being immured in a convent against her wish. Her selfish father pretended he could not marry her suitably without a portion of four thousand crowns. The bishop advanced the money. Easy of access, he made it a principle to receive the poor who applied to him, with kindness and affection. And on this point he was obliged to dispute with the nobility, who wished to keep him to their standard of action. One day, whilst visiting among the mountaineers and instructing some poor children, Frederick bestowed caresses on them. A nobleman who was present warned him to be careful, as the children were dirty and disgusting. The good bishop, not without indignation, replied, "'These souls are committed to my care. These children may never see me again. And are you not willing that I should embrace them?' He, however, seldom felt indignation or anger. He was admired for a placability, a sweetness of manner nearly imperturbable, which, however, was not natural to him, but the effect of continual combat against a quick and hasty disposition. If ever he appeared harsh, it was to those subordinate pastors, whom he found guilty of avarice or negligence, or any other vice opposed to the spirit of their high calling. With regard to his own interests or temporal glory, he exhibited no emotion, either of joy or regret admirable indeed if his spirit was in reality not affected by these emotions, but more admirable still if viewed as the result of continued and unremitted effort to subdue them. And amidst all the important cares with which he was occupied, he did not neglect the cultivation of his mind. He devoted himself to literature with so much ardor that he became one of the most learned men of his time. We must not, however, conceal that he adopted with firm persuasion and maintained with constancy certain opinions, which at this day would appear singular and ill-founded, these, however, were the errors of his time, and not his own. Our readers may perhaps inquire if so learned and studious a man has left no monument of his labors and studies. His works, great and small, Latin and Italian, printed as well as manuscript, amount to more than a hundred. They are preserved with care in the library which he founded. They are composed of moral treatises, sermons, historical dissertations, sacred and profane antiquities, literature, the fine arts, etc. And what is the reason that they are so little known, so little sought for? We cannot enter into the causes of this phenomenon, as our explanation might not be satisfactory to our readers. So that we had better resume the course of our history in relating facts concerning this extraordinary man. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 23 The Cardinal Frederick was engaged in study, as was his custom, 
preparatory to the hour of divine service, when the cross-bearer entered, with a disturbed and unquiet air. A strange visit! Strange indeed, most illustrious signor. From whom? asked the cardinal. From the signor, replied the chaplain, pronouncing the name which we are unable to repeat to our readers. He is without, in person, and asks admittance to the presence of your lordship. Indeed, said the cardinal, closing his book and rising from his seat, his countenance brightening. Let him come in, let him come in immediately. But, replied the chaplain, does your lordship know who this man is? It is the famous outlaw. And is it not a happy circumstance for a bishop that such a man should have come to see him? But, insisted the chaplain, we never dare speak of certain things, because my lord says they are idle tales. However, in this case it appears to be a duty. Zeal makes enemies, my lord, and we know that more than one ruffian has boasted that sooner or later... And what have they done? This man is an enterprising, desperate villain, who is in strict correspondence with other villains as desperate as himself, and who perhaps have sent him. Oh, what discipline is this? said the cardinal, smiling. The soldiers exhort the general to cowardice. Then, with a grave and pensive air, he resumed. St. Carlo would not have deliberated a moment whether he should receive such a man. He would have gone to seek him. Let him enter immediately. He has already waited too long. The chaplain moved towards the door, saying in his heart, there is no remedy. These saints are always obstinate. He opened the door, and reaching the hall where he had left the ecclesiastics, he beheld them collected together in one corner of the room, and the unknown standing alone in another. As he approached him, he eyed him keenly to ascertain whether he had not arms concealed about his person. Truly, before introducing him, we might at least propose— But his resolution failed him. He spoke. My lord expects your lordship— be kind enough to come with me. And he led the way into the presence of Frederick, who came forward to meet the unknown with a pleased and serene countenance, making a sign to the chaplain to quit the room. The unknown and the cardinal remained for some moments silent and undecided. The former experienced at the same time a vague hope of finding some relief to his internal torments, and also a degree of irritation and shame at appearing at this place as a penitent, to confess his sins and implore pardon of a man. He could not speak, Indeed, he hardly wished to do so. However, as he raised his eyes to the cardinal's face, he was seized with an irresistible sentiment of respect, which increasing his confidence, and subduing his pride without offending it, nevertheless kept him silent. The person of Frederick was indeed fitted to inspire respect and love. His figure was naturally majestic and noble, and was neither bent nor wasted by years. His eye was grave and piercing, his brow serene and pensive, his countenance still shone with the animation of youth, notwithstanding the paleness of his face, and the visible traces it presented of abstinence, meditation, and laborious exertion. All his features indicated that he had once been more than ordinarily handsome. The habit of solemn and benevolent thought, the internal peace of a long life, love for mankind, and the influence of an ineffable hope, had substituted for the beauty of youth the more dignified and superior beauty of an old age, to which the magnificent simplicity of the purple added an imposing and inexpressible charm. He kept his eyes for a few moments fixed on the unknown, as if to read his thoughts, and imagining he perceived in his dark and troubled features something corresponding to the hope he had conceived. Oh! cried he in an animated voice. What a welcome visit is this! And how I ought to thank you for it, although it fills me with self-reproach. Reproach? cried the unknown in astonishment, but he felt reassured by his manner and the gentleness of his words, and he was glad that the cardinal had broken the ice and commenced the conversation. Certainly, it is a subject of self-reproach that I should have waited till you came to me. How many times I might and ought to have sought you. You seek me? Do you know who I am? Have they told you my name? Do you believe I could have felt this joy, which you may read in my countenance? Do you believe I could have felt it at the sight of one unknown to me? It is you who are the cause of it. 
you whom it was my duty to seek, you for whom I have so wept and prayed, you who are that one of my children, and I love them all with the whole strength of my affections, that one whom I would most have desired to see and embrace if I could have ever dared to indulge the hope of so doing. But God alone can work miracles, and he supplies the weakness and tardiness of his poor servants. The unknown was amazed at the kindness and warmth of this reception. Agitated and bewildered by such unlooked-for benevolence, he kept silence. And? resumed Frederick, more affectionately. You have some good news for me. Why do you hesitate to tell it me? Good news? I have hell in my soul. And how can I bring you good news? Tell me, tell me if you know, what good news could you expect from such a one as I? That God has touched your heart and is drawing you to himself, replied the cardinal calmly. God, God, if I could see, if I could hear him, where is God? Do you ask me? You. And who more than yourself has felt his presence? Do you not now feel him in your heart, disturbing, agitating you, not leaving you a moment of repose, and at the same time drawing you towards him, and imparting a hope of tranquillity and of consolation, of consolation which shall be full and unlimited as soon as you acknowledge him, confess your sins, and implore his mercy. Oh, yes, yes, something indeed oppresses, something consumes me. But God, if it be God, if it be he of whom you speak, what can he do for me? These words were uttered in a tone of despair, but Frederick calmly and solemnly replied, what can God do with you? Through you he can exhibit his power and goodness. He would draw from you a glory which none other could render him. You, against whom the cries of the world have been for so long a time raised, you whose deeds are detested. <gasps> the unknown started at this unaccustomed language, but was astonished to find that it excited no anger in his bosom but rather communicated to it a degree of alleviation. What glory? pursued Frederick. Will accrue to God? A general cry of supplication has risen against you before his throne. Among your accusers, some no doubt have been stimulated by jealousy of the power you have exercised, but more by the deplorable security of your own heart, which has endured until this day. But when you, yourself, shall rise to condemn your life and become your own accuser, then, oh, then God will be glorified. And you ask what he can do with you? What am I, feeble mortal, that I should presume to tell you what are his designs respecting you? What he will do with this impetuous will and imperturbable constancy? when he shall have animated and warmed it with love, hope, and repentance. Who are you, feeble mortal, that you should think yourself able to execute and imagine greater things for the promotion of evil advice than God can make you accomplish for that of good and virtue? What can God do with you? Forgive you, save you, accomplish in you the work of redemption, are not these things worthy of him? Oh, speak if I am a humble creature, I so miserable and nevertheless so full of myself, I such as I am. If I so rejoice at your salvation, that to assure it I would joyfully give, God is my witness, the few years that remain to me in life. Oh, I think what must be the love of God who inspires me with the thought and commands me to regard you with such devotion as this. 
the countenance and manner of frederick breathed celestial purity and love in accordance with the vows which came from his mouth the unknown felt the stormy emotions of his soul gradually calming under such heavenly influence and giving place to sentiments of deep and profound interest his eyes which from infancy had been unused to tears became swollen and burying his face in his hands he wept the reply he could not utter great and good god cried frederick raising his hands and eyes to heaven what have i ever done i thy unprofitable servant that thou shouldst have invited me to this banquet of thy grace that thou shouldst have thought me worthy of being thy instrument to the accomplishment of such a miracle so saying he extended his hand to take that of the unknown no cried he no approach me not pollute not that innocent and beneficent hand you know not what deeds have been committed by the hand you would place within your own the suffer said frederick taking it with gentle violence suffer me to clasp this hand which is about to repair so many wrongs to scatter so many blessings which will comfort so many who are in affliction which will offer itself peaceably and humbly to so many enemies it is too much said the unknown sobbing aloud leave me my lord good frederick leave me crowds eagerly await your presence among whom are pure and innocent souls who have come from far to see and hear you and you remain here to converse with whom we will leave the ninety and nine sheep replied the cardinal they are in safety on the mountain i must now remain with the one which was lost these people are perhaps now more satisfied than if they had the poor bishop with them perhaps god who has visited you with the riches and wonders of his grace may even now be filling their hearts with joy of which they divine not the cause perhaps they are united to us without knowing it perhaps the holy spirit animates their hearts with the fervor of charity and benevolence inspires them with a spirit of prayer with on your account a spirit of thanksgiving of which you are the unknown object so saying he passed his arm around the neck of the unknown who after resisting a moment yielded quite vanquished by this impulse of kindness and fell on the neck of the cardinal in an agony of repentance his burning tears dropped on the stainless purple of frederick and the pure hands of the bishop were clasped affectionately around him who had hitherto been only habituated to deeds of violence and treachery the unknown after a long embrace covering his face with his hands raised his head exclaiming oh god thou who art truly great and good i know myself now i comprehend what i am my iniquities are all before me i abhor myself but still still i experience a consolation a joy yes a joy which i have never before known in all my horrible life god accords you this grace said frederick to attract you to his service to strengthen you to enter resolutely the new way he has opened to you where you have so much to undo to repair to weep for miserable that i am cried he there is so much so much that i can only weep over but at least there are some things but just undertaken that i can arrest yes there is at least one evil that i can repair he then briefly related in the most energetic terms of self-execration the story of lucy with the sufferings and terrors of the unfortunate girl her entreaties and the species of frenzy that her supplications had excited in his soul adding that she was still in the castle ah let us lose no time cried frederick moved with pity and solicitude what happiness for you 
you may behold in this the pledge of pardon. God makes you the instrument of safety to her, to whom you were to have been the instrument of ruin. God has indeed blessed you. Do you know the native place of the unhappy girl? The unknown named the village. It is not far from this, said the cardinal. God be praised, and probably... So saying, he approached a table and rang a little bell. The chaplain entered with an unquiet look. In amazement he beheld the altered countenance of the unknown, on which the traces of tears were still visible, and glancing at that of the cardinal, he perceived through its wonted calmness an expression of great satisfaction, mingled with extraordinary solicitude. He was roused from the astonishment which the contemplation excited by a question of the cardinal, if, among the curates in the hall, there was one from... Uh... There is, most illustrious lord, replied the chaplain. Bring him hither immediately, said Frederick. And with him the curate of this parish. The chaplain obeyed and went to the hall where the priests were assembled. All eyes were turned towards him. He cried aloud, His most illustrious and reverend lordship asks for the curate of this parish and the curate of blank. The former advanced immediately, and at the same time was heard amidst the crowd a uh, me uttered in a tone of surprise. Are you not the curate of blank? said the chaplain. Certainly, but his most illustrious and reverend lordship asks for you. Me? replied he, and Don Abondio advanced from the crowd with an air of amazement and anxiety. The chaplain led the way and introduced them both to the presence of the cardinal. The cardinal let go the hand of the unknown as they entered, and taking the curate of the parish aside, related in few words the facts of the story, asking him if he knew some kind female who would be willing to go to the castle in a litter to remove Lucy thence a devoted charitable woman capable of acting with judgment in so novel an expedition, and of exerting the best means to tranquilize the poor girl, to whom deliverance itself, after such anguish and alarm, might produce new and overwhelming apprehensions. After having reflected a moment, the curate took upon himself the affair, and departed. The cardinal then ordered the chaplain to have a litter prepared, and two mules ready saddled. The chaplain quitted the room to obey his orders, and the cardinal was left alone with Don Abondio and the unknown. The former, who had kept himself aloof, regarding with eager curiosity the faces of the unknown and the cardinal, now came forward, saying, I was told that your illustrious lordship wished to see me, but I suppose it was a mistake. Here is no mistake, replied Frederick. I have both a novel and agreeable commission to give you. One of your parishioners, whom you have regarded as lost, Lucy Mondella, is found. She is near this in the house of my good friend here. I wish you to go with him, and a good woman whom the curate of this parish will provide, and bring the poor girl who must be so dear to you to this place. Don Abondio did his best to conceal the extreme alarm which such a proposition caused him, and bowed profoundly in sign of obedience, first to the cardinal, and then to the unknown, but with a piteous look which seemed to say, I am in your hands. Be merciful. Parcere subjectis. The cardinal asked him of Lucy's relations. She has no near relation but her mother, with whom she lives, replied Don Abondio. Is she at home? Yes, my lord. Since, replied Frederick, this poor child cannot yet go home, it would be a great consolation for her to see her mother if the curate of this village does not return before I go to church. I beg you will desire him to send some prudent person to bring the good woman hither. Perhaps I had better go myself, said Don Abondio. No, no, I have other employment for you. Her mother, resumed Don Abondio, is a very sensitive woman, and it will require a good deal of discretion to prepare her for the meeting. That is the reason that I have named some prudent person. You, however, will be more useful elsewhere, replied the cardinal. He could have added, had he not been deterred by a regard to the feelings of the unknown. This poor child needs much to behold some person whom she knows. After so many hours of alarm and in such terrible uncertainty of the future. It appeared strange, however, that Don Abondio should not have inferred it from his manner, or that he should not have thought so himself. 
the reluctance he evinced to comply with the request of the cardinal appeared so out of place that the latter imagined there must be some secret cause for it he looked at the curate attentively and quickly discovering the fears of the poor man of becoming the companion of this formidable lord or entering his abode even for a few moments he felt an anxiety to dissipate these terrors and in order to do this and not injure the feelings of his new friend by talking privately to donabondio in his presence he addressed his conversation to the unknown himself so that donabondio might perceive by his answers that he was no longer a man to be feared do not believe said he that i shall be satisfied with this visit to-day you will return will you not in company with this worthy ecclesiastic will i return replied the unknown no if ever you should refuse to see me i would remain at your door as a beggar i must talk to you i must hear you i must see you i cannot do without you frederick took his hand and pressing it affectionately said do us the favour then the curate of this village and myself to dine with us i shall expect you in the meantime whilst you are gathering the first fruits of repentance and compassion i will go and offer supplications and thanksgivings to god with the people donabondio at this exhibition of confidence and affection was like a timid child who beholds a man caressing fearlessly a rough-looking mastiff renowned for his ferocity and strength it is in vain that the master assures him the dog is a good quiet beast he looks at him neither contradicting nor assenting he looks at the dog and dares not approach him lest the good beast might show his teeth if only from habit he dares not retreat from fear of the imputation of cowardice but he heartily wishes himself safe at home the cardinal as he was quitting the room still holding the unknown by the hand perceived that the curate remained behind embarrassed and motionless and thinking that perhaps he was mortified at the little attention that was paid to him compared with that which was bestowed on one so criminal he turned towards him stopped a moment and with an amiable smile said signor curate you have always been with me in the house of our father but this man peri erat et inventus est oh how i rejoice at it said the curate bowing to them both very reverently the archbishop passed on and entering the hall the admirable pair presented themselves to the eager gaze of the clergy who were there assembled they regarded with intense curiosity those two countenances on which were depicted different but equally profound emotions the venerable features of frederick breathed a grateful and humble joy and those of the unknown might be traced in embarrassment blended with satisfaction an unusual modesty a keen remorse through which however the lingerings of his severe and savage nature were apparent more than one of the spectators thought of that passage of isaiah the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid behind them came donabondio whom no one noticed when they had reached the middle of the apartment the servant of the cardinal entered to inform him that he had executed the orders of the chaplain that the litter was ready and that they only waited for the female whom the curate was to bring the cardinal told him to inform donabondio when the curate should have arrived and that afterwards all would be subject to his orders and those of the unknown to whom he bade an affectionate farewell saying i shall expect you bowing to donabondio he directed his steps followed by the clergy in procession to the church donabondio and the unknown were left alone in the apartment the latter was absorbed in his own thoughts impatient for the moment to arrive when he should take his lucy from sorrow and prison for she was indeed his lucy but in a sense very different from the preceding night his countenance expressed concentrated agitation which to the suspicious eye of donabondio appeared something worse he looked at him with a desire to begin a friendly conversation but what can i say to him thought he shall i repeat to him that i rejoice i rejoice at what that having been a demon he has formed the resolution to become an honest man a pretty salutation indeed eh eh however i should arrange my words my i rejoice would signify nothing else and can one believe that he has become an honest man all in a moment assertions prove nothing it is so easy to make them but nevertheless i must go with him to the castle oh who would have told me this this morning oh if ever i am so happy as to get home again perpetua shall answer for having urged me to come here oh miserable that i am i must however say something to this man he had at least thought of something to say 
i never expected the pleasure of being in such respectable company and had opened his mouth to speak when the servant entered with the curate of the village who informed them that the good woman was in the litter awaiting them don abondio approaching the servant said to him give me a gentle beast for to say truth i am not a skilful horseman be quite easy replied the valet with a smile it is the mule of the secretary a grave man of letters well replied don abondio and continued to himself heaven preserve me the unknown had advanced towards the door but looking back and seeing don abondio behind he suddenly recollected himself and bowing with a polite and humble air waited to let him pass before this circumstance reassured the poor man a little but he had scarcely reached the little court when he saw the unknown resume his carbine and fling it over his shoulder as if performing the military exercise oh 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 thought don abondio what does he want with this tool that is a strange ornament for a converted person and if some whim should enter his head what would become of me what would become of me if the unknown had had the least suspicion of the thoughts that were passing in the mind of his companion he would have done his utmost to inspire him with confidence but he was far from such an imagination as don abondio was very careful not to let his distrust appear they found the mules ready at the door the unknown mounted one which was presented to him by a groom is she not vicious in the least asked don abondio of the servant with his foot in the stirrup be quite easy she's a lamb replied he don abondio climbed to the saddle by the aid of the servant and was at last safely mounted the litter which was a few steps in advance moved at a call from the driver and the convoy departed they had to pass before the church which was crowded with people and through a small square which was filled with the villagers from abroad who had not been able to find a place within the walls of the church the report had already spread and when they saw the carriage appear and beheld the man who a few hours before had been the object of terror and execration a confused murmur of applause rose from the crowd they made way to let him pass at the same time each one endeavored to obtain a sight of him when he arrived in front of the church he took off his hat and bowed his head in reverence amidst the tumultuous din of many voices which exclaimed god, god bless you, you. don abondio took off his hat also bent his head and commended himself to the protection of heaven and hearing the voices of his brethren in the choir he could not restrain his tears but when they reached the open country and the windings of the almost deserted road a darker veil came over his thoughts there was nothing that he could regard with confidence but the driver who belonging to the establishment of the cardinal must certainly be honest and moreover did not look like a coward from time to time they passed travellers crowding to see the cardinal the sight of them was a transient balm to don abondio but still he approached this formidable valley where they would meet none but the vassals of the unknown and what vassals he desired more than ever to enter into conversation with his companion to keep him in good humour but seeing him preoccupied he dared not attempt to interrupt his thoughts he was then obliged to hold colloquy with himself of which we will transcribe a part for the benefit of the reader is it not an astonishing thing that the saints as well as the wicked have always quicksilver in their veins and not contented with making a bustle themselves they would make all mankind if they could join the dance with them is there not a fatality in it that the most troublesome come to me to me who never meddled with anybody they take me almost by the hair and thrust me into their concerns me who desire nothing but to live tranquilly if they will let me do so this mad knave don roderick what was there wanting to make him the happiest man in the world but a little prudence he is rich young respected courted but happiness is a burthen to him it seems so that he must seek trouble for himself and his neighbor he must set up forsooth for a molester of women the most silly the most villainous the most insane conduct in the world he might ride to paradise in a coach and he prefers to go halting to the devil's dwelling and this man before me continued he regarding him as if he feared he could hear his thoughts and this man after having by his villainies turned the world upside down now turns it upside down by his conversion if he is really converted meanwhile it is i who am put to the test some people always want to make a noise is it so difficult to act an honest part all one's life as i have not at all but they prefer to murder kill and play the devil 
oh unhappy man that i am they must always be in a bustle even in doing penance just as if one could not repent at home in private without so much noise without giving others so much trouble and his illustrious lordship to receive him all at once with open arms to call him his dear friend his worthy friend to listen to his least words as if he had seen him work miracles to give him his public approbation to assist him in all his undertakings i should call this precipitation and without any pledge or security to place a poor curate in his hands a holy bishop and he is such assuredly a holy bishop should regard his curates as the apple of his eye a little prudence a little coolness a, a little charity are things which in my opinion are not inconsistent with sanctity and should this be all hypocrisy who can tell the designs of such a man to think that i must accompany him into the castle there must be some deviltry in it am i not unhappy enough let me not think of it but how has lucy fallen into the clutches of this man it is a secret between him and my lord the cardinal and they don't deign to inform me concerning it i don't care to meddle with the affairs of others but when one's life is in danger one has a right to know something but poor lucy i shall be satisfied if she escapes heaven knows what she has suffered i pity her but she was born to be my ruin and if this man is really converted what need has he of me oh what a chaos but heaven owes me its protection since i did not get myself into the difficulty if i could only read in the countenance of this man what passes in his soul look at him now he looks like saint anthony in the desert and now like holofernes himself in truth the thoughts which agitated the unknown passed over his countenance as in a stormy day the clouds fly over the face of the sun producing a succession of light and shade his soul calmed by the gentle language of frederick felt elated at the hope of mercy pardon and love but then he sank again under the weight of the terrible past agitated and uneasy he retraced in his memory those iniquities which were reparable and considered what remedies would be the safest and quickest and this unfortunate girl how much she has suffered how much he had caused her to suffer at this thought his impatience to deliver her increased and he made a sign to the coachman to hasten they entered at last into the valley in what a situation was now our poor donabondio to find himself in this famous valley of which he had heard such black and horrible tales these famous men the flower of the bravos of italy these men without pity or fear to see them in flesh and blood to meet them at every step they bowed it is true respectfully in the presence of their lord but who knows what passed in their hearts, and what wicked design against the poor priest might, even then, be forming in their brains? They reached Malanotte. Bravos were at the door, who bowed to the unknown, glancing with eager curiosity at his companion and the litter. If the departure of their master alone, at the break of day, had been regarded as extraordinary, his return was considered not less so. Is it a prize which he conducts? And how has he taken possession of it alone? And what is this strange litter? And whose is this livery? They did not stir, however, knowing from the countenance of their master that their silence was what he desired. They reached the castle. The bravos who were on the esplanade and at the door retired on both sides to leave the passage free. The unknown made a sign to them not to go farther off. Spurring his mule, he passed before the litter, and beckoning to Donabondio and the coachman to follow him, he entered a first court, and thence a second. Approaching a small door, and with a gesture keeping back a bravo who advanced to hold his stirrup, he said, remain there yourself and let none approach nearer he dismounted and with the reins in his hand drew near the woman who had withdrawn the curtains of the litter sang to her in a low voice hasten to comfort her and make her understand at once that she is free and with friends god will reward you he then advanced to the curate and helping him to dismount said Senor curate, I will not ask your forgiveness for the trouble you have taken on my account. You suffer for one who will reward you well, and for this poor girl. 
His countenance, not less than his words, restored the courage of Don Abondio. Drawing a full breath, which had long been pent up in his breast, he replied, Your lordship jests, surely. But, but— And accepting the hand offered to him so courteously, he slid from the saddle. The unknown took the bridle and gave both animals to the care of the driver, ordering him to wait there until their return. Taking a key from his pocket, he opened the little door, and followed by his two companions, the curate and the female, ascended the stairs. End of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of the Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty four Lucy had just risen. She was endeavouring to collect her senses, to separate the turbid visions of sleep from the remembrance of the sad reality, which appeared to her as a dismal dream, when the old woman, in a voice which she meant to be humble and gentle, said to her, "Ah, you have slept." you would have done better to go to bed i told you so a hundred times receiving no answer she continued eat a little you have need of something if you do not he will complain of me when he returns no no i wish to go to my mother your master promised me he said to-morrow morning where is he he has gone away but he left word that he would return soon and do all that you should desire did he say so did he say so well i wish to go to my mother now now suddenly they heard steps in the adjoining chamber and a knock at the door the old woman demanded who is there open replied the well-known voice the old woman drew the bolt and holding the door open the unknown let don abondio and the good woman pass in then closing the door and remaining outside himself he sent away the old woman to a distant part of the castle the first appearance of other persons increased the agitation of lucy to whom any change brought an accession of alarm she looked and beholding a priest and a female felt somewhat reassured she looked again can it be recognizing don abondio her eyes remained fixed as by the wand of an enchanter the kind woman bent over and with an affectionate and anxious countenance said alas my poor child come come with us who are you said lucy but without waiting her reply she turned again to don abondio exclaiming is it you is it you indeed senor curate where are we oh unhappy girl i am no longer in my right mind no no it is i in truth take courage we have come to take you away i am indeed your curate come for this purpose as if restored to strength in an instant lucy stood up and fixing her eyes again on their faces she said the virgin has sent you then i have no doubt of it said the good lady but is it true that we may go away is it true indeed resumed lucy lowering her voice to a timid and fearful tone and all these people continued she with her lips compressed and trembling from alarm and horror and this lord this man he promised me indeed he is here also in person with us said don abondio he is without expecting us let us go at once we must not make such a man wait at this moment the unknown appeared at the door lucy who a few moments before had desired earnestly to see him nay having no other hope in the world had desired to see none but him now that she was so unexpectedly in the presence of friends was for a moment overcome with terror shuddering with horror she hid her face on the shoulder of the good dame beholding the innocent girl on whom the evening before he had had not the resolution to fix his eyes Beholding her countenance, pale and changed from fasting and prolonged suffering, the unknown hesitated. But perceiving her impulse of terror, he cast down his eyes, and, after a moment's silence, exclaimed, It is true. Forgive me. He comes to save you. He is not the same man. He has become good. Do you hear him ask your forgiveness? whispered the dame in the ear of Lucy. Could any one say more? Come, lift up your head. Do not play the child. We can go away now, immediately, said Don Abondio. Lucy raised her head, looked at the unknown, and beholding his humble and downcast expression, she was affected with a mingled feeling of gratitude and pity. Oh, my lord, may God reward you for your compassion to an unfortunate girl, cried she. And may he recompense you a hundredfold for the consolation you afford me by these words 
So saying, he advanced towards the door, and went out, followed by Lucy, who, quite encouraged, was supported by the arm of the good lady, Don Abondio bringing up the rear. They descended the stairs, passed through the courts, and reached the litter, into which the unknown with almost timid politeness, a new thing for him, assisted Lucy and her companion to enter. He then aided Don Abondio to reseat himself in the saddle. "'Oh, what complacence!' said the latter, moving much more lightly than he had done on first mounting. The convoy resumed their way. As soon as the unknown was mounted, his head was raised, and his countenance resumed its accustomed expression of command and authority. The robbers whom they met on their road discovered in it marks of strong thought and extraordinary solicitude. But they did not, they could not, comprehend the cause. They knew nothing as yet of the great change which had taken place in the soul of the man, and certainly such a conjecture would not have entered into their minds. The good dame hastened to draw the curtains around the litter. Pressing the hands of Lucy affectionately, she endeavored to encourage her by words of piety, congratulation, and tenderness. Seeing, however, that besides the exhaustion from so much suffering, the confusion and obscurity of all that had happened prevented the poor girl from being alive to the satisfaction of her deliverance, she said what she thought would be most likely to restore her thoughts to their ordinary course. She mentioned the village to which she belonged, and towards which they were hastening. "'Yes, indeed,' said Lucy, remembering that this village was but a short distance from her own. "'Oh, holy virgin, I render thee thanks!' my mother my mother we will send for her immediately said her friend not knowing that it had already been done yes yes god will reward you and you who are you how is it that you have come here our curate sent me because this lord whose heart god has touched blessed be his holy name came to our village to see the cardinal archbishop who is visiting among us the dear man of god the lord has repented of his horrible sins and wishes to change his life and he told the cardinal that he had carried off an innocent girl with the connivance of another whose name the curate did not mention to me lucy raised her eyes to heaven you know it perhaps continued the lady well the lord cardinal thought that a young girl being in the question a female should be found to accompany her he told the curate to look for one and the curate kindly came to me oh may god reward you for your goodness and the curate desired me to encourage you, my poor child, to relieve you from uneasiness at once, and to make you understand how the Lord has miraculously preserved you. Oh, miraculously, indeed, through the intercession of the Virgin. He told me to comfort you, to advise you, to pardon him who has done you this evil, to rejoice that God has shown compassion towards him, and even to pray for him, for besides it being a duty, you will derive comfort from it to your own heart lucy replied with a look which expressed assent as clearly as if she had made use of words and with a sweetness which words could not have expressed worthy young woman resumed the friend and as your curate was also in our village the lord cardinal judged it best to send him with us thinking that he might be of some assistance i had already heard that he was a poor sort of timid man and on this occasion he has been wholly taken up with himself like a hen with one chick and he he who is thus changed who is he how do you not know said the good dame repeating his name oh merciful heaven cried lucy for many times she had heard this name repeated with horror in more than one story in which he had appeared like the ogre of the fairy tale at the idea of having been in his terrible power and of now being under his protection at the thought of such peril and such deliverance in reflecting who this man was that had appeared to her so ferocious and then so humble and so gentle she was lost in astonishment and could only exclaim from time to time oh merciful heaven yes it is indeed a great mercy it is a great happiness for half the world in this neighbourhood and afar off when one thinks how many people he kept in continual alarm and now as our curate says but you have only to look in his face to know that he is truly changed and besides by their works ye shall know them we should not tell the truth did we say that the good dame had no curiosity to learn more of an affair in which she played so important a part but to her praise it must be added that feeling a respectful pity for lucy and estimating the weight and dignity of the charge confided to her she did not for a moment think of asking her an indiscreet or idle question all her discourse in their short journey was composed of expressions of tenderness and interest for the poor girl it must be long since you have eaten anything i do not remember it must indeed be some time poor child you must need something to restore your strength yes replied lucy in a faint voice at my house 
thanks be to God. We shall find something presently. Be of good cheer. It is but a short distance off. Lucy, wearied and exhausted by her various emotions, fell languidly to the bottom of the litter, overcome by drowsiness, and her kind companion left her to a short repose. As to Don Abondio, the descent from the castle did not cause him so much fright as the ascent thither, but it was nevertheless not agreeable. When his alarm had first ceased, he felt relieved from an intolerable burden. But now he began to torment himself in various ways, and found materials for such an operation in the present as well as in the future. His manner of travelling, to which he was not accustomed, he found to be exceedingly unpleasant, especially in the descent from the castle to the valley. The driver, obedient to a sign from the unknown, made his beast set off at a quick pace. The two mules kept up with the litter, and thus poor Donabondio, subject to the unusual bounding and rebounding which was more perilous from the steepness of the declivity they were descending, was obliged to hold fast by the saddle in order to keep his seat, not daring to ask his companions to abate somewhat of their speed. Moreover, if the road lay on a height along a ridge, the mule, according to the custom of these animals, would obstinately keep on the outside, and place his feet literally on the very edge of the precipice. "'Thou also,' said he in his heart to the beast, "'thou also hath this cursed desire to seek danger, when there are so many other paths.' He tightened the rein on the other side, but in vain, so that, although dying of vexation and fear, he suffered himself, as was his custom, to be led by the will of another. The bravos no longer caused him much uneasiness, now that he felt confidence in their master. "'But,' thought he, nevertheless, "'if the news of this great conversion spreads, while we are yet here, who knows how these people may take it? Who knows what might be the result? Perhaps they might take it in their heads to think I had come as a missionary, and then, heaven preserve me, they would make me suffer martyrdom. But we have said enough of the terrors of Donabondio. The company at last arrived at the extremity of the valley. The countenance of the unknown became more serene, and Donabondio recovered in some degree his usual composure but still his mind was occupied with more distant evils. What will this fool Don Roderick say? To be exposed thus to scoffs and jests, how sorely will he feel it? He'll certainly play the devil outright. Perhaps he will seek another quarrel with me, because I have been engaged in this cursed business. Having had the heart to send those two demons to attack me in the road, what he will do now, heaven knows. He cannot molest my lord the cardinal, because he is obviously beyond his reach. He will be obliged to champ the bit. However, the poison will be in his veins, and he will need to discharge it somewhere. It is well known how these affairs end. The blows always fall on the weakest. The cardinal will busy himself with placing Lucy in safety. This other poor devil is beyond his reach. But what is to become of me? And what will the cardinal do to defend me, after having engaged me in the business? Can he hinder this atrocious being from serving me a worse turn than before? And then, he has so many things to think of. He cannot pay attention to everybody. They who do good, do it in the gross, and enjoy their satisfaction without regarding minute consequences. But your evil door is more diligent. He lingers behind till he sees the last result, because of the fear that torments him. Shall I say I have acted by my lord archbishop's command, and against my own will? But it will seem that I favor villainy. I, for the pleasure it gives me, heaven forbid. But enough. I'll tell Perpetua the whole story, and leave her to circulate it, if indeed... His reverend lordship should not take up the fancy to make the whole matter public, and thrust me forward as a chief actor. However, I am determined on one thing. I will take leave of my lord the cardinal as soon as we arrive at the village, and go to my home. Lucy has no longer any need of me. She is under good protection, and after so many fatigues I may claim the right to take some repose. But should my lord be seized with the desire to know all her story, and I be compelled to relate the affair of the marriage, there would then be nothing wanting to complete my misery. And if he should visit my parish, oh, let come what will, I will not torment myself beforehand. I have cares enough. For the present, 
I shall shut myself up at home, but I foresee too well that my last days must be passed in trouble and vexation. The little troop arrived before the services of the church were over, and passing, as they had previously done, through the crowd, they proceeded to the house of Lucy's companion. Hardly had Donabondio alighted from his mule, when, making the most profuse compliments to the unknown, he begged him to apologize for him to the cardinal, as he was obliged to return directly to his parish on some urgent business. He then went in search of a staff that he had left in the hall, in which he was accustomed to call his horse, and proceeded homewards. The unknown remained at the cardinal's house, awaiting his return from the church. The good dame hastened to procure Lucy some refreshment to recruit her exhausted powers. She put some dry branches under a kettle, which she replaced over the fire, and in which swam a good fowl. After having suffered it to boil a moment, she filled a plate with the soup and offered it to Lucy, congratulating herself that the affair had happened on a day when, as she said, "'The cat was not on the hearth. It is a day of feasting for all the world,' added she, "'except for those unfortunate creatures who can hardly obtain bread of vetches and a polenta of millet. They hope, however, to receive something from our charitable cardinal. As for us, thank heaven, we are not in that situation. Between the trade of my husband and a small piece of land, we manage to live comfortably. Eat, then, poor child, with a good appetite. The fowl will be done presently, and you shall have something better. She then set about making preparations for dinner for the family. As Lucy's spirits and strength returned, the necessity of arranging her dress occurred to her mind. She therefore tied up her long disordered tresses, and adjusted the handkerchief about her neck. In doing this, her fingers entwined themselves in the chaplet, which was there suspended. She gazed at it with much emotion. In the recollection of the vow she had made, this recollection which had been suspended by so many painful sensations, now rose clearly and distinctly to her mind. All the newly awakened powers of her soul were again in a moment subdued. And if she had not been prepared for this by a life of innocence, resignation, and confidence, the consternation she experienced would have terminated in despair. After the first tumult of her thoughts had in some measure subsided, she exclaimed, "'Oh, unhappy girl, what have I done?' But hardly had she pronounced the words when she was terrified at having done so. She recalled the circumstances of her vow, her intolerable anguish, without hope of human aid, the fervor of her petition, the fullness of resolution with which the promise had been made and to repent of this promise, after having obtained the favor she had implored, appeared to her sacrilegious ingratitude, perfidy towards God and the Virgin. It seemed to her that such infidelity would certainly draw upon her new and more terrible evils, and if these should indeed be its consequences, she could no longer hope for an answer to her prayers. She therefore hastened to abjure her momentary regret, and drawing the chaplet reverently from her neck, and holding it in her trembling hand, she confirmed her vow at the same time fervently praying to God that he would grant her strength to fulfill it, and to drive from her thoughts circumstances which might, if they did not move her resolution, still increase but too much the severity of the sacrifice. The absence of Renzo, without any probability of his return, which had been at first so bitter, appeared now to her as a design of providence, to make the two events conduce to the same end, and she endeavored to find in one a consolation for the other. She also remembered that providence would, to finish the work, find means to make Renzo resigned, and cause him to forget. But scarcely had this idea entered her mind when a new terror overwhelmed her. Conscious that her heart had still need of repentance, the unfortunate girl again had recourse to prayer and mental conflict. It at length arose, if the expression may be allowed, like a victor wearied and wounded, having disarmed his enemy. Suddenly footsteps and joyous exclamations were heard. They proceeded from the children of the family, who were returning from church. Two little girls and a little boy ran into the room, stopping a moment to eye the stranger. They then came to their mother, one asking the name of their unknown guest, another wanting to relate the wonders they had seen. The good dame replied to them all with, "'Be quiet. Silence!' The master of the house then entered with a calmer step, but with joy diffused over his countenance. He was the tailor of the village and its environs, a man who knew how to read, and who had even read, more than once, the legend of the saints and the reali di Francia. He was regarded by the peasants as a man of knowledge, and when they had lavished their praises on him, he repelled them with much modesty, only saying that he had indeed mistaken his vocation, and that perhaps if he had studied, notwithstanding this little vanity, he was the best-natured man in the world. He had been present when the curate requested his wife to undertake her benevolent journey, and had not only given his approbation, but would have added his own persuasions, if that had been necessary. And now that the ceremonies of the church, and above all, the sermon of the cardinal, had given an impetus to his amiable feelings, he returned home with an ardent desire to know if the enterprise had succeeded, and to see the poor innocent girl in safety. 
see here said his wife to him as he entered pointing to lucy who rose from her seat blushing and stammering forth some apology he advanced towards her and with a friendly tone cried you are welcome welcome you bring the blessing of heaven on this house how glad i am to see you here i knew that you would arrive safely to a haven because i have never known the lord commence a miracle without accomplishing it but i am well content to see you here poor child it is a great thing however to have been the subject of a miracle we must not believe he was the only one who characterized the event by this term and that because he had read the legendary throughout the village and the surrounding country it was spoken of in no other terms as long as its remembrance lasted and to say the truth if we regard its attendant circumstances it would be difficult to find another name for it he then approached his wife who was employed in taking the kettle from the fire and said in a low voice has all gone well very well i will tell you another time well well at your leisure when the dinner was ready the mistress of the house made lucy sit down with them at table and helping her to a wing of the chicken entreated her to eat the husband began to dilate with much animation on the events of the day not without many interruptions from the children who stood round the table eating their dinner and who had seen too many extraordinary things to be satisfied with playing the part of mere listeners he described the solemn ceremonies and then recurred to the miraculous conversion but that which had made the most impression on his mind and of which he spoke the oftenest was the sermon of the cardinal to see him before the altar said he a lord like him to see him before the altar as a simple curate and that golden thing he had on his head said one of the little girls hush be quiet when one thinks i say that a lord like him a man so learned who as they say has read all the books in the world a thing which no one else has done not even in milan when one thinks that he has adapted himself so to the comprehension of others that every one understood him i understood i did said the other little chatterer hush be quiet what did you understand you i understood that he explained the gospel instead of the curate be quiet i do not say that he was understood by those only who know something but even those who were the most stupid and ignorant caught the sense perfectly you might go now and ask them to repeat his discourse perhaps they might not remember a single word but they would have its whole meaning in their head and how easy it was to perceive that he alluded to the signal although he never pronounced his name but one might have guessed it from the tears which flowed from his eyes and all the people wept that is true cried the little boy but why did they all cry like little children be quiet and there are none the less hard hearts in this country he has made us feel that although there is a scarcity we must return thanks to god and be satisfied be industrious do what we can and then be content because unhappiness does not consist at all in suffering and poverty unhappiness is the result of wicked actions these are not fine words merely it is well known that he lives like a poor man that he takes the bread from his mouth to give to those that are in need when he might live an easier life than any one there is great satisfaction in hearing him speak he is not like many others who say do as i say and not as i do and besides he has made it very apparent that those even who are not what they call gentlemen but who have more than is necessary are bound to impart to those who are in want and here he stopped as if pained by some recollection after a moment's silence he filled a plate with meat from the table and adding a loaf of bread to it tied up the hole in a napkin take that said he to the oldest of the children and putting in her other hand a bottle of wine carry that to the widow martha and tell her to feast with her children but be careful what you say to her don't seem to be doing a charity and don't say a word of it should you meet any one and take care not to break anything lucy was touched even to tears and her soul was filled with a tenderness that withdrew her from the contemplation of her own sorrows the conversation of this worthy man had already imparted a relief that a direct appeal to her feelings would have failed to procure her spirit yielding to the charm of the description of the august pomp of the church of the emotions of piety there excited and partaking of the enthusiasm of the narrator forgot its woes and when obliged to recur to them felt itself strengthened the thought even of the great sacrifice she had imposed on herself without having lost its bitterness had assumed the character of austere and solemn tranquillity a few moments after the curate of the village entered saying that he was sent by the cardinal for intelligence concerning lucy and also to inform her that he desired to see her that day then he thanked in his lordship's name her kind hosts for their benevolence and hospitality all three moved to tears could not find words to reply to such a message from such a person has your mother not yet arrived said the curate to lucy my mother cried she learning that the good archbishop had sent for her mother that it was his own kind thought her heart was overpowered she raised her apron to her eyes 
and her tears continued to flow long after the departure of the curate. As these tumultuous emotions, called forth by such unexpected benevolence, gradually subsided, the poor girl remembered that she had expressly solicited this very happiness of again beholding her mother, as a condition to her vow. "'Return me safely to my mother.' These words recurred distinctly to her memory. She was confirmed more than ever in her purpose to keep her vow, and repented again bitterly of the regret which she had for a moment experienced. Agnes, indeed, even whilst they were speaking of her, was very near. It is easy to imagine the feelings of the poor woman at so unexpected an invitation, at the intelligence, necessarily confused and incomplete, of a peril which was past, but of a frightful peril, of an obscure adventure, of which the messenger knew not the circumstances, and could give no explanation, and for which she could find no clue from previous facts. Ah, great God! Ah, holy virgin! escaped from her lips, mingled with useless questions during the journey. On the road she met Donabondio, who, by the aid of his staff, was travelling homewards. Uttering an exclamation of surprise, Agnes made the driver stop. She alighted, and with the curate withdrew into a grove of chestnuts, which was on the side of the road. Donabondio informed her of all he had seen and known. Much obscurity still rested upon his statement, but at least Agnes ascertained that Lucy was now in safety. Donabondio then introduced another subject of conversation, and would have given her ample instruction on the manner of conducting herself with the archbishop, if he, as was probable, should wish to see her and her daughter. He said it would not answer for her to speak of the marriage. But Agnes, perceiving that he spoke only from his own interest, was determined to promise nothing, because she said, She had other things to think of. And bidding him farewell, she proceeded on her journey. The carriage at last reached the house of the tailor, and the mother and daughter were folded in each other's arms. The good wife, who was the only witness of the scene, endeavored to soothe and calm their feelings, and then prudently left them alone, saying that she would go and prepare a bed for them. Their first tumultuous joy having in some measure subsided, Agnes requested to hear the adventures of Lucy, who attempted to relate them, but the reader knows that it was a history with which no one was entirely acquainted, and to Lucy herself there was much that was inexplicable, particularly the fatal coincidence of the carriage being at that place precisely at the moment that Lucy had gone there by an extraordinary chance. With regard to this, the mother and daughter lost themselves in conjecture, without even approaching the real cause. As to the principal author of this plot, however, they neither of them doubted that it was Don Roderick. "'Ah, that firebrand!' cried Agnes. "'But his hour will come. God will reward him according to his works, and then he will know—' "'No, no, mother, no!' cried Lucy. "'Do not wish harm to him. Do not wish it to any one. If you knew what it is to suffer, if you had experienced it, no, no. Rather let us pray to God and the Virgin for him, that God would touch his heart as he has done that of the other Lord, who was worse than he, and who is now a saint.' The horror that Lucy felt in retracing events so painful and recent made her hesitate more than once. More than once, she said she had not the heart to proceed, and, choked by her tears, she with difficulty went on with her narrative. But she was embarrassed by a different sentiment at a certain point of her recital, at the moment when she was about to speak of her vow. She feared her mother would accuse her of imprudence and precipitation. She feared that she would, as she had done in the affair of the marriage, bring forward her broad rules of conscience, and make them prevail. She feared that the poor woman would tell it to someone in confidence, if it were only to gain light and advice, and thus render it public. These reflections made Lucy experience insupportable shame, and an inexplicable repugnance to speak on the subject. She therefore passed over in silence this important circumstance, determining in her heart to communicate it first to Father Christopher. But how great was her sorrow at learning that he was no longer at the convent, that he had been sent to a distant country, a country called— and Renzo? inquired Agnes. He is in safety, is he not? said Lucy, hastily. It must be so, since every one says so. They say that he has certainly gone to Bergamo, but no one knows the place exactly, and there has been no intelligence from himself. He probably has not been able to find the means of informing us. Oh, if he is in safety, God be thanked! said Lucy, commencing another subject of conversation, which was, however, interrupted by an unexpected event, the arrival of the Cardinal Archbishop. After having returned from the church, and having learned from the unknown the arrival of Lucy, he had seated himself at table, placing the unknown on his right hand. The company was composed of a number of priests, who gazed earnestly at the countenance of their once formidable companion, so softened without weakness, so humbled without meanness, and compared it with the horrible idea they had so long entertained of him. Dinner being over, the unknown and the cardinal retired together. After a long interview, the former departed for his castle and the latter sent for the curate of the parish, and requested him to conduct him to the house where Lucy had received an asylum. "'Oh, my lord,' replied the curate, "'suffer me, suffer me. 
I will send for the young girl and her mother, if she has arrived, the hosts themselves, if my lord desires it. I wish to go to them myself, replied Frederick. There is no necessity that you should inconvenience yourself. I will send for them immediately, insisted the curate, who did not understand that, by this visit, the cardinal wished to do honor to misfortune, innocence, hospitality, and to his own ministry. But the superior repeating his desire, the inferior bowed, and they proceeded on their way. When they appeared in the street, a crowd immediately collected around them. The curate cried, Come, come, back, keep off. But, said Frederick, suffer them. And he advanced, now raising his hands to bless the people, now lowering them to embrace the children, who obstructed his progress. They reached the house, and entered it, whilst the crowd remained without. But amid the throng was the tailor, who had followed with others, his eyes fixed and his mouth open, wondering where the cardinal was going. When he beheld him entering his own house, he bustled his way through the crowd, crying out, Make room for those who have a right to enter, and followed into the house. Agnes and Lucy heard an increasing murmur in the street, and whilst they were surmising the cause, the door opened, and behold, the cardinal and the curate. Is this she? asked the former of the curate, and at a sign in the affirmative he approached Lucy, who with her mother was standing, motionless and mute with surprise and extreme diffidence. But the tones of the voice, the countenance, and above all, the words of Frederick, soon removed their embarrassment. Poor young woman, said he, God has permitted you to be subjected to a great trial, but he has also made you see that he watches over you and has never forgotten you. He has saved you, and in addition to that blessing, has made use of you to accomplish a great work through you, to impart the wonders of his grace and mercy to one man, and at the same time to comfort the hearts of many. Here the mistress of the house entered the room with her husband. Perceiving their guests engaged in conversation, they respectfully retired to a distant part of the apartment. The cardinal bowed to them courteously, and continued the conversation with Lucy and her mother. He mixed with the consolation he offered many enquiries, hoping to find from their answers some way of rendering them still farther services after their sufferings. It is a pity all the clergy were not like your lordship, and then they would take the part of the poor, and not help to bring them into difficulty for the sake of drawing themselves out of it, said Agnes, encouraged by the familiar and affable manner of Frederick, and vexed that Don Abondio, after having sacrificed others to his own selfishness, should dare to forbid her making the least complaint to one so much above him, when by so fortunate a chance the occasion presented itself. Say all that you think, said the cardinal. Speak freely. I would say that if our curate had done his duty, things would not have been as they are. The cardinal begging her to explain herself more clearly, she found some embarrassment in relating a history in which she had at one time played a part, which she felt very unwilling to communicate to such a man. However, she got over the difficulty. She related the projected marriage, the refusal of Dona Bondio, and the pretext he had offered with respect to his superiors. Oh, Agnes! And passing to the attempt of Don Roderick, she told in what manner, being informed of it, they had been able to escape. But indeed, added she in conclusion, it was escaping to fall into another snare. If the curate had told us sincerely the difficulty, and had married my poor children, we would have left the country immediately, and gone where no one would have known us, not even the wind. Thus time was lost, and that which has happened has happened. The curate shall render me an account of this, said the cardinal. No, my lord, no, resumed Agnes. I did not speak on that account. Do not reprove him because what is done is done, and it would answer no purpose. He is a man of such a character, that if the thing were to do over again, he would act precisely in the same way. But Lucy, dissatisfied with this manner of telling the story, added, We have also been to blame. It is plain that it was the will of God the thing should not succeed. How can you have been to blame, my poor child? said Frederick. Lucy, notwithstanding the winks of her mother, related in her turn the history of the attempt made in the house of Don Abondio, saying, as she concluded, We did wrong, and God has punished us. Accept from this hand the chastisement you have endured, and take courage, said Frederick, for who has sight to rejoice and hope, if not those who have suffered, and who accuse themselves? He then asked where was the betrothed, and learning from Agnes, Lucy stood silent with downcast eyes, the fact of his flight, he expressed astonishment and displeasure, and asked the reason of it. Agnes told what she knew of the story of Renzo. I have heard of him before, said the cardinal. But how could a man who was engaged in affairs of this nature 
be in treaty of marriage with this young girl he was a worthy young man said lucy blushing but in a firm voice he was a peaceable youth too peaceable perhaps added agnes your lordship may ask any one if he was not even the curate who knows what intrigues and plots may have been going on at milan there needs little to make poor people pass for rogues that is but too true said the cardinal i will inquire about him without doubt he took a memorandum of the name of the young man adding that he expected to be at their village in a few days that during his sojourn there lucy could return home without fear and in the meanwhile he would procure her an asylum till all was arranged for the best turning to the master and mistress of the house they came forward he renewed the thanks he had addressed to them by the mouth of the curate and asked them if they would be willing to keep the guests god had sent them for a few days oh yes my lord replied the dame with a manner which said more than this timid reply but her husband quite animated by the presence of such a man by the desire to do himself honour on an occasion of such importance studied to make a fine answer he wrinkled his forehead strained his eyes and compressed his mouth but nevertheless felt a confusion of ideas which prevented him from uttering a syllable but time pressed the cardinal appeared to have interpreted his silence the poor man opened his mouth and said imagine not a word more could he say his failure not only filled him with shame on that day but ever after the unfortunate recollection intruded itself to mar the pleasure of the great honour he had received how many times in thinking of this circumstance did a crowd of words come to his mind every one of which would have been better than imagine but the cavities of our brains are full enough of thoughts when it is too late to employ them the cardinal departed saying may the blessing of heaven rest on this house that evening he asked the curate in which way it would be best to indemnify the tailor who could not be rich for his hospitality the curate replied that truly neither the profits of his trade nor his income from some little fields that the good tailor possessed would at this time have enabled him to be liberal to others but from having saved something the few years previous he was one of the most easy in circumstances in the district that he could allow himself to exercise some hospitality without inconvenience and that he would do it with pleasure and that he was confident he would be hurt if money was offered to him he has probably said the cardinal some demands on people who are unable to pay you may judge my lord the poor people pay with the overplus of the harvest this year there has been no overplus on the contrary every one is behind in point even of necessities well i take upon myself all these debts you will do me the favour to obtain from him the memoranda and cancel them it may be a very large sum so much the better and perhaps you have but too many who are more miserable having no debts because they have no credit oh yes indeed too many they do what they can but how can they supply their wants in these hard times have them clothed at my expense it is true that it seems to be robbery to spend anything this year except for bread but this is a particular case we cannot finish our record of the history of this day without briefly relating the conduct of the unknown before his second return to the castle the report of his conversion had preceded him it had spread through the valley and excited surprise anxiety and numerous conjectures as he approached the castle he made a sign to all the bravos he met to follow him filled with unusual apprehension but with their accustomed submission they obeyed their number increased every moment reaching the castle he entered the first court and there resting on his saddle-bow in a voice of thunder he gave a loud call the wonted signal which all habitually obeyed in a moment those who were scattered around the castle hastened to join the troop collected around their leader go and wait for me in the great hall said he as they departed he dismounted from his beast and leading it himself to the stable thence approached the hall the whispering which was heard among them ceased at his appearance retiring to one corner they left a large space around him the unknown raised his hand to enforce the silence that his presence alone had already effected then raising his head which was yet above that of any of his followers he said listen to me all of you let no one speak unless i ask him a question my friends the way which we have followed until today leads to hell i do not wish to reproach you I could not effect the important change inasmuch as i have been your leader in an abominable career i have been the most guilty of all but listen to what i am about to say god in his mercy has called me to a change of life and i have obeyed his call 
may this same god do as much for you know then and hold for certain that i would rather now die than undertake anything against his holy law i recall all the inquisitor's orders which i may have given any one of you you understand me and father i order you to do nothing which i have hitherto prescribed to you hold equally for certain that no one can hereafter commit evil under my protection and in my service those who will remain with me on these conditions i shall regard as children i should be happy in the day of famine to share with them the last mouthful that remained to me to those who do not wish to continue here shall be paid what is due of their salaries and a further donative they have liberty to depart but they must never return unless they repent and intend to lead a new life and under such circumstances they shall be received with open arms think of it this night tomorrow morning i will receive your answer and then i will give you your orders now everyone to his post may god who has shown compassion towards me incline your hearts to repentance and good dispositions he ceased and all kept silence although strange and tumultuous thoughts fermented in their minds no indication of them was visible they had been habituated to listen to the voice of their lord as to a manifestation of absolute authority to which it was necessary to yield implicit obedience his will proclaimed itself changed but not enfeebled it did not therefore enter their minds that because he was converted they might become bold in his presence or reply to him as they would to another man they regarded him as a saint indeed but a saint sword in hand in addition to the fear with which he inspired them they felt for him and especially those who were born in his service and these were the greater number the affection of vassals their admiration partook of the nature of love mingled with that respect which the most rebellious and turbulent spirits feel for a superior whom they have voluntarily recognized as such the sentiments he expressed were certainly hateful to their ears but they knew they were not false neither were they entirely strange to them if their custom had been to make them subjects of pleasantry it was not from disbelief of their verity but to drive away by jesting the apprehensions the contemplation of them might otherwise have excited and now there was none among them who did not feel some compunction at beholding their power exerted over the invincible courage of their master moreover some of them had heard the extraordinary intelligence beyond the valley and had witnessed and related the joy of the people the new feeling with which the unknown was regarded by them the veneration which had succeeded their former hatred their former terror they beheld the man whom they had never regarded without trembling even when they themselves constituted to a great degree his strength they beheld him now the wonder the idol of the multitude still elevated above all others in a different manner no doubt but in one not less imposing always above the world always the first they were confounded and each was doubtful of the course he should pursue one reflected hastily where he could find an asylum and employment another questioned with himself his power to accommodate himself to the life of an honest man another moved by what he had said felt some inclination for it and another still was willing to promise anything so as to be entitled to the share of a loaf which had been so cordially proffered and which was so scarce in those days no one however broke the silence the unknown at the conclusion of his speech waved his hand imperiously for them to retire obedient as a flock of sheep they all quietly left the hall he followed them and stopping in the centre of the court saw them all branch off to their different stations he returned into the castle visited the corridors halls and every avenue and finding all quiet he retired to sleep yes to sleep for he was very sleepy in spite of all the urgent and intricate affairs in which he was involved more than at any former conjuncture he was sleepy remorse had banished sleep the night before its voice so far from being subdued was still more absolute was louder yet he was sleepy the order of his household so long established the absolute devotion of his faithful followers his power and means of exercising it its various ramifications and the objects on which it was employed all tended to create uncertainty and confusion in his mind still he was sleepy to his bed he went that bed which the night before had been a bed of thorns but first he knelt to pray he sought in the remotest corner of his memory the words of prayer taught him in his days of childhood they came one by one an age of vice had not effaced them and who shall define the sentiments that pervaded his soul at this return to the habits of happy innocence 
he slept soundly. End of chapter 24《Chapter Twenty Five of the Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.》Chapter Twenty Five The next morning, in the village of Lucy, and throughout all the territory of Lecco, nothing was talked of but herself, the unknown, the archbishop, and another person who, although generally desirous to be talked of, would willingly have been forgotten on this occasion. We mean Don Roderick. Not that, previous to this period, the villagers had not conversed much of his actions, in secret, to those in whom they had perfect confidence. But now they could no longer contain themselves, nor suppress many inquiries on the marvellous events in which two persons so famous had played a part. In comparison to these two personages, Signor Don Roderick appeared rather insignificant, and all agreed in rejoicing over the ill success of his iniquitous designs. But these rejoicings were still, in some measure, moderated by fears of the bravos by whom he was surrounded. A good portion of the public censure was bestowed on his friends and courtiers. It did not spare the Signor Podesta, always deaf and dumb and blind to the deeds of this tyrant, but these opinions were expressed in an undertone, because the Podesta had his officers. Such regard was not paid to Dr. Zekagarbugli, who had only his tricks and his verbiage to employ for his defense. And as to the whole tribe of sycophants resembling him, they were so pointed at and eyed askance that for some time they thought it most prudent to keep themselves within doors. Don Roderick, struck as by a thunderbolt with the unexpected intelligence, so different from that which he had been anticipating from day to day, kept himself shut up in his castle, alone with his bravos, devouring his rage for the space of two days, and on the third set off for Milan. If there had only existed the murmurs of the people, notwithstanding things had gone so far, he would perhaps have remained expressly to brave them but he felt himself compelled to quit the field of contest, by the certain information that the cardinal was coming to the village. The count, his uncle, who knew nothing of the story but what Attilio had told him, would certainly require him to be one of the first to visit the cardinal, in order to obtain in public the most distinguished reception from him. The count would require it, because it was an important opportunity for making known in what esteem the house was held by his powerful eminence. To escape such a dilemma, Don Roderick, having risen before the sun, threw himself into a carriage with Grizzo, and, followed by the rest of the bravos, retired like a fugitive, like, if we may be permitted to elevate him by such a comparison, like Catiline from Rome, foaming with rage and threatening a speedy return to accomplish his revenge. Meanwhile the cardinal approached, visiting every day one of the parishes situated in the territory of Lecco. On the day he was expected in the village, great preparations were made for his reception. At the entrance of the village, near the cottage of Agnes, a triumphal arch was erected, constructed of wood, covered with moss and straw, and ornamented with green boughs of birch and holly. The front of the church was adorned with tapestry. From every window of the houses were suspended quilts and sheets intended for drapery. Everything, in short, whether in good taste or bad, was displayed in honor of this extraordinary occasion. At the hour of vespers, which was the hour Frederick usually selected to arrive at the churches which he visited, those who had not gone to church, the old men, women, and the youngest of the children, went forth in procession to meet their expected guest, headed by Don Abondio. The poor curate was sad in the midst of the public joy. The tumult bewildered him, the movement of so many people, before and behind, disturbed him, and moreover he was tormented by the secret apprehension that the women had tattled, and that he should be obliged to render an account of his conduct to the cardinal. Frederick appeared at last, or rather the crowd appeared, in the midst of which was his litter, and the retinue surrounding it. The persons who followed Don Abondio scattered and mingled themselves with the crowd, notwithstanding all his remonstrances, and he, poor man, finding himself deserted by them, went to the church, there to await the cardinal's approach. The cardinal advanced, bestowing benedictions with his hands and receiving them in return from the mouths of the people, who were with difficulty kept back by his attendants. Being of the same village as Lucy, these peasants were desirous of rendering to the archbishop peculiar demonstrations of respect, but this was not practicable inasmuch as, wherever he went, he was received with every possible honor. In the very commencement of his pontificate, at his first solemn entrance into the cathedral, the concourse had been so great that his life was in peril. Some gentlemen who were near him drew their swords to keep back and alarm the crowd. Such was the rude violence of the times, that even in the general disposition to do honor to their archbishop, they were on the point of crushing him. In this defense would not have been sufficient, if two priests of great vigor and presence of mind had not raised him in their arms, and carried him from the church door to the foot of the great altar. 
His very first entrance into the church, therefore, might be recorded amidst his pastoral labors and the dangers he had run. Entering the church, the cardinal advanced to the altar, and after having prayed some time, he addressed, as was his custom, some words to the people, on his love for them, on his desire for their salvation, and how they should dispose their minds for the duties of the morrow. He then withdrew to the house of the curate, and among other questions which he put to him, he interrogated him with regard to the character and conduct of Renzo. Don Abondio replied that he was rather choleric and obstinate, but as the cardinal made more special and precise inquiries, he was obliged to confess that he was an honest, peaceable youth, and even he himself could not comprehend how he had committed at Milan the conduct which had been imputed to him. "'As to the young girl,' continued the cardinal, "'do you think she can return now with safety to her house?' "'At present,' replied Don Abondio, "'she can come and remain for a while. I say at present, ah, uh, but—' added he with a sigh your illustrious lordship should be always near at hand god is always present said the cardinal but i will use my efforts to secure a place of safety for her before dismissing don abondio he ordered him to send a litter on the following day for lucy and her mother don abondio went away quite pleased that the cardinal had talked to him of the young couple without even alluding to his refusal to marry them he knows nothing of it said he agnes has kept silence wonderful she will see him again tis true but she shall have further instructions from me so she shall he little thought poor man that frederick had only deferred the inquiry until he should have more leisure to learn the reasons of his conduct but the solicitude of the good prelate for the disposal of lucy had been rendered useless by a circumstance which we will relate the two females had, as far as possible, resumed for the few days they had to pass under the hospitable roof of the tailor their usual manner of life. As she had done at the monastery, Lucy, in a small chamber apart, employed herself in sewing, and Agnes, keeping much at home, remained for the most part with her daughter. Their conversations were affectionate and sorrowful. Both were prepared for a separation, since the sheep could not dwell in the neighborhood of the wolf. But how long was this separation to continue? The future was dark and inexplicable. But Agnes, notwithstanding, was full of agreeable anticipation. "'After all,' said she, "'if no irreparable misfortune has befallen Renzo, we shall soon hear from him. If he has found employment, and who can doubt it, and if he keeps the faith he has sworn to you, why cannot we go and live with him?' Her daughter felt as much sorrow in listening to her hopes as difficulty in replying to them. She still kept her secret in her heart and although troubled at the idea of concealment with so good a mother, she was nevertheless restrained by a thousand fears from communicating it. Her plans were, indeed, very different from those of her mother, or rather, she had none, having committed the future into the hands of Providence. She therefore endeavored to change the subject, saying in general terms that her only hope was to be permanently reunited to her mother. "'Do you know why you feel thus?' said Agnes. "'You have suffered so much that it seems impossible to you that things can turn out happily. But let God work, and if, let a ray of hope come, a single ray, and then we shall see that you will think differently." Lucy and her mother entertained a lively friendship for their kind hosts, which was warmly reciprocated, and between whom can friendship exist more in its purity than between the benefactor and the recipients of the benefit, when both have kind hearts. Agnes especially had long gossips with the mistress of the house, and the tailor afforded them much amusement by his tales and moral discourses. At dinner particularly, he had always something to relate of the sword of Roland, or of the fathers of the Thebaid. At some miles' distance from the village there dwelt a certain Don Ferrante, and Donna Prasede, his wife. The latter was a woman of high birth, somewhat advanced in age, and exceedingly inclined to do good, which is surely the most praiseworthy employment one can be engaged on in this world, but which, indulged without judgment, may be rendered hurtful, like all other good things. To do good, we must have correct ideas of good in itself considered, and this can be acquired only by control over our own hearts. Donna Prasere governed herself with her ideas, as some do with their friends. She had very few, but to these she was much attached. Among these few were a number unfortunately a little narrow and unreasonable, and they were not those she loved the least. Thence it happened that she regarded things as good which were not really so, and that she used means which were calculated to promote the very opposite of that which she intended. To this perversion of her intellect may also be attributed the fact that she esteemed all measures to be lawful to her who was bent on the performance of duty. In short, 
with good intentions her moral perceptions were in no small degree distorted hearing the wonderful story of lucy she was seized with a desire to know her and immediately sent her carriage for the mother and daughter lucy having no desire to go requested the tailor to find some excuse for her if they had been common people who desired to make her acquaintance the tailor would willingly have rendered her the service but under such circumstances refusal appeared to him a species of insult he uttered so many exclamations such as that it was not customary that it was a high family that it was out of the question to say no to such people that it might make their fortune and that in addition to all this dona prasede was a saint that lucy was finally obliged to yield especially as agnes seconded the remonstrances and arguments of the tailor the high-born dame received them with many congratulations she questioned and advised them with an air of conscious superiority which was however tempered by so many soft and humble expressions and mingled with so much zeal and devotion that agnes and lucy soon felt themselves relieved from the painful restraint her mere presence had at first imposed on them in brief donna prasede learning that the cardinal wished to procure an asylum for lucy and impelled by the desire to second and at the same time to anticipate his good intention offered to take the young girl to her house where there would be no other service required of her than to direct the labors of the needle or the spindle she added that she herself would inform the cardinal of the arrangement besides the obvious and ordinary benefit conferred by her invitation donna prasede proposed to herself another which she deemed to be peculiarly important this was to school in patience and to place in the right path the young creature who had much need of guidance the first time she heard lucy spoken of she was immediately persuaded that in one so young who had betrothed herself to a robber a criminal a fugitive from justice such as renzo there must be some corruption some concealed vice tell me what company you keep and i will tell you who you are the visit of lucy had confirmed her opinion she appeared indeed to be an artless girl but who could tell the cause of her downcast looks and timid replies there was no great effort of mind necessary to perceive that the maiden had opinions of her own her blushes sighs and particularly her large and beautiful eyes did not please donna prasede at all she regarded it as certain as if she had been told it by having authority that the misfortunes of lucy were a punishment from heaven for her connection with that villain and a warning to withdraw herself from him entirely that settled the determination to lend her cooperation to further so desirable a work for as she frequently said to herself and others was not her constant study to second the will of heaven but alas she often fell into the terrible mistake of taking for the will of heaven the vain imaginings of her own brain however she was on the present occasion very careful not to exhibit any of her proposed intentions it was one of her maxims that the first rule to be observed in accomplishing a good design is to keep your motives to yourself accepting the painful necessity of separation the offer appeared to both mother and daughter very inviting were it only on account of the short distance from the castle to their village reading in each other's countenance their mutual assent they accepted with many thanks the kindness of donna prasede who renewing her kind promises said she would soon send them a letter to present to the cardinal the two females having departed she requested don ferrante to write a letter who being a literary and learned man was employed as her secretary on occasions of importance in an affair of this sort don ferrante did his best and he gave the original to his wife in order that she could copy it he warmly recommended to her an attention to the orthography as orthography was among the great number of things he had studied and among the small number over which he had control in his family the letter was forthwith copied and sent to the tailor's house these events occurred a few days before the cardinal had dispatched a litter to bring the mother and daughter to their abode upon their arrival they went to the parsonage orders having been left for their immediate admittance to the presence of the cardinal the chaplain who conducted them thither gave them many instructions with regard to the ceremony to be used with him and the titles to be given him it was a continual torment to the poor man to behold the little ceremony that reigned around the good archbishop in this respect this results he was accustomed to say from the excessive goodness of this blessed man from his great familiarity and he added that he had even heard people address him with yes sir and no sir at this moment the cardinal was conversing with donna bondio on the affairs of his parish so that the latter had no opportunity to repeat his instructions to the females however in passing by them as they entered he gave them a glance to make them comprehend that he was well satisfied with them and that they should continue like honest and worthy women to keep silence after the first reception agnes drew from her bosom the letter of donna prasede and gave it to the cardinal saying it is from the signora donna prasede who says that she knows your illustrious lordship well my lord as naturally is the case with great people when you have read you will see it is well said frederick after having read the letter and extracted its meaning from the trash of don ferrante's flowers of rhetoric 
He knew the family well enough to be certain that Lucy had been invited into it with good intentions, and that she would be sheltered from the snares and violence of her persecutor. As to his opinion of Donna Prasede, we do not know it precisely. Probably she was not a person he would have chosen for Lucy's protectress, but it was not his habit to undo things apparently ordered by Providence in order to do them better. Submit without regret to this separation also, and to the suspense in which you are left, said he. Hope for the best and confide in God and be persuaded that all that he sends you, whether of joy or sorrow, will be for your permanent good. Having received the benediction which he bestowed on them, they took their leave. Hardly had they reached the street when they were surrounded by a swarm of friends who were expecting them, and who conducted them in triumph to their house. Their female acquaintances congratulated them, sympathized with them, and overwhelmed them with inquiries. Learning that Lucy was to depart on the following morning, they broke forth in exclamations of regret and disappointment, the men disputed with each other the privilege of offering their services. Each wished to remain for the night to guard their cottage, which reminds us of a proverb. If you would have people willing to confer favors on you, be sure not to need them. This warm reception served a little to withdraw Lucy from the painful recollections which crowded upon her mind at the sight of her loved home. At the sound of the bell which announced the commencement of the ceremonies, all moved towards the church. The ceremonies over, Don Abondio, who had hastened home to see everything arranged for breakfast, was told that the cardinal wished to speak with him. He proceeded to the chamber of his illustrious guest, who accosted him as he entered, with, Signor Curate, why did you not unite in marriage Lucy to her betrothed? They have emptied the sack this morning, thought Don Abondio, and he stammered forth, Your illustrious lordship has no doubt heard of all the difficulties of that business. It has been such an intricate affair that it cannot even now be seen into clearly, your illustrious lordship knows that the young girl is here only by a miracle and that no one can tell where the young man is i ask if it is true that before these unhappy events you refused to celebrate the marriage on the day agreed upon and why you did so truly if your illustrious lordship knew what terrible orders i received and he stopped, indicating by his manner, though respectfully, that it would be imprudent in the cardinal to inquire further. But, said Frederick, in a tone of much more gravity than he was accustomed to employ, it is your bishop who, from a sense of duty, and for your own justification, would learn from you why you have not done that which, in the ordinary course of events, it was your strict duty to do. My lord, said Don Abondio, I do not mean to say, but it appears to me that as these things are now without remedy, it is useless to stir them up. However, however, I say, that I am sure your illustrious lordship would not betray a poor curate, because, you see, my lord, your illustrious lordship cannot be everywhere present, and I, I remain here exposed however if you order me i will tell all speak i ask for nothing but to find you free from blame don abondio then related his melancholy story suppressing the name of the principal personage and substituting in its place a great lord thus giving to prudence the little that was left him in such an extremity and you had no other motive asked the cardinal after having heard him through Perhaps I have not clearly explained myself. It was under pain of death that they ordered me not to perform the ceremony. And this reason appears sufficient to prevent the fulfillment of a rigorous duty? I know my obligation is to do my duty, even to my greatest detriment, but when life is at stake. And when you presented yourself to the church, said Frederick with increased severity of manner, to be admitted to the holy ministry were there any such reservations made were you told that the duties imposed by the ministry were free from every obstacle exempt from every peril were you told that personal safety was to be the guide and limit of your duty were you not told expressly the reverse of all this were you not warned that you were sent as a lamb among wolves did you not even then know that there were violent men in the world who would oppose you in the performance of your duty 
he whose example should be our guide in imitation of whom we call ourselves shepherds when he came to earth to accomplish the designs of his benevolence did he pay regard to his own safety and if your object be to preserve your miserable existence at the expense of charity and duty there was no necessity for your receiving holy unction and entering into the priesthood the world imparts this virtue teaches this doctrine what do i say o oh, shame the world itself rejects it it has likewise its laws which prescribe good and prohibit evil it has also its gospel a gospel of pride and hatred which will not admit the love of life to be offered as a plea for the transgression of its laws it commands and is obeyed but we we children and messengers of the promise what would become of the church if your language was held by all your brethren where would she now be if she had originally come forth with such doctrines don abondio hung down his head he felt under the weight of these arguments as a chicken under the talons of a hawk who holds him suspended in an unknown region, in an atmosphere he had never before breathed. Seeing that a reply was necessary, he said, more alarmed than convinced, My lord, I have done wrong. Since we should pay no regard to life, I have nothing more to say. But when one has to do with certain powerful people who will not listen to reason, I do not see what is to be gained by carrying things with a high hand and now you know that our gain is to suffer for the sake of justice if you are ignorant of this what is it you preach what do you teach what is the good news which you proclaim to the poor who has required this at your hand to overcome force by force certainly you will not be asked at the day of judgment if you have vanquished the powerful for you have neither had the commission nor the means to do so. But you will be asked, if you have employed the means which have been placed in your power, to do that which was prescribed to you, even when man had the temerity to forbid it. These saints are odd creatures, thought Don Abondio. Extract the essence of this discourse, and it will be found that he has more at heart the love of two young people than the life of a priest he would have been delighted to have had the conversation terminate here but he well perceived that such was not the intention of the cardinal who appeared to be waiting a reply or apology or something of the kind i say my lord replied he that i have done wrong we cannot give ourselves courage and why then i might say to you have you undertaken a ministry which imposes on you the task of warring and the passions of the world but i will rather say how is it that you have forgotten that where courage is necessary to fulfil the obligations of this holy vocation the most high would assuredly impart it to you were you earnestly to implore it do you think the millions of martyrs had courage naturally that they had naturally a contempt for life young christians who had just begun to taste its charms children mothers all had courage simply because courage was necessary and they trusted in god to impart it knowing your own weakness have you ever thought of preparing yourself for the difficult situations in which you might be placed ah if during so many years of pastoral care you have loved your flock and how could you refrain from loving them if you had reposed in them your affections your dearest cares your greatest delights you would not have failed in courage love is intrepid if you had loved those who were committed to your spiritual guardianship those whom you call children if you had really loved them when you beheld two of them threatened at the same time with yourself ah certainly charity would have made you tremble for them as the weakness of the flesh made you tremble for yourself 
you would have humbled yourself before God for the first risings of selfish terror. You would have considered it a temptation and have implored strength to resist it. But you would have eagerly listened to the holy and noble anxiety for the safety of others, for the safety of your children. You would have been unable to find a moment of repose. You would have been impelled, constrained to do all that you could to avert the evil that threatened them. With what then has this love, this anxiety inspired you? What have you done for them? How have you been engaged in their service? And he paused for a reply. End of chapter 25「Chapter 26 of the Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 26 Donabondio uttered not a word. It must be confessed that we ourselves, who have nothing to fear but the criticisms of our readers, feel a degree of repugnance in thus urging the unfashionable precepts of charity, courage, indefatigable solicitude for others, and unlimited sacrifice of self. But the reflection that these things were said by a man who practiced what he preached encourages us to proceed in our relation. "'Do you not answer?' resumed the cardinal. "'Ah! If you had followed the dictates of charity and duty, whatever had been the result, you would now have been at no loss for a reply. Behold, then, what you have done. You, having obeyed iniquity, regardless of the requirements of duty. You have obeyed her promptly. She had only to show herself to you and signify her desire, and she found you ready at her call. But she would have had recourse to artifice with one who was on his guard against her. She would have avoided exciting his suspicion. She would have employed concealment that she might mature at leisure, her projects of treachery and violence. She has, on the contrary, boldly ordered you to infringe your duty and keep silence. You have obeyed, you have infringed it, and you have kept silence. I ask you now if you have done nothing more. Tell me it is true, that you have advanced false pretenses for your refusal, so as not to reveal the true motive they have told this also the tattlers thought donabondio but as he gave no indication of addressing himself to speech the cardinal pursued is it true that you told these young people falsehoods to keep them in ignorance and darkness i am compelled then to believe it it only remains for me to blush for you and to hope that you will weep with me Behold, where it has led you, merciful God, you advanced it as justification. Behold to what it has conducted you, this solicitude for your life. It has led you, repel freely the assertion if it appear to you unjust, take it as a salutary humiliation if it is not. It has led you to deceive the feeble and unfortunate, to lie to your children. This is the way of the world, thought Donabondio again. To this devil incarnate, referring to the unknown, his arms are round his neck, and to me, for half a lie, reproaches without end. But you are our superiors, of course you are right. It is my star that all the world is against me, not excepting the saints. He continued aloud. I have done wrong, I see that I have done wrong, but what could I do in so embarrassing a situation? Do you still ask? Have I not told you? And must I repeat it? You should have loved, my son. You should have loved and prayed. You would then have felt that iniquity might threaten, but not enforce obedience. You would have united, according to the laws of God, those whom man desired to separate. You would have exercised the ministry these children had a right to expect from you. God would have been answerable for the consequences, as you were obeying his orders. Now, since you have obeyed man, the responsibility falls on yourself. 
and what consequences just heaven and why did you not remember that you had a superior how would he now dare to reprimand you for having failed in your duty if he did not at all times feel himself obliged to aid you in his performance why did you not inform your bishop of the obstacles which infamous power exerted to prevent the exercise of your ministry just the advice of perpetua thought dona bondio vexed to whose mind even in the midst of these touching appeals the images which most frequently presented themselves were those of the bravos and don roderick alive and well and returning at some future time triumphant and inflamed with rage although the presence the aspect and the language of the cardinal embarrassed him and impressed him with a degree of apprehension it was however an embarrassment and an apprehension which should not subjugate his thoughts nor prevent him from reflecting that after all the cardinal employed neither arms nor bravos why did you not think pursued frederick that if no other asylum was open to these innocent victims i could myself receive them and place them in safety if you had sent them to me sent them afflicted and desolate to their bishop as therefore belonging to him as the most precious part i say not of his charge but of his wealth and as for you i should have been anxious for you i would not have slept until certain that not a hair of your head would be touched and do you not suppose that this man however audacious he may be would have lost something of his audacity when convinced that his designs were known by me that i watched over them and that i was decided to employ for your defence all the means within my power know you not that if man promises too often more than he performs he threatens also more than he dare execute know you not that iniquity does not depend solely on its own strength but on the credulity and cowardice of others just the reasoning of perpetua thought don abondio without considering that this singular coincidence in judgment of frederick borromeo and his servant was an additional argument against him but you pursued the cardinal you have only contemplated your own danger how is it possible that your personal safety can have appeared of importance enough to sacrifice everything to it because i saw them i saw those frightful faces escaped from don abondio i heard those horrible words your illustrious worship talks well but you should have been in the place of your poor priest and have had the same thing happen to you no sooner had he uttered these words than he bit his tongue perceiving that he had suffered himself to be overcome by vexation he muttered in a low voice now for this storm and raising his eyes timidly he was astonished to see the cardinal whom he never could comprehend pass from the severe air of authority and rebuke to that of a soft and pensive gravity it is but too true said frederick such is our terrible and miserable condition we exact rigorously from others that which we would not be willing to render ourselves we judge correct and reprimand and god alone knows what we would do in the same situation what we have done in similar situations but woe be to me if i take my weakness for the measure of another's duty for the rule of my instruction nevertheless it is certain that that while imparting precepts i should also afford an example to my neighbour and not resemble the pharisee who imposes on others enormous burthens which he himself would not so much as touch with his finger hear me then my son my brother the heirs of those in authority are oftener better known to others than to themselves if you know that i have from cowardice or respect of the opinions of men neglected any part of my duty tell me of it frankly so that where i have failed in example i may at least not be wanting in humble confession show me freely my weakness and then words from my mouth will be more available because you will be conscious that they do not proceed from me but that they are the words of him who can give to us both the necessary strength to do what he prescribes oh what a holy man 
But what a troublesome one, thought Donabondio. He censures himself and wishes that I should examine, criticize, and control even his actions. He continued aloud. Oh, my lord jest, surely. Who does not know the courage and indefatigable zeal of your illustrious lordship? Yes, added he to himself. By far too indefatigable. I do not desire praise that makes me tremble, because God knows my imperfections, and what I know of them myself is sufficient to humble me. But I would desire that we should humble ourselves together. I would desire that you should feel what your conduct has been, and that your language is opposed to the law you preach, and according to which you will be judged. All turns against me. But these persons who have told your lordship these things, have they not also told you that they introduced themselves treacherously into my house for the purpose of compelling me to perform the marriage ceremony in a manner unauthorized by the church? They have told me, my son, but what afflicts and depresses me is to see you still seeking excuses, still excusing yourself by accusing others, still accusing others of that which should have formed a part of your own confession. Who placed these unfortunates, I do not say under the necessity, but under the temptation to do what they have? Would they have sought this irregular method if the legitimate way had not been closed to them? Would they have thought of laying snares for their pastor if they had been received, aided, and advised by him? Of surprising him, if he had not concealed himself, and you wish to make them bear the blame, and you are indignant that, after so many misfortunes, what do I say? In the very midst of misfortune, they have suffered a word of complaint to escape before their pastor and yours. That the complaints of the oppressed and the afflicted should be hateful to the world is not astonishing, but to us, and what advantage would their silence have been to you? Would you have been the gainer from their cause having been committed entirely to the judgment of God? Is it not an additional reason to love them that they have afforded you the occasion to hear the sincere voice of your pastor, that they have provided for you the means to understand more clearly, and quite as far as may be in your power, the great debt you have contracted to them? Ah, if they had even been the aggressors, I would tell you to love them for that very reason. Love them because they have suffered and do suffer. Love them because they are part of your flock, because you yourself have need of pardon and of their prayers. Donabondio kept silence, but no longer from vexation and an unwillingness to be persuaded. He kept silence from having more things to think of than to say. The words which he heard were unexpected conclusions, a new application of familiar doctrine. The evil done to his neighbor, which apprehension on his own account had hitherto prevented him from beholding in its true light, now made a novel and striking impression on his mind. If he did not feel all the remorse which the cardinal's remonstrances were calculated to produce, he experienced at least secret dissatisfaction with himself and pity for others, a blending of tenderness and shame. As, if we may be permitted to use the comparison, a humid and crushed taper at first hisses and smokes, but by degrees receives warmth and imparts light from the flame of a great torch to which it is presented. Dona Bondio would have loudly accused himself and deplored his conduct, had not the idea of Don Roderick still obtruded itself into his thoughts. However, his feeling was sufficiently apparent to convince the cardinal that his words had at last produced some effect. Now, pursued Frederick, one of these unfortunate beings is a fugitive afar off, the other on the point of departure. Both have but too much reason to keep asunder without any present probability of being reunited. Now, alas, they have no need of you. Now, alas, you have no longer the opportunity to do them good, and our short foresight can assure us of but little of the future. But who knows if God, in his compassion, is not preparing the occasion for you? Ah, uh, do not let it escape. Seek it. Watch for it. Implore it as a blessing. I shall not fail, my lord. 
I shall not fail to do so, I assure you, replied Donabondio in a tone that came from the heart. Ah, yes, my son, yes, cried Frederick with affectionate dignity. Heaven knows that I would have desired to hold other converse with you. We have both had a long pilgrimage through life. Heaven knows how painful it has been to me to grieve your old age by reproaches. How much more I should have loved to occupy the time of this interview in mutual consolation and mutual anticipation of the heavenly hope which is so near our grasp. God grant that the language I have been obliged to hold may be useful to both of us. Act in such a manner that he will not call me to account on the great and terrible day for having retained you in a ministry of which you were unworthy. Let us redeem the time. The night is far spent. The spouse will not linger. Let us keep our lamps trimmed and burning. Let us offer to God our poor and miserable hearts, that he may fill them with his love. So saying, he arose to depart. Donabondio followed him. We must now return to Donna Prasede, who came, according to agreement, on the following morning for Lucy, and also to pay her duty to the cardinal. Frederick bestowed many praises on Lucy, and recommended her warmly to the kindness of Donna Prasede. Lucy separated herself from her mother with many tears, and again bade farewell to her cottage and her village. But she was cheered by the hope of seeing her mother once more before their final departure, as Donna Prasede informed them that it was her intention to remain for a few days at her villa, and Agnes promised to visit it again to take a last farewell. The cardinal was on the point of setting out for another parish, when the curate of the village near which the castle of the unknown was situated demanded permission to see him. He presented a small packet and a letter from that lord, in which Frederick was requested to present to Lucy's mother a hundred crowns of gold, to serve as a dowry for the maiden, or for any other purpose she might desire. The unknown also requested him to tell them that if ever they should be in need of his services, the poor girl knew but too well the place of his abode, and as for him, he should consider it a high privilege to afford her protection and assistance. The cardinal sent immediately for Agnes, and informed her of the commission he had received. She heard it with equal surprise and joy. "'God reward this signor,' said she. "'Your illustrious lordship will thank him in our name, but do not say a word of the matter to any one, because we live in a world. You will excuse me, I know a man like your lordship does not tattle about such things, but you understand me.' Returning to her house, she shut herself up in her chamber and untied the packet. Although she was prepared for the sight, she was filled with wonder at seeing, in her own power and in one heap, such a quantity of those coins which she had rarely ever seen before, and never more than one at a time. She counted them over and over again, and wrapping them carefully in a leather covering, concealed them under one corner of her bed. The rest of the day was employed in reverie, and projects for the future, and desires for the arrival of the morrow. The night was passed in restless dreams, and vain imaginings of the blessings to be produced by this gold. At break of day she arose and departed for the villa of Donna Prasede. The repugnance that Lucy had felt to mention her vow had not all diminished, but she resolved to overcome it and to disclose the circumstance to her mother in this conversation, which would probably be the last they should have for a long time. No sooner were they left alone than Agnes, with an animated countenance, but in a low voice, said, "'I have great news to tell you,' and she related her unexpected good fortune. "'God bless the signor,' said Lucy. You have now enough to live comfortably yourself, and also to benefit others. Oh, yes, we can do a great deal with this money. Listen, I have only you, that is, I have only you two in the world, for from the moment that Renzo first addressed you, I have considered him as my son. We will hope that no misfortune has befallen him, and that we shall soon hear from him. As for myself, I would have wished to lay my bones in my own country, but now that you cannot stay here on account of this villain, oh, even to think that he was near me would make me dislike any place. I am quite willing to go away. I would have gone with you to the end of the earth before this good fortune, but how could we do it without money? The poor youth had indeed saved a few pence, of which the law deprived him, but in recompense God has sent us a fortune. So then, when he has informed us that he is living, and where he is, and what are his intentions, I will go to Milan for you. Yes, I will go for you. Formerly I would not have dreamt of such a thing, but misfortune gives courage and experience. I have been to Monza. I know what it is to travel. 
I will take with me a man of resolution. For instance, Alessio de Magianico. I will pay the expense, and... Do you understand? But perceiving that Lucy, instead of exhibiting sympathy with her plans, could with difficulty conceal her agitation and distress, she stopped in the midst of her harangue, exclaiming, What is the matter? Are you not of my opinion? My poor mother! cried Lucy, throwing her arms around her neck and concealing on her bosom her face, bathed in tears. What is the matter? said Agnes in alarm. I ought to have told you sooner, but I had not the heart to do it. Have pity on me. But speak, speak then. I cannot be the wife of that unfortunate youth. Why? How? Lucy, with downcast looks and flowing tears, confessed at last the vow which she had made. She clasped her hands and asked pardon of her mother for having concealed it from her, conjuring her to speak of it to no one and to lend her aid to enable her to fulfill it. Agnes was overwhelmed with consternation. She would have been angry with her daughter for so long maintaining silence towards her had not the grave thoughts that the circumstance itself excited stifled all feeling of resentment. She would have blamed her for the vow had it not appeared to her to be contending against heaven, for Lucy described to her again in more lively colors than before that horrible night, her utter desolation, and unexpected preservation. Agnes listened attentively, and a hundred examples that she had often heard related, that she herself had even related to her daughter, of strange and horrible punishments for violated vows, came to her memory. "'And what wilt thou do now?' said she. "'It is with the Lord that care rests, the Lord and the Holy Virgin. I have placed myself in their hands. They have never yet abandoned me. They will not abandon me now that—' "'The favor I ask of God, the only favor, after the safety of my soul, is to be restored to you, my beloved mother. He will grant it, yes, he will grant it. That fatal day— in the carriage. O oh, most holy virgin, those men! Who would have thought I should be the next day with you? But why not tell your mother at once? Forgive me, I had not the heart. What use was there in afflicting you sooner? And Renzo? said Agnes, shaking her head. Ah! cried Lucy, starting. I must think no more of the poor youth. God has not intended. You see, it appears to be his will that we should separate. And who knows? But no, no, the Lord will preserve him from every danger, and render him, perhaps, happier without me. But, nevertheless, if you had not bound yourself for ever, provided no misfortune has happened to Renzo, with this money I would have found a remedy for all our other evils. But my mother, would this money have been ours if I had not passed that terrible night? It is God's will that all should be thus. His will be done. And her voice became inarticulate through tears. At this unexpected argument, Agnes maintained a mournful silence. After some moments, Lucy, suppressing her sobs, resumed, Now that the thing is done, we must submit cheerfully. And you, dear mother, you can aid me, first in praying to the Lord for your poor daughter, and then it is necessary that Renzo should know it. When you ascertain where he is, have him written to. Find a man. Your cousin Alessio, for instance, who is prudent and kind, who has always wished us well, and who will not tattle. Make Alessio write to him, and inform him of the circumstance as it occurred, where I was, and how I suffered. Tell him that God has ordered it thus, and that he must set his heart at rest." that as for me I can never be united to any one. Make him understand the matter clearly. When he knows that I have promised the Virgin, he always has been pious. And you, as soon as you hear from him, get someone to write to me. Let me know that he is safe and well, and nothing more. Agnes, with much emotion, assured her daughter that all should be done as she desired. I would say something more. That which has befallen the poor youth would never have occurred to him if he had never thought of me. He is a wanderer, a fugitive. He has lost all his little savings. He has been deprived of everything he possessed, poor fellow. And you know why. And we, we have so much money. Oh, mother, since the Lord has sent us wealth, and since the unfortunate— You regard him as your son, do you not? Ah! Divide it, share it with him. Endeavor to find a safe man and send him the half of it. God knows how much he may need it. That is just what I was thinking of, replied Agnes. 
Yes, I will do it certainly. Poor youth. And why did you think I was so pleased with the money if it were not... But I came here well pleased, tis true. But since matters are so, I will send it to him. Poor youth. He also... I know what I mean. Certainly money gives pleasure to those who have need of it. But this money... Ah, it is not this that will make him prosper. Lucy returned thanks to her mother for her prompt and liberal accordance with her request, so fervently that an observer would have imagined her heart to be still devoted to Renzo, more than she herself was aware of. And without thee, what shall I do? I, thy poor mother, said Agnes, weeping in her turn. And I, without you, my dear mother, and in a house of strangers at Milan? But the Lord will be with us both, and will reunite us. In eight or nine months we shall see each other again. Let us leave it to him. I will incessantly implore this favor from the Virgin. If I had anything more to offer her, I would not hesitate. But she is so compassionate, she will surely grant my prayer. The mother and daughter parted with many tears, promising to see each other again, the coming autumn at the latest, as if it depended on themselves. A long time elapsed before Agnes heard anything of Renzo. Neither message nor letter was received from him. The people of the village were as ignorant concerning him as herself. She was not the only one whose enquiries had been fruitless. It was not a mere ceremony in the Cardinal Frederick when he promised Lucy and Agnes to inform himself of the history and fate of Renzo. He fulfilled that promise by writing immediately to Bergamo for the purpose. While at Milan, on his return from visiting his diocese, he received a reply, in which he was informed that little was known of the young man that he had made, it was true, a short sojourn in such a place, but that one morning he had suddenly disappeared, that a relation of his, with whom he had lived while there, knew not what had become of him. He thought that he had probably enlisted for the Levant, or had passed into Germany, or, which was most likely, that he had perished in crossing the river. It was added, however, that should any more definite intelligence be received concerning him, his illustrious lordship should immediately be informed of it. These reports eventually travelled to Lecco and reached the ears of Agnes. The poor woman did her best to ascertain the truth of them, but she was kept in a state of suspense and anxiety by the contradictory accounts which were given, and which were, in fact, all without foundation. The governor of Milan, lieutenant-general under Don Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordova, had complained bitterly to the lord resident of Venice at Milan that a robber, a villain, an instigator of pillage and massacre, the famous Lorenzo Tramalino, had been received in the Bergamascan territory. The resident replied that he knew nothing of the matter, but that he would write to Venice for information concerning it, in order to give some explanation to His Excellency. It was a maxim at Venice to encourage the tendency of the Milanese workmen in silk to establish themselves in the Bergamascan territory by making them find it to their advantage to do so. For this reason, Bortolo was warned confidentially that Renzo was not safe in his present residence, and that he would do wisely to place him in some other manufactory, and even cause him to change his name for a while. Bortolo, who was quick of apprehension, made no objections, related the matter to his cousin, and taking him to another place fifteen miles off, he presented him, under the name of Antonio Rivolta, to the master of the manufactory, who was a native of Milan, and moreover his old acquaintance. He, although times were hard, did not require much entreaty to induce him to receive a workman so warmly recommended by an old friend. He saw reason afterwards to congratulate himself on the acquisition, although at first the young man appeared rather heedless, because, when they called Antonio, he scarcely ever answered. A short time after, an order arrived from Venice to the captain of Bergamo, to inform himself and to send word to government whether there was not within his jurisdiction, and particularly in such a village, such an individual. The captain, having obeyed in the best manner he could, transmitted a reply in the negative, which was transmitted to the resident at Milan, in order that he should transmit it to Don Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordova. There were not wanting inquisitive people, who inquired of Bortolo why the young man had left him. The first time the question was put to him, he simply replied, he has disappeared. To relieve himself, however, from the most persevering, he framed the stories we have already related, at the same time offering them as mere reports that he had heard, without, however, placing much reliance upon them. But when the enquiry came to be made by an order of the cardinal, or rather, by order of some great person, as his name was not mentioned, Bortolo became more uneasy, and judged it prudent to maintain his ordinary method of reply, with this addition, that he gave to the stories he had fabricated an air of greater verity and plausibility. We must not conclude, however, that Don Gonzalo had any personal dislike to our poor mountaineer. We must not conclude that, informed perhaps of his disrespect and ill-timed jests upon his Moorish king and chained by the throat, he wished to wreak his vengeance on him, nor that he considered him a person dangerous enough to be pursued even in his flight, as was Hannibal by the Roman Senate. 
Don Gonzalo had too many things to think of to trouble himself with the actions of Renzo, and if he appeared to do so, it was the result of a singular concurrence of circumstances, by which the poor fellow, without wishing it, or even knowing why, found himself attached, as by an invisible thread, to numerous and important affairs. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni Translated by George William Fenshaw this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 27 We have had occasion to mention more than once a war which was then fermenting, for the succession to the states of the Duke Vincenzo Gonzaga, the second of the name. We have said that, at the death of this duke, his nearest heir, Carlos Gonzaga, chief of a younger branch transplanted to France, where he possessed the duchies of Nevers and Rethel, had entered into possession of Mantua and Montferrat. The Spanish minister, who wished at any price to exclude from these two fiefs the new prince, and wanted some pretense to advance for his exclusion, had declared his intention to support the claims upon Mantua of another Gonzaga, Ferrante, prince of Guastalla, and those upon Montferrat of Carlos Emmanuel I, Duke of Savoy, and Margarita Gonzaga, Duchess Dowager of Lorraine. Don Gonzalo, who was descended from the great captain whose name he bore, had already made war in Flanders, and as he was desirous beyond measure to direct one in Italy, he made the greatest efforts to promote it. By interpreting the intentions, and by going beyond the orders of the minister, he had, in the meantime, with the Duke of Savoy, concluded a treaty for the invasion and division of Montferrat, and easily obtained the ratification of it by the Count Duke, by persuading him that the acquisition of Casale, which was the point best defended of the portion granted to the King of Spain, was extremely easy. However, he still continued to protest, in the name of his sovereign, that he desired to occupy the country only as a trust until the decision of the emperor should be declared but in the meantime the emperor influenced by others as well as by motives of his own had refused the investiture to the new duke and ordered him to leave in sequestration the states which had been the subject of contention promising after he should have heard both parties to give it to the one whom he should deem justly entitled to it the duke of nevers would not submit to these conditions the duke had high and powerful friends being supported by the cardinal richelieu the Senate of Venice, and the Pope. But the first of these, absorbed at the time by the siege of Rochelle, embarrassed in a war with England, thwarted by the party of the Queen Mother, Mary de' Medici, who, for particular reasons, was hostile to the House of Nevers, could only hold out hopes and promises. The Venetians would not stir in the contest until a French army arrived in Italy, and while secretly aiding the Duke, they confined themselves in their negotiations with the court of Madrid and the government of Milan to protests, offers, or even threats, according to the circumstances. Urban VIII recommended the Duke of Nevers to his friends, interceded for him with his adversaries, and made propositions of peace, but he never afforded him any military aid. The two powers, allied for offensive operations, could then securely begin their enterprise. Carlos Emmanuel entered Montferrat, and Don Gonzalo gladly undertook the siege of Casale. But he did not meet with the success he had anticipated. The court did not afford him all the supplies he demanded. His ally, on the contrary, was too liberal in his aid to the cause, for, after having taken his own portion, he also took that which had been assigned to the king of Spain, Don Gonzalo, inexpressibly enraged, but fearing, if he made the least complaint, that Carlos, as active in intrigue and as brave in arms as he was fickle in disposition and false to his promises, would throw himself on the side of France, was constrained to shut his eyes, to champ the bit, and to maintain a satisfied appearance. Whether from the firm resistance of the besieged, or from the small number of troops employed against them, or, according to some statements, from the numerous mistakes of Don Gonzalo, the siege, although protracted, was finally unsuccessful. It was at this very period that the sedition of Milan obliged Don Gonzalo to go thither in person. In the relation that was there made to him, the flight of Renzo was mentioned, and the facts, real or supposed, which had caused his arrest. He was also informed that this man had taken refuge in the territory of Bergamo. This latter circumstance attracted the attention of Don Gonzalo. He knew that the Venetians had taken an interest in the insurrection of Milan, and that, in the beginning of it, they had imagined that, on that account alone, he would be obliged to raise the siege of Casale, and thus incur a heavy disappointment to his hopes. In addition to this, immediately after this event, the news was received, so much desired by the Senate, and so much dreaded by Gonzalo, of the surrender of Rochelle. Stung to the quick, as a man and a politician, and vexed at his loss of reputation, he sought out every occasion to convince the Venetians that he had lost none of his former boldness and determination. He therefore ventured to make loud complaints of the conduct of the Senate, 
the resident of Venice, having come to pay his respects to him, and endeavouring to read in his features and deportment what was passing in his mind, Don Gonzalo spoke lightly of the tumult as a thing already quieted, making use, however, of the reception of Renzo in the Bergamascan territory as a pretext for complaint against the Venetians. The result is known to our readers. When he had answered his own purposes with the affair, it was entirely forgotten by him. But Renzo, who was far from suspecting the little importance that was in reality attached to him, had for a long time no other thought but to keep himself concealed. It may well be supposed that he desired ardently to send intelligence to Lucy and her mother, and to hear from them in return. But to this there were two very great obstacles. It was necessary to confide in an amanuensis, as he himself was unable to write, an accomplishment in those days not very usual in his class. And how could he venture to do this, where all were strangers to him? The other difficulty was to find a trusty messenger to take charge of the letter. He finally succeeded in overcoming these difficulties and found one of his companions who could write for him. But not knowing whether Lucy or Agnes were still at Monza, he thought it best to enclose the letter under cover to Father Christopher, with a few lines in addition to him. The writer engaged to send it, and gave it to a man who was to pass near Pescarenico, and who left it in an inn on the route, in a neighboring place to the convent, and with many injunctions for its safe delivery. As the cover was directed to a capuchin, it was carried to Pescarenico, but it was never known what farther became of it. Renzo, not receiving an answer, caused another letter to be written, and enclosed it to one of his relations at Lecco. This time the letter reached its destination. Agnes requested her cousin Alessio to read it for her, and to write an answer, which was sent to Antonio Rivolta at the place of his abode. All this, however, was not done so quickly as we tell it. Renzo received the answer and wrote a reply. In short, there was a correspondence, however irregular, established between them. But the manner of carrying on such a correspondence, which is the same perhaps at this day, we will explain. The absent party who can't write selects one who possesses the art from amongst his own class, and which he can more securely trust. To him he explains with more or less clearness his subject and his thoughts. The man of letters comprehends part, guesses the rest, gives an opinion, proposes an alteration, and finishes with, leave it to me. Then begins the translation of the spoken into the written thoughts. The writer corrects, improves, overcharges, diminishes, or even omits, according to his opinion of the graces of style. The finished letter is, accordingly, often wide of the mark aimed at. But when at length it reaches the hands of a correspondent, equally deficient in the art of reading running hand, he is under the like necessity of finding a learned clerk of the same caliber to interpret the hieroglyphics. Hereupon arise questions upon the various meanings. Towards their elucidation, the one supplies philological notices upon the text, the other commentaries upon the hidden matter, so that, after mature discussion, they may come to the same understanding between themselves, however remote that may be from the intention of the originator of the perplexity. This was precisely the condition of our two correspondents. The first letter from Renzo contained many details. He informed Agnes of the circumstance of his flight, his subsequent adventures, and his actual situation. These events, however, were rather hinted at than clearly explained, so that Agnes and her interpreter were far from drawing any definite conclusions from the relation of them. He spoke of secret information, of a change of name, that he was in safety, but that he was obliged to keep himself concealed. Further, the letter contained pressing and passionate inquiries with regard to Lucy, with some obscure references to the reports which had reached him, mingled with vague expressions of hope and plans for the future, and affectionate exhortations to constancy and patience. Sometime after the receipt of this letter, Agnes sent Renzo an answer, with the fifty crowns that had been assigned him by Lucy. At the sight of so much gold he did not know what to think, and with his mind agitated by reflections by no means agreeable, he went in search of his amanuensis, requesting him to interpret the letter, and afford him a clue to the development of the mystery. The amanuensis of Agnes, after some complaints on the want of clearness in Renzo's epistle, described the wonderful history of this person, so he called the unknown, and thus accounted for the fifty crowns. Then he mentioned the vow, but only paraphrastically, adding more explicitly the advice to set his heart at rest, and not to think of Lucy any more. Renzo was very near quarrelling with his interpreter. He trembled, he was enraged with what he had understood, and with what he had not understood. He made him read three or four times this melancholy epistle, sometimes understanding it better, sometimes finding obscure and inexplicable that which at first had appeared clear. In the delirium of his passion he desired his amanuensis to write an answer immediately. After the strongest expressions of pity and horror at the misfortunes of Lucy, Right, pursued he, that I do not wish to set my heart at rest, and that I never will, that this is not advice to give me, and that, moreover, I will never touch the money, but will keep it in trust, as the dowry of a young girl, that Lucy belongs to me, 
and that I will not abide by her vow, that I have always heard that the Virgin interests herself in our affairs for the purpose of aiding the afflicted and obtaining favor for them, but that I have never heard that she will protect those who do evil and fail to perform their promises, say that as such cannot be the case, her vow is good for nothing, that with this money we can establish ourselves here, and that if our affairs are now a little perplexed, it is a storm which will soon pass away. Agnes received this letter, sent an answer, and the correspondence continued for some time as we have related. When her mother informed Lucy that Renzo was well and in safety, she derived great relief from the intelligence, desiring but one thing more, which was that he should forget, or rather, that he should endeavor to forget her. On her part she made a similar resolution with respect to him, a hundred times a day, and employing every means of which she was mistress to accomplish so desirable an end, she applied herself incessantly to labor, endeavoring to give to it all the powers of her soul. When the image of Renzo occurred to her mind, she tried to banish it by prayer. But while thinking of her mother, and how could she avoid thinking of her mother, the image of Renzo intruded himself as a third into the place so often occupied by the real Renzo. However, if she did not succeed in forgetting, she contrived at least to think less frequently of him, and in this she would have been more successful had she been left to prosecute the work alone. But alas, Donna Prasede, who on her part was determined to drive the poor youth from her mind, thought there was no better expedient for the purpose than to talk of him incessantly. Well, said she, do you still think of him? I think of no one, said Lucy. Donna Prasede, who was not a woman to be satisfied with such an answer, replied, That you want actions, not words. Discussing at length the tendencies of young girls, she said, When they once give their heart to a libertine, it is impossible to withdraw their affections. If their love for an honest man is, by whatever means, unfortunate, they are soon comforted. But love for a libertine is an incurable wound. And then, beginning the panegyric of poor Renzo, of this rascal who wished to deluge Milan in blood and reduce it to ashes, she concluded by insisting that Lucy should confess the crimes of which he had been guilty in his own country. Lucy, with a voice trembling from shame, grief, and from as much indignation as her gentle disposition and humble station permitted her, declared and protested that in her village this poor youth had always acted peaceably and honorably, and had obtained a good reputation. She wished, she said, that one of his countrymen were present to bear testimony to the truth. Even respecting the events at Milan, of which t'was true she knew not the details, she defended him, and solely on the account of the acquaintance she had had with his habits from infancy. She defended him, or rather she meant to defend him, from the pure duty of charity, from love of truth, and as being her neighbor. But Donna Prasede deduced from this defense new arguments to convince Lucy that this man still held a place in her heart, of which he was not worthy. At the degrading portrait which the old lady drew of him, the habitual feelings of her heart with regard to him, and her knowledge and estimate of his character, revived with double force and distinctness. Her recollections, which she had had so much difficulty in subduing, returned vividly to her imagination. In proportion to the aversion and contempt manifested by Donna Prasere towards the unfortunate youth, just in such proportion did she recall her former motives for esteem and sympathy. This blind and violent hatred excited in her heart stronger pity and tenderness. Such conversations could not be much prolonged without resolving Lucy's words into tears. If Donna Prasede had been led to this course of conduct by hatred towards Lucy, the tears of the latter, which flowed freely during these examinations, might have subdued her to silence. But as she was moved to speak by the desire of doing good, she never suffered herself to be softened by them, for groans and supplications may arrest the arm of an enemy, but not the friendly lance of the surgeon. After having reproached her for her wickedness, she passed to exhortations and advice, mingling also a few praises, to temper the bitter with the sweet, and obtain more certainly the effect she desired. These disputes, which had nearly the same beginning, middle, and end, did not, however, leave any trace of resentment against her severe lecturer in the gentle bosom of Lucy. She was, in other respects, treated with much kindness by the lady, and she believed her, even in this matter, to be guided by good, though mistaken, intentions. There did follow them, however, such agitation, such uneasy awakening of slumbering thoughts, that much time and effort were requisite to restore her to any degree of tranquillity. It was a happiness for Lucy that Donna Prasede's sphere of usefulness was somewhat extensive. Consequently, these tiresome conversations could not be so frequently repeated. Besides her immediate household, composed, according to her opinion, of persons that had more or less need of correction and regulation, and besides all the other occasions which presented themselves for her rendering the same office from pure benevolence to persons who required not the duty at her hands, 
She had five daughters, neither of whom lived at home, but they gave her the more trouble from that very cause. Three were nuns, and two were married. Dona Praseda consequently had three monasteries and two families to govern, a vast and complicated machinery, and the more troublesome, as two husbands, supported by a numerous kindred, three abbesses, defended by other dignitaries, and a great number of nuns, would not accept her superintendence. There was a continual warfare, polite indeed, but active and vigilant, a perpetual attention to avoid her solicitude, to close up the avenues to her advice, to elude her inquiries, and to keep her in as much ignorance as possible of their affairs. In her own family, however, her zeal could display itself freely. All were governed by her authority, and submissive to her in every respect, with the exception of Don Ferrante. With him things were conducted in a peculiar manner. A man of study, he neither loved to obey nor command. He was perfectly willing that his wife should be mistress in all things pertaining to household affairs, but not that he should be her slave. And if, at her request, he lent upon occasion the services of his pen, it was because he had a particular taste for such employments and, moreover, he could refuse to do it when not convinced of the propriety of her demand. "'Well,' he would say, "'do it yourself, since the matter appears so plain to you.' Dona Prasede, after vainly trying to induce him to submission, took refuge in grumbling against him as an original, a man who would have his own way, a mere scholar, which latter title, however, she never gave him without a degree of complacency, mingling itself with her displeasure. Don Ferrante passed much time in his study, where he had a considerable collection of choice books. He had selected the most famous works on many different subjects, in each of which he was more or less versed. In astrology he was justly considered more than an amateur, because he not only possessed the general notions and the common vocabulary of influences, aspects, and conjunctions, but he could speak to the point, and like a professor, of the twelve houses of heaven, of the great and lesser circles, of degrees lucid and obscure, of exaltations, passages, and revolutions in short, of the principles the most certain and most recondite of the science. For more than twenty years, in long and frequent disputes, he had sustained the preeminence of Cardon against another learned man attached to the system of Alcabizio. "'From pure obstinacy,' said Don Ferrante, who, in acknowledging voluntarily the superiority of the ancients, could not, however, endure the prejudice which would never accord to the moderns even that which they evidently deserved. He had also a more than ordinary acquaintance with the history of the science— he could cite the most celebrated predictions which had been verified, and reason very skilfully and learnedly on other celebrated predictions which had not been verified, demonstrating that the failure was not owing to any deficiency in the science, but to the ignorance which could not apply its principles. He had acquired as much ancient philosophy as would have contented a man of ordinary ambition, but he was continually adding to his stock from the study of Diogenes Laertius. However, as we cannot adhere to every system, and as from among them all, a choice is necessary to him who desires the reputation of a philosopher, Don Ferrante made choice of Aristotle, who, as he was accustomed to say, was neither ancient nor modern. He possessed many works of the wisest and most subtle disciples of the school of Aristotle among the moderns. As to those of his opponents, he would not read them. "'Because it would be a waste of time,' he said, "'nor buy them, because it would be a waste of money.' In the judgment of the learned, therefore, Don Ferrante passed for an accomplished peripatetic, although this was not the judgment he passed on himself, for, more than once, he was heard to declare with singular modesty that the essence, the universals, the soul of the world, and the nature of things were not matters so clear as people thought. As to natural philosophy, he made it more a pastime than a study. He had rather read than digested the works of Aristotle himself on the subject. Nevertheless, with a slight acquaintance with that author, and the knowledge he had incidentally gathered from other treatises of general philosophy, he could, when necessary, entertain an assembly of learned persons in reasoning most acutely on the wonderful virtues and singular characteristics of many plants. He could describe exactly the forms and habits of the sirens and the phoenix, the only one of its kind. He could explain how it was that the salamander lived in fire, how drops of dew became pearls in the shell, how the chameleon lived on air, and a thousand other secrets of the same nature. He was, however, much more addicted to the study of magic and sorcery, as this was a science more in vogue, and withal more serviceable, and the facts of which were of preeminent importance. It is not necessary to add that, in devotion to such a science, he had no other purpose than to obtain an accurate knowledge of the worst artifices of the sorcerers, in order to guard himself against them. Guided by the great Martino Dorio, he was able to discourse, ex professo, on the enchantment of love, the enchantment of sleep, the enchantment of hatred, and on the innumerable species of these three chief enchantments, which, alas, are witnessed every day in their destructive and baneful effects. 
His knowledge of history, especially universal history, was not less vast and solid. But, said he often, what is history without politics, a guide who conducts without teaching anyone the way, as politics without history is a man without a guide to conduct him? Here was then a small place on his shelf, assigned to statistics. There, among others of the second rank, were seen Bowden, Cavalcanti, Sansovino, Paruta, and Boccalini. There were, however, two books that Don Ferrante preferred to all others on the subject, two which he called, for a long time, the first of the kind, without deciding to which of the two this rank exclusively belonged. One was Il Principe, and the Discorsi, of the celebrated secretary of Florence. "'A rascal, tis true,' said he, "'but profound.' The other, La Ragion di Stato, of the not less celebrated Giovanni Botero. "'An honest man, tis true,' said he, "'but cunning.' But, a short time before the period to which our history belongs, a work appeared which had terminated the question of preeminence, a work in which was comprised and condensed a relation of every vice, in order to enable men to avoid it, and every virtue in order to enable men to practice it. A book of few leaves, indeed, but all of gold. In a word, the Statissa Regnante of Don Valeriano Castiglione, of the celebrated man, upon whom the most learned men emulated each other in bestowing praises, and for whose notice the greatest personages contended, whom Pope Urban the Eighth honored with a magnificent eulogium, whom Cardinal Borghese and the Viceroy of Naples, Don Pietro de Toledo, solicited to write the first, the life of Pope Paul V, the second, the wars of the Catholic King in Italy, and both in vain, whom Louis the Thirteenth, King of France, with the advice of Cardinal Richelieu, named his historiographer, upon whom the Duke Carlos Emmanuel of Savoy conferred the same office, and in praise of whom the Duchess Cristina, daughter to his most Christian majesty Henry the Fourth, added in a diploma, after many other titles, the renown he had obtained in Italy as the first writer of the age. But if Don Ferrante might be said to be well versed in all the above sciences, there was one in which he deserved and really obtained the title of professor, the science of chivalry. He not only spoke of it as a master, but was often requested to interfere in nice points of honor and give his decision. He had in his library, and, we may add, in his head also, the works of the most esteemed writers on the subject, particularly Torquato Tasso, whom he had always ready, and he could, if required, cite from memory all the passages of the Jerusalem delivered, which might be brought forward as authority in these matters. We might speak more at large of this learned man, but we feel it to be time to resume the thread of our history. Nothing of importance occurred to any of the personages of our story before the following autumn, when Agnes and Lucy expected to meet again, but a great public event disappointed this hope. Other events followed, which produced no material change in their destiny. Then occurred new misfortunes, powerful and overwhelming, coming upon them like a hurricane, which impetuously tears up and scatters every object in its way, sweeping the land, and bearing off with its irresistible and mighty power every vestige of peace and prosperity. That the particular facts which remain to be related may not appear obscure, we must recur for a while to the farther recital of general facts. End of chapter 27「Chapter twenty eight of the Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter twenty eight. After the famous sedition on St. Martin's Day, it may be said that abundance flowed into Milan, as if by enchantment. The shops were well stirred with bread, the price of which was no higher than in the most fruitful years. Those who, on that terrible day, had howled through the streets and committed every excess in their power, had now reason to congratulate themselves. But, with the cessation of their alarm, they had not resumed their accustomed quiet. On the squares and in the inns, there were congratulations and boastings, although in an undertone, at having hit on a mode of reducing the price of bread. However, in the midst of these popular rejoicings, there reigned a vague apprehension and presentiment that this happiness would be of short duration." They besieged the bakers and vendors of flour with the same pertinacity as during the period of the former factitious and transient abundance, produced by the first tariff of Antony Ferrer. He who had some pence by him converted them immediately into bread and flour, which was piled in chests and small casks and even in vessels of earthenware. In thus attempting to extend the advantages of the moment, their long duration was rendered, I do not say impossible, for it was so already, but even their momentary continuance thus became still more difficult." On the 15th of November, Antony Ferrer, 
by the order of His Excellency. Publish a decree in which it was forbidden to anyone having any quantity of grain or flour in his house to purchase more, and to the rest of the people to buy bread beyond that which was necessary for two days. Under pecuniary and corporal penalties, at the discretion of His Excellency. The decree ordered the Anziani, officers of justice, and invited everybody as a duty to denounce the offenders. It commanded the judges to cause search to be made in every house which might be mentioned to them, issuing at the same time a new command to the bakers to keep their shops well furnished with bread. Under penalty of five years in the galleys, and still greater punishment at the discretion of His Excellency. A great effort of imagination would be required to believe that such orders were easy of execution. In commanding the bakers to make such a quantity of bread, means ought to have been afforded for the supply of the material of which it was to be made. In seasons of scarcity, there is always an endeavor to make into bread various kinds of aliment, which, under ordinary circumstances, are consumed under other forms. In this way, rice was introduced into the composition of a bread which was called mistura. On the 23rd of November there was a decree issued which placed at the order of the vicar and twelve members of provision the half of the rice that each possessed, under penalty for selling it without the permission of those lords of the loss of the entire commodity, and a fine of three crowns the bushel. But this rice had to be paid for at a price very disproportioned to that of bread. The burden of supplying this enormous difference was imposed on the city, but the Council of Ten resolved to send a remonstrance to the governor on the impossibility of sustaining such a tax and the governor fixed, by a decree of the 13th of December, the price of rice at twelve livres the bushel. It is also probable, though nowhere expressly stated, that the maximum price for other sorts of grain was fixed by other proclamations. Whilst, by these various measures, bread and flour were kept at a low price in Milan, it consequently happened that crowds of people rushed into the city to supply their wants. Don Gonzalo, to remedy this inconvenience, forbade, by another decree of the 15th of December, the carrying out of the city bread to the value of more than twenty pence. The penalty was a fine of twenty-five crowns, and in case of inability, a public flogging, and greater punishments still, at the discretion of His Excellency. The populace wished to procure abundance by pillage and conflagration. The legal power wished to maintain it by the galleys and the rope. Every method was resorted to to accomplish their purpose, but the reader will soon learn the total failure of them all. It is, besides, easy to see, and not useless to observe, that these strange means had an intimate and necessary connection with each other. Each was the inevitable consequence of the proceeding, and all, in fact, flowed from the first error, that of fixing upon bread a price so disproportioned to that which ought to have resulted from the real state of things. Such an expedient, however, has always appeared to the populace not only conformable to equity, but very simple and easy of execution. It is then very natural that in the agonies and misery which are the necessary effects of scarcity, they should, if it be in their power, adopt it. But as the consequences begin to be felt, the government is obliged to repair the evil by new laws, forbidding men to do that which previous laws had recently prescribed to them. The principal fruits of the insurrection were these, the destruction or loss of much provision in the insurrection itself, in the rapid consumption of the small quantity of grain then on hand, which should otherwise have lasted until the next harvest. To these general effects may be added the punishment of four of the populace, who were hung as leaders of the sedition, two before the baker's shop of the crutches, and two at the corner of the street in which was situated the house of the superintendent of provision. The historical relations of this epoch are handed down to us with so little clearness that it is difficult to ascertain when this arbitrary tariff ceased. But we have numerous accounts of the situation of the country, and especially the city, in the winter of that year and the following spring. In every quarter shops were closed, and the manufactories were, for the most part, deserted. The streets afforded a terrible spectacle of sorrow and desolation. Mendicants by profession, now the smallest number, were confounded with the new multitude, disputing for alms with those from whom they had formerly been accustomed to receive them. Clerks and servants, dismissed by the merchants and shopkeepers, hardly existing upon some scanty savings. Merchants and shopkeepers themselves failing and ruined by the stoppage of trade. Artificers wandering from door to door lying along the pavement, by the houses and churches, soliciting charity and hesitating between want and shame, emaciated and feeble, reduced by long fasting and the rigors of the cold which penetrated their tattered clothing, servants dismissed by their masters who were incapable of maintaining their accustomed numerous and sumptuous establishments, and the numerous dependence upon the labor of these various classes, old men, women, and children, 
grouped around their former supporters, or wandered in search of support elsewhere. Among the wretched crowds also might be distinguished, by their long lock, by the remnants of their magnificent apparel, by their carriage and gestures, and by the traces which habit impresses on the countenance, many bravos, who, having lost in the common misery their criminal means of support, were reduced to an equality of suffering, and with difficulty dragged themselves along the city that they had so often traversed, with a proud and ferocious bearing, magnificently armed and attired. They now extended with humility the hand which they had so frequently raised to menace with insolence, or to strike with treachery. But the most dense, livid, and hideous swarm was that of the villagers. These were seen in entire families, husbands and wives, dragging along their little ones, and supporting in their arms their wretched babies, whilst their own aged and helpless parents followed behind. All flocked into the city in hopes of obtaining bread. Some, whose houses had been invaded and despoiled by the soldiery, had fled in despair. Some, to excite compassion and render their misery more striking, showed the wounds and bruises they had received defending their homes. And others, whom this scourge had not reached, had been driven, by the two scourges from which no corner of the country was exempt, sterility and the consequent increase on the price of provisions, to the city, as to the abode of abundance and pious munificence. The newcomers might be recognized, by their air of angry astonishment and disappointment, at finding such an excess of misery, where they had hoped to be themselves the peculiar objects of compassion and benevolence. Here, too, might be recognized, in all their varieties of ragged habiliments, in the midst of the general wretchedness, the pale dweller of the marsh, the bronzed countenance of the plain or hill countryman, and the sanguine complexion of the mountaineer, all, however, alike in the hollow eye, ferocious or insane countenance, knotted hair, long and matted beard, attenuated body, shriveled skin, and bony breast, all alike reduced to the lowest condition of languor, of infantine debility. Heaps of straw and stubble were seen along the walls, and by the gutters, which appeared to be a particular provision of charity for these unfortunate creatures. There their limbs reposed during the night, and in the day they were occupied by those who, exhausted by fatigue and suffering, could no longer bear the weight of their emaciated bodies. Sometimes, upon the damp straw, a dead body lay extended. Sometimes, the miserable spark of life was rekindled in its feeble tenement, by timely succor from a hand rich in the means and in the disposition to do good, the hand of the pious Frederick. He had made choice of six priests of ardent charity and robust constitution, and, dividing them into three companies, assigned to each the third of the city as their charge. They were accompanied by porters, laden with food, cordials, and clothing. Each morning these worthy messengers of benevolence passed through the streets, approached those whom they beheld stretched on the pavement, and gave to each their kindly assistance. Those who were too ill to be benefited by temporal succor received from them the last offices of religion. Their assistance was not limited to present relief. The good bishop requested them, wherever it was possible, to furnish more efficacious and permanent comfort, by giving to those who should be in some measure restored to strength money for their future necessities, lest returning want should again plunge them into wretchedness and misery, and to obtain shelter for others who lay exposed in the street in the neighboring houses, by requesting their inhabitants to receive the poor afflicted ones as boarders, whose expenses would be paid by the cardinal himself. Frederick had not waited for the evil to attain its height, in order to exercise his benevolence, and to devote all the powers of his mind towards its amelioration. By uniting all his means, by practicing strict economy, by drawing upon the sums destined to other liberalities, and which had now become of secondary importance, he endeavored to amass money in order to employ it entirely for those who were suffering from hunger and its consequences. He bought a quantity of grain, and sent it to the most destitute parts of his diocese. But as the succor was far from adequate to the necessity, he sent with it a great quantity of salt. With which, says Ripamonti, relating the fact, the herbs of the field and the leaves of trees were made food for men. He distributed grain and money to the curates of the city, and he himself traveled over it, administering alms, and secretly aiding many indigent families. In the Episcopal Palace, rice was boiled every day, and dealt out to the necessities of the people, to the extent of two thousand measures. Besides these splendid efforts of a single individual, many other excellent persons, though with less powerful means, strove to mitigate the horrible sufferings of the people. Of these sufferers, thousands struggled to grasp the broth or other food, provided at different quarters, and thus prolong for a day, at least, their miserable lives. But thousands were still left behind in the struggle, in these generally the weakest the aged women and children, and these might be seen, dead and dying from inanition in every part, 
but in the midst of these calamities not the least disposition to insurrection appeared. The void that mortality created each day in the miserable multitude was each day more than replenished. There was perpetual concourse, at first from the neighboring villages, then from the more distant territories, and finally from the Milanese cities. The ordinary spectacle of ordinary times, the contrast of magnificent apparel with rags and of luxury with poverty, had entirely disappeared. The nobility even wore coarse clothing, some because the general misery had affected their fortune, others because they would not insult the wretchedness of the people, or because they feared to provoke the general despair by the display of luxury at such a time. Thus passed the winter and the spring. Already had the tribunal of health remonstrated with the tribunal of provision on the danger to which such mass of misery exposed the city. To prevent contagious diseases, a proposal was made to confine the vagabond beggars in the various hospitals. Whilst this project was under discussion, some approving and others condemning, dead bodies encumbered the streets. The tribunal of provision, however, proposed another expedient as more easy and expeditious, which was to shut up all the mendicants, healthy or diseased, in the lazaretto, and to maintain them there at the expense of the city. This measure was resolved upon, notwithstanding the remonstrances of the tribunal of health, who objected that, in so numerous an assemblage, the evil to which they wished to apply a remedy would be greatly augmented. The little order that reigned in the lazaretto, the bad quality of the food, and the standing water which was drank plentifully, soon created numerous maladies. To these causes of mortality, so much the more active from operating on bodies already exhausted or enfeebled, was added the unfavorableness of the season, obstinate rains, followed by more obstinate drought, and violent heat. To these physical evils were added others of a moral nature, despair and wearisomeness in captivity, desire for accustomed habits, regret for cherished beings of whom these unfortunate beings had been deprived, painful apprehension for those who were living, and the continual dread of death which had itself become a new and powerful cause of the extension of disease. It is not to be wondered at that mortality increased in this species of prison to such a degree as to assume the appearance and deserve the name of pestilence. The number of deaths in the lazaretto soon amounted to a hundred daily. Whilst within these wretched walls, grief, fear, anguish, and rage prevailed. In the tribunal of provision, shame, astonishment, and irresolution were equally apparent. They consulted and now listened to the advice of the tribunal of health, Finding they could do no better than to undo what they had done, at so much expense and trouble, they opened the doors of the lazaretto, and released all who were well enough to leave it. The city was thus again filled with its former cries, but feebler and more interrupted. The sick were transported to Santa Maria della Stella, which was then the hospital for the poor, and the greater part perished there. However, the fields began to yield the harvest so long desired, and the troops of peasants left the city for their long prayed-for and accustomed labors. The ingenious and inexhaustible charity of the good Frederick still exerted itself. He made a present of a julio and a sickle to each peasant who solicited it at the palace. With a plentiful harvest, scarcity ceased to be felt. The mortality, however, continued, in a greater or less degree, until the middle of autumn. It was on the point of ceasing when a new scourge overwhelmed the city and country. Many events of high historical importance had occurred in this interval of time. The Cardinal Richelieu, after having taken Rochelle and made a treaty of peace with England, had proposed, affected by his powerful influence in the councils of the French king, that efficacious aid should be sent to the Duke of Nevers. He had also persuaded the king to lead the expedition in person. Whilst the preparations were in progress, the Count of Nassau, imperial commissary, suggested to the new duke and Mantua the expediency of replacing his states in the hands of Ferdinand, intimating that, in case of refusal, an army would be immediately sent by the emperor to occupy them. The duke, who in the most desperate circumstances had rejected so hard a condition, encouraged now by the promised succors from France, was determined still longer to defend himself. The commissary departed, declaring that force would soon decide the matter. In the month of March, the Cardinal Richelieu, with the king at the head of the army, demanded a free passage from the Duke of Savoy. He entered into treaties for the purpose, but nothing was concluded. After a re-encounter, in which the French obtained the advantage, a new treaty was entered into, in which the duke stipulated that Don Gonzalo de Cordova should raise the siege of Casale, engaging, in the case of his refusal, to unite with the French, and invade the Duchy of Milan. Don Gonzalo raised the siege of Casale, and a body of French troops entered it, to reinforce the garrison. The Cardinal Richelieu decided to return to France on business which he regarded as more urgent, but Girolamo Soranzo, envoy from Venice, offered the most powerful reasons to divert him from this resolution. To these the king and the cardinal paid no attention. They returned with the greatest part of the army, leaving only six thousand men at Suza to occupy the passes and maintain the treaty. 
whilst this army departed on one side, that of Ferdinand, commanded by the Count of Colato, advanced on the other. It had invaded the country of the Grison, in the Valtelline, and was preparing to come down on the Milanese. Besides the usual terrors which such an expectation was calculated to excite, the report was spread that the plague lurked in the imperial army. Alessandro Tadino, one of the conservators of the public health, was charged by the tribunal to state to the governor the frightful danger which threatened the country, if this army should obtain the pass which opened on Mantua. It appears from all the actions of Gonzalo that he was possessed by a desire to occupy a great place in history, but, as often happens, history has failed to register one of his most remarkable acts, the answer he returned to this Dr. Tadino, which was, That he knew not what could be done, that reasons of interest and honor, which had induced the march of the army, were of greater weight than the danger represented, that he would, however, endeavor to act for the best, and that they must trust to providence. In order, then, to act for the best, their two physicians proposed to the tribunal to forbid, under the most severe penalty, the purchase of any articles of clothing from the soldiers who were about to pass. As to Don Gonzalo, his reply to Dr. Tadino was one of his last acts at Milan, as the ill success of the war, which had been instigated and directed by him, caused him to be displaced in the course of the summer. He was succeeded by Marquis Ambrosio Spinola, who had already acquired the military celebrity in the wars of Flanders, which still endures. Meanwhile, the German troops had received definite orders to march upon Mantua, and in the month of September they entered the Duchy of Milan. At this epoch armies were composed for the greater part of adventurers, enlisted by condottieri, who held their commission from some prince, and who sometimes pursued the occupation on their own account, so as to be able to sell themselves and followers together. Men were drawn to this vocation much less by the pay which was assigned to them, than by the hope of pillage and the charms of license. There was no fixed or general discipline, and as their pay was very uncertain, the spoils of the countries which they overran were tacitly accorded to them by their commanders. It was a saying of the celebrated Wallensteins that it was easier to maintain an army of one hundred thousand men than one of twelve thousand. In this army of which we are now speaking was part of that which in the Thirty Years' War had desolated all Germany. It was commanded by one of Wallenstein's lieutenants, and consisted of twenty-eight thousand infantry and seven thousand horse. In descending from the Valtelline towards Milan, they had to coast along the Adda, to the place where it empties into the Po, eight days' march in the Duchy of Milan. A great proportion of the inhabitants retired to the mountains, carrying with them their most precious possessions. Some remained to watch the sick, or to preserve their dwellings from the flames, or to watch the valuable property which they had buried or concealed, and others remained because they had nothing to lose. When the first detachment arrived at the place where they were to halt, the soldiers scattered themselves through the country, and subjected it at once to pillage. All that could be eaten or carried off disappeared. Fields were destroyed, and cottages burnt to the ground. Every hiding-place, every method to which people had resorted, in their despair for the defense of their property, became useless, nay, often resulted in the peculiar injury of the proprietor. Strict search was made throughout every house by the soldiers. They easily detected in the gardens the earth which had been newly dug. They penetrated the caverns in search of the opulent inhabitants who had taken refuge there, and dragging them to their houses, forced them to declare where they had concealed their treasures. At last they departed. Their drums and trumpets were heard receding in the distance, and a temporary calm succeeded to these hours of tumult and affright. But alas, the sound of drums was again heard, announcing the arrival of another detachment, the soldiers of which, furious at not finding booty, destroyed what the work of desolation had spared, burned the furniture and the houses, and manifested the most cruel and savage disposition towards the inhabitants. This continued for a period of twenty days, the army containing that number of divisions. Colico was the first territory of the duchy that these demons invaded. They then threw themselves on Bellano, from which they entered and spread themselves in the Val Sassina, whence they marched into the territory of Lecco. End of chapter 28「Chapter 29 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 29 Here, among those who were expecting the arrival of the army in alarm and consternation, we find persons of our acquaintance. He who did not behold Don Abondio on the day when the report was spread of the descent of the army, of its near approach, and its successes, can have no idea of the power of fright upon a feeble mind. All sorts of reports were afloat. They are coming, thirty, forty, fifty thousand men. 
they have sacked Cortanova, burnt Prima Luna, plundered Introbio, Pasturo, Barcio. They have even been at Balobio. Tomorrow they will be here. Such were the statements in circulation. The villagers assembled in tumultuous crowds, hesitating whether to fly or remain, while the women lamented aloud over their miserable fate. Don Abondio, to whom flight had immediately suggested itself, saw in it, nevertheless, invincible obstacles and frightful dangers. "'What shall I do?' cried he. "'Where shall I go?' The mountains, without speaking of the difficulty of ascending them, were not safe. The foot-soldiers climbed them like cats, if they had the slightest indication or hope of booty. The waters of the lake were swollen. It was blowing violently, in addition to which, the greater part of the watermen, fearing to be forced to pass soldiers or baggage, had taken refuge with their boats on the opposite shore. The few barks that remained were already filled with people, and endangered by the weather. It was impossible to find a carriage or horse, or any mode of conveyance. Don Abondio did not dare venture on foot, incurring, as he would, the probability of being stopped on the road. The confines of the Bergamascan territory were not so distant, but that he could have walked there in a little while. But a report had reached the village that a squadron of Capaletri had been sent in haste from Bergamo to guard the frontiers against the German foot-soldiers. These were not less devils incarnate than those they were commissioned to oppose. The poor man was beside himself with terror. He endeavored to concert with Perpetua some plan of escape, but Perpetua was quite occupied in collecting and concealing his valuables. With her hands full, she replied, "'Let me place this in safety. We will then do as other people do.' Don Abondio desired eagerly to discuss with her the best means to be pursued, but Perpetua, between hurry and fright, was less tractable than usual. "'Others will do the best they can,' she said. "'And so will we. Excuse me, but you only hinder one. Do you not think they have skins to save as well as we?' Relieving herself thus from his importunities, she went on with her occupation. The poor man, as a last resource, went to a window and cried in a piteous tone to the people who were passing, "'Do your poor curate the favour to bring him a horse or a mule. Is it possible no one will come to help me? Wait for me at least. Wait till I can go with you. Abandon me not. Would you leave me in the power of these dogs? Know you not that they are Lutherans?' and that the murder of a priest will seem to them a meritorious deed. Would you leave me here to be martyred? But to whom did he address this appeal? To men who were themselves encumbered with the weight of their humble movables, or, disturbed by the thoughts of what they had been obliged to leave behind, exposed to the ravages of the destroyer. One drove his cow before him, another conducted his children, who were also laden with burdens, his wife perhaps with an infant in her arms. Some went on their way without replying or looking at him, Others merely said, "'Eh, sir, do as you can. You are fortunate in having no family to think of. Help yourself. Do the best you can.' "'Oh, poor me!' cried Don Abondio. "'Oh, what savages! They have no feeling. They give not a thought to their poor curate.' And he went again in search of Perpetua. "'Oh, you are come just in time,' said she. "'Where is your money?' "'What shall we do with it?' Give it to me. I will bury it in the garden with the plate. But, 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 give it to me. Keep a few pence for necessity, and let me manage the rest. Don Abondio obeyed, and drawing his treasure from his strong box, gave it to Perpetua. I will bury it in the garden, at the foot of the fig tree, said she as she disappeared. She returned in a few moments with a large basket full of provisions, and a small one, which was empty. Into the latter she put a few articles of clothing for herself and master. You must take your breviary with you, said she. But where are we going? Where everyone else goes. We will go into the street, and then we shall hear and see what we must do. At this moment Agnes entered with a small basket in her hand, and with the air of one about to make an important proposal. She had decided not to wait the approach of the dangerous guests, alone as she was, and with the gold of the unknown in her possession, but had remained some time in doubt where to seek an asylum. The residue of the crowns, which in time of famine would have been so great a treasure, was now the principal cause of her anxiety and irresolution, as, under the present circumstances, those who had money were worse off than others, being exposed at the same time to the violence of strangers and the treachery of their companions. It is true none knew of the wealth which had thus, as it were, fallen to her from heaven, except Don Abondio, to whom she had often applied to change a crown, leaving him always some part of it for those more unfortunate than herself. But hidden property, above all, 
to those not accustomed to such a possession, keeps the possessor in continual suspicion of others. Now, whilst she reflected on the peculiar dangers to which she was exposed by the very generosity itself of the unknown, the offer of unlimited service which had accompanied the gift suddenly occurred to her recollection. She remembered the description she had heard of his castle, as situated in a high place where, without the concurrence of the master, none dared venture but the birds of heaven. Resolving to go thither, and reflecting on the means of making herself known to the signor, her thoughts recurred to Donabondio, who, since the conversation with the archbishop, had been very particular in his expression of good feeling towards her, as he could at present be without compromising himself, there being but little probability, from the situation of affairs, that his benevolence would be put to the test. She naturally supposed that in a time of such consternation the poor man would be more alarmed than herself, and might acquiesce in her plan. This was, therefore, the purpose of her visit. Finding him alone with Perpetua, she made known her intentions. "'What do you say to it, Perpetua?' asked Donabondio. "'I say that it is an inspiration from heaven, and that we must lose no time, and set off immediately.' "'But then?' "'But then, but then. When we have arrived safely there, we shall be very glad, that's all. It is well known that this signor thinks of nothing now but doing good to others, and he will afford us an asylum with the greatest pleasure.' there on the frontiers and almost in the sky the soldiers will not trouble us but then but then we shall have enough to eat no doubt on the top of the mountains the provisions we have here with us would not serve us long is it true that he is really converted can you doubt it after all you have seen and if after all we should be voluntarily placing ourselves in prison what prison with this trifling excuse me we shall never come to any conclusion worthy agnes your plan is an excellent one so saying she placed the basket on the table and having passed her arms through the straps swung it over her shoulders could we not procure said donabondio some man to accompany us should we encounter some ruffian on the way what assistance would you be to me not done yet always losing time cried perpetua go then and look for a man and you will find every one engaged in his own business i warrant you come take your breviary and your hat and let us be off don abondio was obliged to obey and they departed they passed through a small door into the churchyard perpetua closed it from custom not for the security it could now give don abondio cast a look towards the church it is for the people to guard it thought he it is their church let them see to it if they have the heart they took the by-paths through the fields but were in continual apprehension of encountering some one who might arrest their progress they met no one however all were employed either in guarding their houses or packing their furniture or travelling with their movables towards the mountains don abondio after many sighs and interjections began to grumble aloud he complained of the duke of nevers who could have remained to enjoy himself in france had he not been determined to be duke of mantua in despite of all the world of the emperor and above all of the governor whose duty it was to keep this scourge from the country and not invoke it by his taste for war let these people be they cannot help us now said perpetua these are your usual chatterings excuse me which mean nothing that which gives me the most uneasiness what is it perpetua who had been leisurely recalling to mind the things which she had so hastily concealed remembered that she had forgotten such an article and had not safely deposited such another that she had left traces which might impart information to the depredators. "'Well done!' cried Don Abondio, in whom the security he was beginning to feel with regard to his life allowed his anxiety to appear for his property. "'Well done! Is this what you have been doing? Where were your brains?' "'How?' replied Perpetua, stopping for a moment and attempting, as far as her load would permit, to place her arms akimbo do you find fault when it was yourself who teased me out of my wits instead of helping me as you ought to have done i have thought more of my master's goods than my own and if there is anything lost i can't help it i have done more than my duty agnes interrupted these disputes by introducing her own troubles she was obliged to relinquish the hope of seeing her dear lucy for some time at least for she could not expect that donna prasere would come into this vicinity under such circumstances the sight of the well-remembered places through which they were passing increased the anguish of her feelings. Leaving the fields, they had taken the high road, the same which the poor woman had travelled, in reconducting for so short a time her daughter to her home, after having been with her at the tailor's, as they approached the village. "'Let us go and visit these worthy people,' said Agnes. "'And rest a little, and eat a mouthful,' said Perpetua. 
for I begin to have enough of this basket. On condition that we lose no time, for this is not by any means a journey for amusement, said Dona Bondio. They were received with open arms and cordially welcomed. Agnes, embracing the good hostess, wept bitterly, replying with sobs to the questions her husband and she asked concerning Lucy. She is better off than we are, said Dona Bondio. She is at Milan, sheltered from danger, far from these horrible scenes. The senor curate and his companions are fugitives, are they not? said the tailor. Yes, yes replied at the same time Perpetua and her master. I sympathize with your misfortunes. We are going to the castle of... That is well thought of. You will be as safe as in paradise. And are you not afraid here? We are too much off the road. If they should turn out of their way, we shall be warned in time. The three travellers decided to take a few hours' rest, as it was the hour of dinner. Do me the honour, said the tailor, to partake of my humble fare. Perpetua said she had provisions enough in her basket wherewith to break her fast. After a little ceremony, however, on both sides, they agreed to seat themselves at the dinner-table. The children had joyfully surrounded their old friend Agnes. The tailor ordered one of them to roast some early chestnuts. "'And you,' said he to another, "'go to the garden and bring some peaches, all that are ripe. And you,' to a third, "'climb the fig tree and gather the best figs. It is a business to which you are well accustomed.' As for himself, he left the room to tap a small cask of wine, while his wife went in search of a tablecloth. All being prepared, they seated themselves at the friendly board, if not with unmingled joy, at least with much more satisfaction than they could have anticipated from the events of the morning. What does the senior curate say to the disasters of the times? I can fancy I'm reading the history of the Moors in France, said the tailor. What do I say? That even that misfortune might have befallen me, replied Dona Bondio. You have chosen an excellent asylum, however, for none can ascend those heights without the consent of the master. You will find a numerous company there. Many people have already fled thither, and there are fresh arrivals every day. I dare to hope we shall be well received. I know this worthy signor. When I had the honor to be in his company, he was all politeness. And, said Agnes, he sent me word by his illustrious lordship that if ever I should need assistance, I had only to apply to him. What a wonderful conversion, resumed Don Abondio and he perseveres does he not persevere the tailor spoke at length of the holy life of the unknown and said that after having been the scourge of the country he had become its best example and benefactor and the people of his household that band asked don abondio who had heard some contradictory stories concerning them and did not feel therefore quite secure the greater part have left him replied the tailor and those who have remained have changed their manner of life in short, this castle has become like the Thebaid. The senor curate understands me. Then, retracing with Agnes the visit of the cardinal. What a great man, said he. A great man indeed. What a pity he remains so short a time with us. I wish to do him honour. Oh, if I'd only been able to address him again, more at my leisure. When they rose from the table, he showed them an engraving of the cardinal, which he had hung on the door from veneration to his virtues and also to enable him to assure everybody that it was no likeness. He knew it was not, as he had regarded him closely at his leisure in this very room. "'Did they mean that for him?' said Agnes. "'The habit is the same, but—' "'It is no likeness, is it?' said the tailor. "'That is what I always say. But other things being wanting, there is at least his name under it, which tells who it is.' Don Abondio being impatient to be gone, the tailor went in search of a vehicle to carry the little company to the foot of the ascent, and returned in a few moments to inform them it was ready. "'Senor Curate,' said he, "'if you wish a few books to carry with you, I can lend you some, for I amuse myself sometimes with reading. They are not like yours, to be sure, being in the vulgar tongue, but—' "'A thousand thanks. But under present circumstances, I have scarcely brains enough to read my breviary.' After an exchange of thanks, invitations, and promises, they bade farewell, and pursued with a little more tranquillity the remainder of their journey. The tailor had told Don Abondio the truth with regard to the new life of the unknown. From the day that we took our leave of him, he had continued to put in practice his good intentions, by repairing injuries, reconciling himself with his enemies, and succoring the distressed and unfortunate. 
the courage he had formerly evinced in attack and defence he now employed in avoiding all occasion both for the one and the other he went unarmed and alone disposed to suffer the possible consequences of the violences he had committed persuaded that it would be adding to his crimes to employ any methods of defence for himself as he was a debtor to all the world and persuaded also that though the evil done to him would be a sin against god it would be but a just retribution against himself and that he had left himself no right to revenge an injury however unprovoked it might be at the time but he was not less inviolable than when he bore arms to ensure his safety the recollection of his former ferocity and the contrast of his present gentleness the former exciting a desire of revenge the latter rendering this revenge so easy conspired to subdue hatred and in its place to substitute an admiration which served him as a safeguard the man whom no one could humble but who had humbled himself was regarded with the deepest veneration those whom he had wronged had obtained beyond their hopes and without incurring any danger a satisfaction which they could never have promised themselves from the most complete revenge the satisfaction of seeing him repent of his wrongs and participate so to speak in their indignation in his voluntary abasement his countenance and manner had acquired without his own knowledge something elevated and noble his outward demeanour was as dauntless as ever this change also in addition to other reasons secured him from public retribution at the instigation of those in authority his rank and family which had always been a species of defence to him still prevailed in his favour and to his name already famous was joined the personal esteem which was now due to him the magistrates and nobility had rejoiced at his conversion as well as the people as this conversion produced compensations that they were neither accustomed to ask nor obtain probably also the name of cardinal frederick whose interest in his conversion and subsequent friendship for him were well known served him as an impenetrable shield upon the arrival of the german troops when fugitives from the invaded countries fled to the castle delighted that his walls so long the object of dread and execration to the feeble should now be regarded as a place of security and protection the unknown received them rather with gratitude than politeness he caused it to be made public that his doors would be open to all and employed himself immediately in placing not only the castle but the valley beneath it in a state of defence assembling the servants who had remained with him he addressed them on the opportunity god had afforded them as well as himself to serve those whom they had so frequently oppressed and terrified with his old accent of command expressing the certainty of being obeyed he gave them general orders as to their deportment so that those who should take refuge with him might be holding them only defenders and friends he gave their arms to them again of which they had been deprived as also to the peasants of the valley who were willing to engage in its defence he named officers and appointed them to their duty and their different stations as he had been accustomed to do in his former criminal life he himself however whether from principle or that he had made a vow to that effect remained unarmed at the head of his garrison he also employed the females of the household in preparing beds straw mattresses sacks and various rooms intended as temporary dormitories he ordered abundant provisions to be brought to the castle for the use of the guests god should send him and in the meanwhile he was himself never idle visiting every post examining every defence and maintaining the most perfect order by his authority and his presence end of chapter twenty nine Chapter Thirty of the Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Thirty. As our fugitives approached the valley, they were joined by many companions in misfortune, who were on the same errand to the castle with themselves. Under similar circumstances of distress and anguish, intimacies are soon matured and they listened to the relation of each other's peril with mutual interest and sympathy. Some had fled, like the curates and our females, without waiting the arrival of the troops. Others had actually seen them, and could describe in lively colors their savage and horrible appearance. "'We are fortunate indeed,' said Agnes. "'Let us thank heaven. We may lose our property, but at least our lives are safe.' But Don Abondio could not see so much reason for congratulation. The great concourse of people suggested new causes of alarm. Oh, murmured he to the females when no one was near enough to hear him. Oh, do you not perceive that by assembling here in such crowds we shall attract the notice of the soldiery? As every one flies and no one remains at home, they will believe that our treasures are up here, and this belief will lead them hither. Oh, poor me! 
Why was I so thoughtless as to venture here? What should they come here for? said Perpetua. They are obliged to pursue their route, and at all events where there is danger, it is best to have plenty of company. Company? Company? Silly woman, don't you know that every lansconet could devour a hundred of them? And then, if any of them should commit some foolish violence, it would be a fine thing to find ourselves in the midst of a battle. It would have been better to have gone to the mountains. I don't see why they have all been seized with a mania to go to one place. Curse the people, all here one after the other, like a frightened flock of sheep. As to that, said Agnes, they may say the same of us. Hush, hush, it is of no use to talk, said Dona Bondio. That which is done is done. We are here, and here we must remain. May heaven protect us. But his anxiety was much increased by the appearance of a number of armed men at the entrance of the valley. It is impossible to describe his vexation and alarm. Oh, poor me, thought he. I might have expected this from a man of his character. What does he mean to do? Will he declare war? Will he act the part of a sovereign? Oh, poor me, poor me. In this terrible conjuncture, he ought to have concealed himself as much as possible, and behold, he seeks every method to make himself known. It is easy to be seen he wants to provoke them. Do you not see, sir, said Perpetua, that these are brave men who are able to defend us. Let the soldiers come. These men are not at all like our poor devils of peasants, who are good for nothing but to use their legs. Be quiet replied Dona Bondio in a low but angry tone. Be quiet. You know not what you say. Pray heaven that the army may be in haste to proceed on its march, so that they may not gain information of this place being disposed like a garrison. They would ask for nothing better. An assault is mere play to them, and putting everyone to the sword like going to a wedding. Oh, poor me! Perhaps I can secure a place of safety on one of these precipices. I will never be taken in battle. I will never be taken in battle. I never will. If you are even afraid of being defended, returned Perpetua, but Dona Bondio sharply interrupted her. Be quiet, and take care not to relate this conversation. Remember, you must always keep a pleasant countenance here, and appear to approve all that you see. At Malanote they found another company of armed men. Dona Bondio took off his hat and bowed profoundly, saying to himself, Alas, alas, I am really in a camp. They here quitted the carriage to ascend the pass on foot, the curate having in haste paid and dismissed the driver. The recollection of his former terrors in this very place increased his present forebodings of evil by mingling themselves with his reflections and enfeebling more and more his understanding. Agnes, who had never before trod this path, but who had often pictured it to her imagination, was filled with different but keenly painful remembrances. "'Oh, Signor Curate,' cried she, "'when I think how my poor Lucy passed this very road—' "'Will you be quiet, foolish woman?' cried Dona Bondio in her ear. "'Are these things to speak of in this place? Are you ignorant that we are on his lands? It is fortunate no one heard you.' if you speak in this manner oh said agnes now that he is a saint be quiet repeated dona bondio think you we can tell the saints all that passes through our brains think rather of thanking him for the kindness he has done you oh as to that i have already thought of it do you think i have no manners no politeness Politeness, my good woman, does not consist in telling people things they don't like to hear. Have a little discretion, I pray you. Weigh well your words. Speak but little, and that only when it is indispensable. There is no danger in silence. You do much worse with all your— Began Perpetua. Hush, said Dona Bondio, and, taking off his hat, he bowed profoundly. The unknown was coming to meet them having recognized the curate approaching. I could.
could have wished, said he, to offer you my house on a more agreeable occasion, but under any circumstances, I esteem myself happy in serving you. Confiding in the great kindness of your illustrious lordship, I have taken the liberty to trouble you at this unhappy time, and, as your illustrious lordship sees, I have also taken the liberty to bring company with me. This is my housekeeper. She is very welcome. And this is a female to whom your lordship has already rendered great benefits. The mother of... of... Of Lucy, said Agnes. Of Lucy, cried the unknown, turning to Agnes. Renders benefits? I... Just God, it is you who render benefits to me by coming hither to me, to this dwelling. You are very welcome. You bring with you the blessing of heaven. Oh, I come rather to give you trouble. Approaching him nearer, she said in a low voice, I have to thank you. The unknown interrupted her, asking with much interest concerning Lucy. He then conducted his new guest to the castle. Agnes looked at the curate as if to say, See if there's any need of your interfering between us with your advice. Has the army arrived in your parish? Said the unknown to Donabondio. No, my lord. I would not wait for the demons. Heaven knows if I should have escaped alive from their hands and been able to trouble your illustrious lordship. You may be quite at ease. You are now in safety. They will not come here. If the whim should seize them, we are ready to receive them. Let us hope they will not come, said Donabondio. And on that side, added he, pointing to the opposite mountains, on that side also wanders another body of troops. But, but... It is true. But, doubt not... We are ready for them also. Between two fires. But, Donabondio. Precisely between two fires. Where have I suffered myself to be led, and by two women? And this lord appears to delight in such business. Oh, what people there are in the world. When they entered the castle, the unknown ordered Agnes and Perpetua to be conducted to a room in the quarter assigned to the women which was three of the four wings of the second court, in the most retired part of the edifice. The men were accommodated in the wings of the other court, to the right and left. The body of the building was filled, partly with provisions, and partly with the effects that the refugees brought with them, and the quarter devoted to the men was a small apartment destined to the ecclesiastics who might arrive. The unknown accompanied Donabondio thither, who was the first to take possession of it. Our fugitives remained three or four and twenty days in the castle, in the midst of continual bustle and alarm. Not a day passed without some reports. At each account, the unknown, unarmed as he was, led his band beyond the precincts of the valley to ascertain the extent of the peril. It was a singular thing indeed to behold him, without any personal defense, conducting a body of armed men. Not to encroach too far on the benevolence of the unknown, Agnes and Perpetua employed themselves in performing services in the household. These occupations, with occasional conversations with acquaintances they had formed at the castle, enabled them to pass away the time with less weariness. Poor Donabondio, who had nothing to do, was notwithstanding prevented from becoming listless and inactive by his fears. As to the dread of an attack, it was in some measure dissipated, but still the idea of the surrounding country occupied on every side by soldiers, and of the numerous consequences which might at any moment result from such a state, kept him in perpetual alarm. All the time he remained in this asylum, he never thought of going beyond the defenses. His only walk was on the esplanade. He surveyed every side of the castle, observing attentively the hollows and precipices to ascertain if there were any practicable passage by which he might seek escape in case of imminent danger. Every day there were various reports of the march of the soldiers. Some newsmongers by profession gathered greedily all these reports and spread them among their companions. On such a day, such a regiment arrived in such a territory. The next day they would ravage such another, where in the meantime another detachment had been plundering before them. An account was kept of the regiments that passed the bridge of Leco, as they were then considered fairly out of the country. The cavalry of Wallenstein passed, then the infantry of Marados, then the cavalry of Ansalt. 
then the infantry of Brandenburg, and finally that of Galasso. The flying squadron of Venetians also removed, and the country was again free from invaders. Already the inhabitants of the different villages had begun to quit the castle. Some departed every day, as after an autumn storm the birds of heaven leave the leafy branches of a great tree, under whose shelter they had sought and obtained protection. Our three friends were the last to depart, as Donabondio feared, if he returned so soon to his house, to find there some loitering soldiers. Perpetua in vain repeated that the longer they delayed, the greater the opportunity they afforded to the thieves of the country to take possession of all that might have been left by the spoilers. On the day fixed for their departure, the unknown had a carriage ready at Malanote, and taking Agnes aside, he made her accept a bag of crowns to repair the damage she would find at home, although she protested she was in no need of them, having still some of those he had formerly sent her. When? You see your good Lucy, said he. I am certain that she prays for me, as I have done her much evil. Tell her that I thank her, and that I trust in God, that her prayer will return in blessings on herself. They finally departed. They stopped for a few moments at the house of the tailor, where they heard sad relations of this terrible march. The usual story of violence and plunder. The tailor's family, however, had remained unmolested, as the army did not pass that way. "'Ah, oh, Senor Curate,' said the tailor, as he was bidding him farewell, "'here is a fine subject to appear in print.' After having proceeded a short distance, our travellers beheld melancholy faces of the destruction they had heard related. Vineyards despoiled, not by the vintager, but as if by a tempest. Vines trampled underfoot, trees wounded and lopped off their branches, hedges destroyed. In the villages, doors broken open, window frames dashed in, and streets filled with different articles of furniture and clothing, broken and torn to pieces. In the midst of lamentations and tears, the peasants were occupied in repairing as well as they could the damage done, while others, overcome by their miseries, remained in a state of silent despair. Having passed through these scenes of complicated woe, they at last succeeded in reaching their own dwellings, where they witnessed the same destruction. Agnes immediately occupied herself in reducing to order the little furniture that was left her, and in repairing the damage done to her doors and windows. But she did not forget to count over in secret her crowns, thanking God in her heart and her generous benefactor, that in the general overthrow of order and safety she at least had fallen on her feet. Donabondio and Perpetua entered their house without being obliged to have recourse to keys. In addition to the miserable destruction of all their furniture, whose various fragments impeded their entrance, the most horrible odors for a time drove them back. And when these obstacles were at last surmounted and the rooms were entered, they found indignity added to mischief. Frightful and grotesque figures of priests, with their square caps and bands, were drawn with pieces of coal upon the walls in all sorts of ridiculous attitudes. "'Ah, the hogs!' cried Perpetua. "'Ah, the thieves!' exclaimed Donabondio. Hastening into the garden, they approached the fig tree and beheld the earth newly turned up, and, to their utter dismay, the tomb was opened and the dead was gone." Donabondio scolded Perpetua for her bad management, who was not slack in repelling his complaints. Both pointing backwards to the unlucky hiding place, at length returned to the house, and set about endeavouring to purify it of some of its accumulated filth, as at such a time it was impossible to procure assistance for the purpose. With money lent them by Agnes, they were in some measure enabled to replace their articles of furniture. For some time this disaster was the source of continual disputes between Perpetua and her master the former having discovered that some of the property, which they supposed to have been taken by the soldiers, was actually in possession of certain people of the village. She tormented him incessantly to claim it. There could not have been touched a cord more hateful to Donabondio, since the property was in the hands of that class of persons with whom he had it most at heart to live in peace. "'But I don't wish to know these things,' said he. "'How many times must I tell you that what has happened has—' Must I get myself into trouble again because my house has been robbed? You would suffer your eyes to be pulled from your head, I verily believe, said Perpetua. Others hate to be robbed, but you, you seem to like it. This is pretty language to hold, indeed. Will you be quiet? Perpetua kept silence, but continually found new pretexts for resuming the conversation, so that the poor man was obliged to suppress every complaint at the loss of such or such a thing, as she would say— Go and find it at such a person's house who has it, and who would not have kept it until now if he had not known what kind of a man he had to deal with. But here we will leave poor Donabondio, having more important things to speak of than his fears, or the misery of a few villagers, from a transient disaster like this. End of chapter 30 
Chapter 31 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 31 The pestilence, as the Tribunal of Health had feared, did enter the Milanese with the German troops. It is also known that it was not limited to that territory, but that it spread over and desolated a great part of Italy. Our store requires us, at present, to relate the principal circumstances of this great calamity, as far as it affected the Milanese, and principally the city of Milan itself, for the chroniclers of the period confine their relations chiefly to this place. At the same time we cannot avoid giving a general, though brief, sketch of an event in the history of our country, more talked of than understood. Many partial narratives written at the time are still extant, but these convey but an imperfect view of the subject, historically speaking. It is true they serve to illustrate and confirm one another and furnish materials for a history, but the history is still wanting. Strange to say, no writer has hitherto attempted to reduce them to order, and exhibit all the various events, public and private acts, causes and conjectures, relative to this calamity, in a concatenated series. Ripamonti's narrative, though far more ample than any other, is still very defective. We shall, therefore, attempt in the following pages to present the reader with a succinct but accurate and continuous statement of this fatal scourge. In all the line of country which had been overrun by the army, dead bodies had been found in the houses as well as on the roads. Soon after, throughout the whole country, entire families were attacked with violent disorders, accompanied with unusual symptoms, which the aged only remembered to have seen at the time of the plague, which, fifty-three years before, had desolated a great part of Italy, and principally the Milanese, where it was, and still is, known by the name of the Plague of San Carlo. It derives this appellation from the noble, beneficent, and disinterested conduct of that great man, who at length became its victim. Ludovico Setala, a physician distinguished so long ago as during the former plague, announced to the Tribunal of Health, by the 20th of October, that the contagion had indisputably appeared at Lecco, but no measures were taken upon this report. Further notices of a like import induced them to dispatch a commissioner with a physician of Como, who, most unaccountably, upon the report of an old barber of Bellano, announced that the prevailing disease arose merely from the autumnal exhalation from the marshes, aggravated by the sufferings caused by the passage of the German troops. Meanwhile, for their intelligence of the new disease and the number of deaths arriving from all parts, two commissioners were sent to examine the places where it had appeared, and, if necessary, to use precautions to prevent its increase. The scourge had already spread to such an extent as to leave no doubt of its character. The commissioners passed through the territories of Lecco, the borders of the Lake of Como, the districts of Monte Brianza and Geradada, and found the villages everywhere in a state of barricade, or deserted, and the inhabitants flying or encamped in the middle of fields, or dispersed abroad throughout the country. Like so many wild creatures, says Dr. Tadino, one of the envoys, they were carrying about them some imaginary safeguard against the dreaded disease, such as sprigs of mint, rue, or rosemary, and even vinegar. Informing themselves of the number of deaths, the commissioners became alarmed, and visiting the sick and dead, recognized the terrible and infallible evidences of the plague. Upon this information, orders were given to close the gates of Milan. The Tribunal of Health, on the 14th of November, directed the commissioners to wait on the governor, in order to represent to him the situation of affairs. He replied that he was very sorry for it, but that the cares of war were much more pressing. This was the second time he had made the same answer under similar circumstances. Two or three days after, he published a decree prescribing public rejoicings on the birth of Prince Charles, the first son of Philip IV, without troubling himself with the danger which would result from so great a concourse of people at such a time just as if things were going on in their ordinary course, and no dreadful evil was hanging over them. This man was the celebrated Ambrose Spinola, who died a few months after, and during this very war which he had so much at heart, not in the field, but in his bed, and through grief and vexation at the treatment he experienced from those whose interests he had served. History has loudly extolled his merits. She has been silent upon his base inhumanity in risking the dissemination of that worst of mortal calamities, plague, over a country committed to his trust. But that which diminishes our astonishment at his indifference is the indifference of the people themselves, of that part of the population which the contagion had not yet reached, but who had so many motives to dread it, the scarcity of the preceding year, the exactions of the army, and the anxiety of mind which had been endured, appeared to them more than sufficient to explain the mortality of the surrounding country. They heard with a smile of incredulity and contempt any who hazarded a word on the danger, or who even mentioned the plague. The same incredulity, the same blindness, the same obstinacy prevailed in the Senate, the Council of Ten, and in all the judicial bodies. 
Cardinal Frederick alone enjoined his curates to impress upon the people the importance of declaring every case and of sequestering all infected or suspected goods. The Tribunal of Health, prompted by the two physicians who fully apprehended the danger, did take some tardy measures, but in vain. A proclamation to prevent the entrance of strangers into the city was not published until the 29th of November. This was too late. The plague was already in Milan. It must be difficult, however interesting, to discover the first cause of a calamity which swept off so many thousands of the inhabitants of the city, but both Tadino and Ripamonti agree that it was brought thither by an Italian soldier in the service of Spain, who had either bought or stolen a quantity of clothes from the German soldiers. He was on a visit to his parents in Milan when he fell sick, and, being carried to the hospital, died on the fourth day. The Tribunal of Health condemned the house he had lived in. His clothes and the bed he had occupied in the hospital were consigned to the flames. Two servants and a good friar, who had attended him, fell sick a few days after, but the suspicions from the first entertained of the nature of the malady and the precautions used prevented its extension for the present. But in the house from which the soldier had been taken there were several attacked by the disease, upon which all the inhabitants of it were conducted to the lazaretto by order of the tribunal of health. The contagion made but little progress during the rest of the year and the beginning of the following. From time to time there were a few persons attacked, but the rarity of the occurrence diminished the suspicion of the plague and confirmed the multitude in their disbelief of its existence. Added to this, most of the physicians joyed with the people in laughing at the unhappy presages and threatening opinions of the smaller number of their brethren. The cases that did occur they pretended to explain upon other grounds, and the account of these cases was seldom presented to the Tribunal of Health. Fear of the Lazaretto kept all on the alert. The sick were concealed, and false certificates were obtained from some subaltern offices of health who were deputed to inspect the dead bodies. Those physicians who, convinced of the reality of the contagion, proposed precautions against it, were the objects of general animadversion. But the principal objects of the execration were Tadino and the Senator Setala, who were stigmatized as enemies of their country, men whose best exertions had been directed towards mitigating the severity of the coming mischief. Even the illustrious Setala, the aged father of the Senator, whose talents were equaled by his benevolence, was obliged to take refuge in a friend's house from the popular fury, because he had constantly urged the necessity of precautionary measures. Towards the end of the month of March, at first in the suburb of the Eastern Gate, then in the rest of the city, deaths, attended by singular symptoms such as spasms, delirium, livid spots, and buboes, began to be more frequent. Sudden deaths, too, were frequent without any previous illness. The physicians still perversely held out, but the magistracy were aroused. The Tribunal of Health called on them to enforce their directions, to raise the requisite funds for the growing expenses of the lazaretto, as well as the helpless poor. The malady advanced rapidly, in the lazaretto all was confusion, bad arrangement, and anarchy. In their difficulty on this point the tribunal had recourse to the Capuchins, and conjured the Father Provincial to give them a man capable of governing this region of desolation. He offered them Father Felice Casati, who enjoyed a high reputation for charity, activity, and kindness of disposition, added to great strength of mind, and, as a companion to him, Father Michele Pozzobonelli, who, although young, was of a grave and thoughtful character. They were joyfully accepted, and on the 30th of March they entered on their duties. The crowd in the Lazaretto increased. Other Capuchins joined them, willingly performing every office both of spiritual and of temporal kindness, even the most menial. The Father Felice, indefatigable in his labors, watched with unceasing and parental care over the multitude. He caught the plague, was cured, and resumed his duties, even with greater alacrity. Most of his brethren joyfully sacrificed their lives in this cause of afflicted humanity. Not being able longer to deny the terrible effects of the malady, which had now reached the family of the physician Setala, and was spreading its ravages in many noble families, those medical men who had been incredulous were still unwilling to acknowledge its true cause, which would have been a tacit condemnation of themselves. They therefore imagined one entirely conformable to the prejudices of the time. It was at that time a prevailing opinion in all Europe that enchanters existed, diabolical operators, who at this time conspired to spread the plague by the aid of venomous poisons and witchcraft. Similar things had been affirmed and believed in other epidemics, particularly at Milan, in that of the preceding century. Moreover, towards the end of the preceding year, a dispatch had arrived from King Philip IV, giving information that four Frenchmen, suspected of spreading poisons and pestilential substances, had escaped from Madrid, and ordering that watch should be kept to ascertain if by chance they had arrived at Milan. The governor communicated the dispatch to the Senate and the Tribunal of Health. It then excited no attention, but when the plague broke out and was acknowledged by all, this intelligence was remembered, and it served to confirm the vague suspicion of criminal agency. 
Two incidents converted this vague suspicion into conviction of a positive and real conspiracy. Some persons who imagined they saw, on the evening of the 17th of May, individuals rubbing a partition of the cathedral, carried the partition out of the church in the night, together with a great quantity of benches. The president of the senate, with four persons of his tribunal, visited the partition, the benches, and the basins of holy water, and found nothing which confirmed the ridiculous suspicion of poison. However, to satisfy the disturbed imaginations of the populace, it was decided that the partition should be washed and purified. But the incident became a text for conjecture to the people. It was affirmed that the poisoners had rubbed all the benches and walls of the cathedral, and even the bell ropes. The next morning a new and more strange and significant spectacle struck the wondering eyes of the citizens. In all parts of the city the doors of the houses and walls were plastered with long streaks of whitish-yellow dirt, which appeared to have been rubbed on with a sponge. Whether it was a wicked pleasantry to excite more general and thrilling alarm, or that it had been done from the guilty design of increasing the public disorder, whatever the motive, the fact is so well attested that it cannot be attributed to imagination. The city, already alarmed, was thrown into the utmost confusion. The owners of houses purified all infected places. Strangers were stopped in the streets on suspicion and conducted to prison, where they underwent long interrogatories which naturally ended in proving none of these absurd and imaginary practices against them. The Tribunal of Health published a decree, offering a reward to whomsoever should discover the author or authors of this attempt. But they did this, as they wrote to the governor, only to satisfy the people and calm their fears, a weak and dangerous expedient, and calculated to confirm the popular belief. In the meantime, many attributed this story of the poisoned ointment to the revenge of Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordova, others to Cardinal Richelieu, in order the more easily to get possession of Milan. Others again affixed the crime to various Milanese gentlemen. There were still many who were not persuaded that it was the plague, because if it were, every one infected would die of it, whereas a few recovered. To dissipate every doubt, the Tribunal of Health made use of an expedient conformable to the necessity of the occasion. They made an address to the eyes, such as the spirit of the times suggested. On one of the days of the Feast of Pentecost, the inhabitants of the city were accustomed to go to the burying ground of San Gregorio, beyond the eastern gate, in order to pray for the dead in the last plague. Turning the season of devotion into one of amusement, everyone was attired in his best. On that day a whole family, among others, had died of the plague. At the hour in which the concourse was most numerous, the dead bodies of this family were, by order of the Tribunal of Health, drawn naked on a carriage towards this same burying ground, so that the crowd might behold for themselves the manifest traces, the hideous impress of the disease. A cry of alarm and horror arose wherever the car passed. Their incredulity was at least shaken. But it is probable that the great concourse tended to spread the infection. Still, it was not absolutely the plague. The use of the word was prohibited. It was a pestilential fever. The adjective was preferred to the substantive. Then, not the true plague, that is to say, the plague, but only in a certain sense, and further, combined with poison and witchcraft. Such is the absurd trifling with which men seek to blind themselves, willfully abstaining from a sound exercise of judgment to arrive at the truth. Meanwhile, as it became from day to day more difficult to raise funds to meet the painful exigencies of circumstances, the Council of Ten resolved to have recourse to government. They represented, by two deputies, the state of misery and distress of the city, the enormity of the expense, the revenues anticipated, and the taxes withheld in consequence of the general poverty which had been produced by so many causes, and especially by the pillaging of the soldiery. That according to various laws, and a special degree of Charles the Fourth, the expense of the plague ought by right to devolve upon government. Finally, they proceeded to make four demands, that the taxes should be suspended, that the chamber should advance funds, that the governor should make known to the king the calamitous state of the city and province, and that the duchy, already exhausted, should be excused from providing quarters for the soldiery. Spinola replied with new regrets and exhortations, declaring himself grieved not to be able to visit Milan in person, in order to employ himself for the preservation of the city, but hoping that the zeal of the magistrates would supply his place. In short, he made evasive answers to all their requests. Afterwards, when the plague was at its height, he transferred, by letters patent, his authority to the High Chancellor Ferrer, being, as he said, obliged to devote himself entirely to the cares of the war. The Council of Ten then requested the Cardinal to order a solemn procession for the purpose of carrying through the streets the body of San Carlos. The good prelate refused. This confidence in a doubtful means disturbed him, and he feared that, if the effect should not be obtained, confidence would be converted into infidelity and rebellion against God. He also feared that if there really were poisoners, this procession would be a favorable occasion for their machinations, and if there were not, so great a collection would have a tendency to spread the contagion. The doors of public edifices and private houses had been again anointed as at first. The news flew from mouth to mouth. The people, influenced by present suffering, 
and by the imminence of the supposed danger, readily embraced the belief. The idea of a subtle, instantaneous poison seemed sufficient to explain the violence, and the almost incomprehensible circumstances of the disease. Add to this the idea of enchantment, and any effect was possible. Every objection was rendered feeble, every difficulty was explained. If the effects did not immediately succeed the first attempt, the cause was easy to assign. It had been done by those to whom the art was new, and now that it was brought to perfection, the perpetrators were more confirmed in their infernal resolution. If any one had dared to suggest its having been done in jest, or denied the existence of a dark plot, he would have passed for an obstinate fool, if he did not incur the suspicion of being himself engaged in it. With such persuasions on their minds, all were on the alert to discover the guilty. The most indifferent action excited suspicion. Suspicion was changed to certainty, and certainty to rage. As illustrations of this, Ripamonti cites two examples which fell under his own observation, and such were of daily occurrence. In the church of Sant'Antonio, on a day of some great solemnity, an old man, after having prayed for some time on his knees, rose to seat himself, and before doing so, wiped the dust from the bench with his handkerchief. The old man is poisoning the bench! cried some women who beheld the action. The crowd in the church threw themselves upon him, tore his white hair, and after beating him, drew him out half dead to carry him to prison and to torture. I saw the unfortunate man, says Ripamonti. I never knew the end of his painful story, but at the time I thought he had but a few moments to live. The other event occurred the next day. It was as remarkable, but not as fatal. Three young Frenchmen, having come to visit Italy and study its antiquities, had approached the cathedral and were contemplating it very attentively. Some persons who were passing by stopped. A circle was formed around them, and they were not lost sight of for a moment, having been recognized as strangers and especially Frenchmen. As if to assure themselves that the wall was marble, the young artists extended their hands to touch it. This was enough. In a moment they were surrounded, and, with imprecations and blows, dragged to prison. Happily, however, they were proved to be innocent and released. These things were not confined to the city. The frenzy was propagated equally with the contagion. The traveller encountered off the high road, the stranger whose habits or appearance were in any respect singular, were judged to be poisoners. At the first intelligence of a newcomer, at the cry even of a child, the alarm bell was rung, and the unfortunate persons were assailed with showers of stones, or seized and conducted to prison. And thus the prison itself was, during a certain period, a place of safety. Meanwhile the Council of Ten, not silenced by the refusal of the wise prelate, again urged their request for the procession, which the people seconded by their clamors. The cardinal again resisted, but finding resistance useless, he finally yielded. He did more. He consented that the case which enclosed the relics of San Carlos should be exposed for eight days on the high altar of the cathedral. The Tribunal of Health and the other authorities did not oppose this proceeding. They only ordained some precautions which, without obviating the danger, indicated too plainly their apprehensions. They issued severe orders to prevent people from abroad entering the city and, to ensure their execution, commanded the gates to be closed. They also nailed up the condemned houses. The number of which, says a contemporary writer, amounted to about five hundred. Three days were employed in preparation. On the 11th of June the procession left the cathedral at daybreak, a long file of people, composed for the most part of women, their faces covered with silk masks, and many of them with bare feet and clothed in sackcloth, appeared first. The tradesmen came next, preceded by their banners, the societies and habits of various forms and colors, then the brotherhoods, then the secular clergy, each with the insignia of his rank, and holding a lighted taper in his hand. In the midst, among the brilliant light of the torches and the resounding echo of the canticles, the case advanced covered with a rich canopy, and carried alternately by four cannons, sumptuously attired. Through the crystal were seen the mortal remains of the saint, clothed in his pontifical robes, and his head covered with a mitre. In his mutilated features might still be distinguished some traces of his former countenance, such as his portraits represent him, and such as some of the spectators remembered to have beheld and honored. Behind the remains of the holy prelate, and resembling him in merit, birth, and dignity, as well as in person, came the Archbishop Frederick, the rest of the clergy followed him, and with them the magistrates in their robes, then the nobility, some magnificently clothed, as if to do honor to the pomp of the celebration, and others as penitents, in sackcloth and barefooted, each bearing a torch in his hand. A vast collection of people terminated the procession. The streets were ornamented as on festival days. The rich sent out their most precious furniture. And thus the fronts of the poorest houses were decorated by their more wealthy neighbors, or at the expense of the public. Here, in the place of hangings, and there, over the hangings themselves, were suspended branches of trees, 
On all sides hung pictures, inscriptions, devices. On the balconies were displayed vases, rich antiquities, and valuable curiosities, with burning flambeau at various stations. From many of the windows the sequestrated sick looked out upon the procession, and mingled their prayers with those of the people as they passed. The procession returned to the cathedral about the middle of the day. But the next day, whilst presumptuous and fanatical assurance had taken possession of every mind, the number of deaths augmented in all parts of the city, in a progression so frightful and in a manner so sudden that none could avoid confessing the cause to have been the procession itself. However, astonishing and deplorable power of prejudice, this effect was not attributed to the assemblage of so many people and to the increase of fortuitous contact, but to the facility afforded to the poisoners to execute their infernal purposes. But as this opinion could not account for so vast a mortality, and as no traces of strange substances had been discovered on the road of the procession, recourse was had to another invention, admitted by general opinion in Europe, magical and poisoned powders. It was asserted that these powders, scattered profusely in the road, attached themselves to the skirts of the gowns, and to the feet of those who had been on that day barefooted. Thus the human mind delights itself with contending against phantoms of its own creating. The violence of the contagion increased daily, in short, there was hardly a house that was not infected. The number of souls in the lazaretto amounted to twelve thousand, and sometimes to sixteen thousand. The daily mortality, which had hitherto exceeded five hundred, soon increased to twelve hundred and fifteen hundred. We may imagine the agony of the Council of Ten, on whom rested the weighty burden of providing for public necessities, and of repairing that which was reparable in such a disaster. They had to replace every day, and every day to add to the number of individuals charged with public services of all kinds. Of these individuals there were three remarkable classes. The first was of the Monati. This appellation, of doubtful origin, was applied to those men who were devoted to the most painful and dangerous employment in times of contagion, the taking of the dead bodies from the houses, from the streets, and from the lazaretto, carrying them to their graves and burying them, also bringing the sick to the lazaretto and burning and purifying suspected or infected objects. The second class was that of the apparitori, whose special function was to precede the funeral cars, ringing a bell to warn passengers to retire. And the third was that of the commissaries, who presided over both the other classes under the immediate orders of the Tribunal of Health. It was necessary to keep the lazaretto furnished with medicine, surgeons, food, and all the requisites of an infirmary. It was also necessary to find and prepare new habitations for new cases. Cabins of wood and straw were hastily constructed in the interior enclosure of the lazaretto, then a second lazaretto, a little beyond, was erected, capable of containing four thousand persons. Two others were ordered, but means, men, and courage failed, and they were never completed. Despair and weakness had attained such a point that the most urgent and painful wants were unprovided for. Each day, for example, children whose mothers had perished of the plague died from neglect. The Tribunal of Health proposed to found a hospital for these innocent creatures, but could obtain no assistance for the purpose. All supplies were for the army. Because said the governor. It is a time of war, and we must treat the soldiers well. Meanwhile, the immense ditch which had been dug near the lazaretto was filled with dead bodies. A number still remained without sepulture, as hands were wanting for the work. Without extraordinary aid, this calamity must have remained unremedied. The president of the senate addressed himself in tears to the two intrepid friars who governed the lazaretto, and the father Michele pledged himself to relieve in four days the city of the unburied dead, and to dig, in the course of a week, another ditch sufficient not only for present wants, but even for those which might be anticipated in future. Followed by another friar, and public officers chosen by the president, he went into the country to procure peasants, and partly by the authority of the tribunal, partly by that of his habit, he gathered two hundred, whom he employed to dig the earth. He then dispatched Monati from the lazaretto to collect the dead. At the appointed time his promise was fulfilled. At one time the lazaretto was left without physicians, and it was only after much trouble and time and great offers of money and honors that others could be prevailed on to supply their place. Provisions were often so scarce as to create apprehensions of starvation, but more than once these necessities were unexpectedly supplied by the charity of individuals. In the midst of the general stupor, or the indifference to the miseries of others, occasioned by personal apprehension, some were found whose hands and hearts had ever been open to the wretched and others with whom the virtue of benevolence had commenced with the loss of all their terrestrial happiness. So also, amidst the destruction of the flight of so many men charged with watching over and providing for the public safety, others were seen who, well in body and firm in mind, ever remained faithful at their post, and some even who, by an admirable self-devotion, sustained with heroic constancy cares to which their duty did not call them. 
the most entire self-devotion was especially conspicuous among the clergy. At the lazaretos and the city, their assistance was always at hand. They were found wherever there was suffering, always in attendance on the sick and the dying, very often languishing and dying themselves. With spiritual, they bestowed, as far as they could, temporal succor. More than sixty clergymen in the city alone died from the contagion, which was nearly eight out of nine. Frederick, as might be expected, was an example to all. After having seen all his household perish around him, he was solicited by his family, by the first magistrates, and by the neighboring princes, to fly the peril, but he rejected their advice and their solicitations with the same firmness which induced him to write to the clergy of his diocese. Be disposed to abandon life rather than these sufferers who are your children and your family. Go with the same joy into the midst of the pestilence as to a certain reward, since you may by these means win many souls to Christ. He neglected no precaution compatible with his duty. He even gave instructions to his clergy on this point, but he betrayed no anxiety, nor did he even appear to perceive danger where it was necessary to incur it in order to do good. He was always with the ecclesiastics to praise and direct the zealous and to excite the lukewarm. He visited the lazaretos to console the sick and encourage those who assisted them. He traveled over the city, carrying aid to the miserable who were sequestered in their houses, stopping at their doors and under their windows to listen to their complaints and to give them words of consolation and encouragement. Having thus thrown himself into the midst of the contagion, it was truly wonderful that he was never attacked by it. In seasons of public calamity, when confusion takes the place of order, we often behold a display of the sublimest virtue, but more frequently, alas, an increase of vice and crime. Instances of the latter were not wanting during the present unhappy period. The profligate, spared by the plague, found in the common confusion, and in the slackening of the restraints of law, new occasions for mischief, and new assurances of impunity. And further, power itself had passed into the hands of the boldest among them. There were scarcely found for the functions of monati and apparatori any, but those over whom the attraction of rapine and license had more sway than dread of the contagion. Strict rules had been prescribed to them, and severe penalties threatened for infringing them, which had some power for a while, but the number of deaths, and the increasing desolation, and the universal alarm, soon relieved them from all superintendence, and they constituted themselves, the Monati in particular, the arbiters of everything. They entered houses as masters and enemies, and not to mention their robberies, and the cruel treatment which those unhappy persons experienced, whom the plague condemned to their authority. They applied their infected and criminal hands to those in health, threatening to carry them to the lazaretto, unless they purchased their exemption with money. At other times they refused to carry off the dead bodies already in a state of putrefaction, without a high price being paid them. It is even said that they designedly let fall from their carts infected clothing, in order to propagate the infection from which their wealth was derived. Many ruffians, too, assuming the garb of these wretches, carried on extensive robberies in the houses of the sick, dying, and helpless. In the same proportion as vice increased, folly increased. The foolish idea was again revived of poisonings. The dread of this fantastic danger beset and tormented the minds of men more than the real and present danger. While, says Ripamonti, the heaps of dead bodies lying before the eyes of the living made the city a vast tomb, there was something more afflicting and hideous still. Reciprocal distrust and extravagant suspicion, and this not only between friends, neighbors, and guests, but husbands, wives, and children, became objects of terror to one another, and horrible to tell, even the domestic board and the nuptial bed were dreaded as snares, as places where poison might be concealed. Besides ambition and cupidity, the motives commonly attributed to the poisoners, it was imagined that this action included an indefinable, diabolical voluptuousness of enjoyment, an attractiveness stronger than the will. The ravings of the sick, who accused themselves of that which they had dreaded in others, were considered as so many involuntary revelations, which rendered belief irresistible. Among the stories recorded of this delirium, there is one which deserves to be related, on account of the extensive credence it obtained. It was said that on a certain day, a citizen had seen an equipage with six horses stop in the square of the cathedral. Within it was a person of noble and majestic figure, dark complexion, eyes inflamed, and lips compressed and threatening. The spectator, being invited to enter the carriage, complied. After a short circuit, it made a halt before the gate of a magnificent palace. Entering it, he beheld mingled scenes of delight and horror, frightful deserts and smiling gardens, dark caverns and magnificent saloons. 
Phantoms were seated in council. They showed him large boxes of money, telling him he might take as many of them as he chose, provided he would accept at the same time a little vase of poison and consent to employ it against the citizens. He refused, and in a moment found himself at the place from which he had been taken. This story, generally believed by the people, spread all over Italy. An engraving of it was made in Germany. The Archbishop of Mayence wrote to Cardinal Frederick, asking him what credence might be attached to the prodigies related of Milan. He received for answer that they were all idle dreams. The dreams of the learned, if they were not of the same nature as those of the vulgar, did not exceed them in value. The greater part beheld the forerunner and the cause of these calamities in a comet which appeared in 1628, and in the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. Another comet that appeared in June in the same year announced the poisonous anointings. All writings were ransacked that contained any passages respecting poisons. Amongst the ancients, Livy was cited, Tacitus, Dionysius, even Homer and Ovid were searched. Among the moderns, Cesalpino, Cardan, Gravino, Salio, Pereo Schenchio, Zacchia, and lastly the fatal Del Rio, whose disquisitions on magic became the textbook on such subjects, the future rule, and, in fact, the powerful impulse to horrible and frequent legal murders. The physicians yielded to the popular belief and attributed to poison and diabolical conjurations the ordinary symptoms of the malady. Even Tadino himself, one of the most celebrated physicians of his day, who had witnessed the entrance of the disorder, anticipated its ravages, studied its symptoms, and admitted it to be the plague. Even he, such as the strange perversity of human reason, drew from all these facts an argument and proof of the dissemination of some subtle poison, by means of ointments. Nor was the enlightened Cardinal Frederick himself altogether uninfected by the general mania. In a small tract of his on the subject of the Ambrosian Library, he says, Of the mode of compounding and dispensing these ointments, various statements have been made, some of which we hold for true, while others appear imaginary. On the other hand, Muratori tells us that he had met with well-informed persons in Milan, whose ancestors were decidedly convinced of the absurdity of this widely spread and extraordinary error, but whose safety rendered it imperative on them to keep their sentiments on the subject to themselves. The magistrates employed the little vigilance and resolution which remained to them in searching out the poisoners, and unhappily thought they had detected them. A recital of these and similar cases would form a remarkable feature in the history of jurisprudence. But it is high time we should resume the thread of our story. End of chapter 31. Chapter 32 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 32. One night, towards the end of the month of August, in the very height of the pestilence, Don Roderick returned to his house at Milan, accompanied by his faithful Grizzo, one of the small number of his servants who still survived. He had just left a company of friends, who were accustomed to assemble together, to banish by debauchery the melancholy of the times. At each meeting there were new guests added, and old ones missing. On that day Don Roderick had been one of the gayest, and, among other subjects of merriment which he introduced, he had made the company laugh at a mock funeral sermon on Count Attilio, who had been carried off by the pestilence a few days before. After leaving the house where he had held his carousal, he was conscious of an uneasiness, a faintness, a weariness of his limbs, a difficulty of breathing, and an internal heat, which he was ready to attribute to the wine, the late hour, and the influence of the season. He spoke not a word during the whole rout. Arriving at his house, he ordered Grizo to light him to his chamber. Grizo, perceiving the change in his master's countenance, kept at a distance, as in these dangerous times, every one was obliged to keep for himself, as was said, a medical eye. I feel very well. Do you see? said Don Roderick, reading in the features of Grizo the thoughts which were passing through his mind. I feel very well, but I have drank a little too much. The wine was so fine. With a good sleep, all will be well again. I am overcome by sleep. Take away the light. I cannot bear it. It troubles me. It is the effect of the wine, signor, said Grizo, still keeping at a distance. But go to bed. Sleep will do you good. You are right. If I could sleep, I am well, bear it not for the want of sleep. Place the little bell near me, in case I should want something, and be attentive if I ring. But I shall need nothing. Carry away that cursed light, added he. 
it troubles me more than i can tell griso carried off the light and wishing his master a good night he quitted the apartment as don roderick crouched beneath the bedclothes but the bedclothes weighed upon him like a mountain throwing them off he endeavoured to compose himself to sleep hardly had he closed his eyes when he awoke with a start as if he had been roused by a blow and he felt that the pain and fever had increased he endeavoured to find the cause of his sufferings in the heat of the weather the wine and the debauch in which he had just been engaged but one idea involuntarily mingled itself with all his reflections an idea at which he had been laughing all the evening with his companions as it was easier to make it a subject of raillery than to drive it away the idea of the plague after having struggled a long time he at last fell asleep but was tormented by frightful dreams it appeared to him that he was in a vast church in the midst of a crowd of people how he came there he could not tell nor how the thought to do so could have entered his head especially at such a time looking on those by whom he was surrounded he perceived them to be lean livid figures with wild and glaring eyes the garments of these hideous creatures fell in shreds from their bodies and through them might be seen frightful blotches and swellings he thought he cried give way you rascals as he looked towards the door which was far far off accompanying the cry with a menacing expression of countenance and wrapping his arms around his body to prevent coming in contact with them for fear they seemed to be touching him on every side but they moved not nor even seemed to hear him it appeared to him however that some one amongst them with his elbow pressed his left side near his heart where he felt a painful pricking trying to withdraw himself from so irksome a situation he experienced a recurrence of the sensation irritated beyond measure he stretched out his hand for his sword and behold it had glided the whole length of his body and the hilt of it was pressing him in this very place vainly did he endeavour to remove it every effort only increased his agonies agitated and out of breath he again cried aloud at the sound all those wild and hideous phantoms rushed to one side of the church leaving the pulpit exposed to view and which stood with his venerable countenance his bald head and white beard father christopher it appeared to don roderick that the capuchin after having looked over the assembly fixed his eyes upon him with the same expression as on the well-remembered interview in his castle and at the same time raised his arm and held it suspended above his head making an effort to arrest the blow a cry which struggled in his throat escaped him and he awoke he opened his eyes the light of day which was already advanced pressed upon his brain and imparted as keen an anguish as the torch of the preceding night looking around on his bed and his room he comprehended that it was a dream the church the crowd the friar all had vanished but not so the pain in his left side he was sensible of an agonizing and a rapid beating of his heart a buzzing in his ears an internal heat which consumed him and a weight and weariness in his limbs greater than when he went to bed he could not resolve to look at the spot where he felt the pain but finally gathering courage to do so he beheld with horror a hideous tumour of a livid purple don roderick saw that he was lost the fear of death took possession of him and with it came the apprehension stronger perhaps than the dread of death itself of becoming the prey of the monati and of being thrown into the lazaretto endeavouring to think of some means of avoiding this terrible fate he experienced a confusion and obscurity in his ideas which told him that the moment was fast approaching when he should have no feeling left but of despair seizing the bell he shook it violently griso who was on the watch appeared immediately stopping at a distance from the bed he looked attentively at his master and became certain of that which he had only conjectured the night before griso said don roderick with difficulty raising himself in his bed you have always been my favourite yes my lord i have always done well by you the consequence of your goodness i can trust you i think i am ill griso i perceived that you were if i am cured i will do still more for you than i have ever yet done griso made no answer waiting to see to what this preamble would lead i would not trust any one but you resumed don roderick do me a favour command me do you know where the surgeon chiodo lives i do he is an honest man who if he be well paid keep secret the sick go to him tell him i will give him four or six crowns a visit more if he wishes it tell him to come here immediately act with prudence let no one get knowledge of it 
well thought of, said Griso. I will return immediately. First, Griso, give me a little water. I burn with thirst. No, my lord, nothing without the advice of a physician. This is a rapid disease, and there is no time to lose. Be tranquil. In the twinkling of an eye, I will be here with the Signor Chiodo. So saying, he left the room. Don Roderick followed him in imagination to the house of Chiodo, counted his steps, measured the time. He often looked at his side, but, horror-struck, could only regard it a moment. Continuing to listen intently for the arrival of the surgeon, this effort of attention suspended the sense of suffering, and left him the free exercise of his thoughts. Suddenly he heard a noise of small bells, which appeared to come from some of the apartments, and not from the street. Listening again, he heard it louder, and at the same time a sound of steps. A horrible suspicion darted across his mind. He sat up, listened still more attentively, and heard a sound in the next chamber, as of a chest carefully placed on the floor. He threw his limbs out of bed, so as to be ready to rise, and kept his eyes fastened on the door. It opened, and behold, two monati with their diabolical countenances and cursed liveries advancing towards the bed, whilst from the half-open door was seen the figure of Griso, awaiting the success of his sordid treachery. Ha, infamous traitor, begum, rascals, Biondino, Carlotto, help, murder, cried Don Roderick, extending his hand under his pillow for his pistol. At his very first cry the Monati had rushed towards the bed, and the most active of the two was upon him before he could make another movement. Jerking the pistol from his hand and throwing it on the floor, he forced him to lie down, crying in an accent of rage and mockery. Ah, scoundrel! Against the Monati! Against the ministers of the tribunal! Keep him down until we are ready to carry him out, said the other as he advanced to a strong box. Grizo entered the room, and with him commenced forcing its lock. Villain! shouted Don Roderick, struggling to get free. Let me kill this infamous rascal, said he to the Monati. And then you may do with me what you will. He then called again loudly on his other servants, but in vain. The abominable Grizo had sent them far away with orders as if from his master, before he himself went to propose this expedition, and a share of its spoils, to the Monati. "'Be quiet! Be quiet!' said the man who held him extended on the bed, to the unhappy Don Roderick. Then, turning to those who were taking the booty, he said, "'Behave like honest men!' "'You! You!' murmured Don Roderick to Griso. "'You! After! Ha! Huh demon of hell i may still be cured i may still be cured griso spoke not a word and was careful to avoid looking at his master hold him tight said the other monato he is frantic the unfortunate man after many violent efforts became suddenly exhausted but from time to time was seen to struggle feebly and vainly for a moment against his persecutors the monati deposited him on a hand barrow which had been left in the outer room one of them returned for the booty, then raising their miserable burden, they carried him off. Griso remained a while to make a selection of such articles as were valuable and portable. He had been very careful not to touch the Monati, nor be touched by them, but in his thirst for gain, his prudence forsook him. Taking the different articles of his master's dress from off the bed, he shook them for the purpose of ascertaining if there was money in them. He had, however, occasion to remember his want of caution the next day. Whilst carousing in a tavern, he was seized with a shivering. His eyes grew dim, his strength failed, and he fell lifeless. Abandoned by his companions, he fell into the hands of the Monati, who, after having plundered him, threw him on a car where he expired before arriving at the lazaretto to which his master had been carried. We must leave Don Roderick in his abode of horror and return to Renzo, whom our readers may remember we left in a manufactory under the name of Antony Rivolta. He remained there five or six months, after which, war being declared between the Republic and the King of Spain, and all fear on his account having ceased, Bortolo hastened to bring him back, both because he was attached to him and because Renzo was a great assistance to the factotum of a manufactory, without the possibility of his ever aspiring to be one himself on account of his inability to write. Bortolo was a good man, and in the main generous, but, like other men, he had his failings, and as this motive really had a place in his calculations, we have thought it our duty to state it. From this time Renzo continued to work with his cousin. More than once, and especially after having received a letter from Agnes, he felt a desire to turn soldier, and opportunities were not wanting, for at this epoch the Republic was in want of recruits. 
The temptation was the stronger, as there was a talk of invading the Milanese, and it appeared to him that it would be a fine thing to return there as a conqueror, see Lucy again, and have an explanation with her. But Bortolo always diverted him from this resolution. "'If they go there,' said he, "'they can go without you, and you can go afterwards at your leisure. If they return with broken heads, you will be glad to have been out of the scrape.' The Milanese is not a mouthful to be easily swallowed. And then the question, my friend, turns on the power of Spain. Have a little patience. Are you not well here? I know what you will say. But if it is written above that the affair shall succeed, succeed it will, without your committing more follies. Some saint will come to your assistance. Believe me, war is not a trade for you it needs men expressly trained to the business at other times renzo thought of returning home in disguise under a false name but bortolo dissuaded him from this project also the plague afterwards spreading all over the milanese and advancing to the bergamascan territory don't be alarmed reader our design is not to relate its history all that we would say is that renzo was attacked with it and recovered he was at death's door but his strong constitution repelling the disease in a few days he was out of danger with life, the hopes and recollections and projects of life returned with greater vigor than ever. More than ever were his thoughts occupied with Lucy. What had become of her in these disastrous times? To be at so short distance from her, and to know nothing concerning her, and to remain God knows how long in this uncertainty. And then, her vow. I will go myself. I will go and relieve these terrible doubts said he if she lives i will find her i will hear herself explain this promise i will show her that it is not binding and i will bring her here and poor agnes also who has always wished me well and i am sure does so still yes i will go in search of them as soon as he was able to walk he went in search of bortolo who had kept himself shut up in his house on account of the pestilence. He called to him to come to the window. Ah, ah, said Bortolo. You have recovered. It is well for you. I have still some weakness in my limbs, as you see, but I am out of danger. Oh, I wish I was on your legs. Formerly, when one said, I am well, it expressed all that could be desired. But nowadays that is of little consequence. When one can say, I am better, that's the word for you. Renzo informed his cousin of his determination. Go now, and may heaven bless you, replied he. Avoid the law as I shall avoid the pestilence. And if it is the will of God, we shall see each other again. Oh, I shall certainly return, if I were only sure of not returning alone. I hope for the best. Well, I join in your hopes. If God wills, we will work and live together here. Heaven grant you may find me here, and that this devilish disease may have ceased. We shall meet again. We shall meet again, I am sure. I say again, God bless you. In a few days, Renzo, finding his strength sufficiently restored, prepared for his departure. He put on a girdle in which he placed the fifty crowns sent him by Agnes, together with his own small savings. He took under his arm a small bundle of clothes, and secured in his pocket his certificate of good conduct from his second master, and having armed himself with a good knife, a necessary appendage to an honest man in those days, he commenced his journey towards the end of August, three days after Don Roderick had been carried to the Lazzaretto. He took the road to Lecco before venturing into Milan, as he hoped to find Agnes there, and learn from her some little of what he desired so much to know. The small number of those who had been cured of the plague formed a privileged class amidst the rest of the population. Those who had not been attacked by the disease lived in perpetual apprehension of it. They walked about with precaution, with an unquiet air, with a hurried and hesitating step. The former, on the contrary, nearly certain of security, for to have the plague twice was rather a prodigy than a rarity advanced into the very midst of the pestilence with boldness and unconcern. With such security, tempered, however, by his own peculiar anxieties, and by the spectacle of the misery of a whole people, Renzo travelled towards his village, under a fine sky and through a beautiful country. 
meeting on the way, after long intervals of dismal solitude, men more like shadows and wandering phantoms than living beings, or dead bodies about to be consigned to the trench, without funeral rites. Towards the middle of the day he stopped in a grove to eat his meat and bread. He was bountifully supplied with fruits from the gardens by the road, for the year was remarkably fertile. The trees along the road were laden with figs, peaches, plums, apples, and other various kinds, with hardly a living creature to gather them. Towards evening he discovered his village. Although prepared for the sight, he felt his heart beat, and he was assailed in a moment by a crowd of painful recollections and harrowing presentiments. A death-like silence reigned around. His agitation increased as he entered the churchyard, and became hardly supportable at the end of the lane. It was there where stood the house of Lucy. One only of its inmates could now be there, and the only favor he asked from heaven was to find Agnes still living. He hoped to find an asylum at her cottage, as he judged truly that his own rouse to be in ruins. As he went on he looked attentively before him, fearing and at the same time hoping to meet someone from whom he might obtain information. He saw at last a man seated on the ground, leaning against a hedge of jessamines, in the listless attitude of an idiot. He thought it must be the poor simpleton Gervas, who had been employed as a witness in his unsuccessful expedition to the curate's house. But approaching nearer, he recognized it to be Anthony. The disease had affected his mind, as well as his body, so that in every act a slight resemblance to his weak brother might be traced. "'Oh, Tony,' said Renzo, stopping before him, "'is it you?' Tony raised his eyes, but not his head. "'Tony, do you not know me?' "'Is it my turn? Is it my turn?' replied he. "'Poor Tony, do you indeed not know me?' "'Is it my turn?' "'Is it my turn?' replied he with an idiotic smile, then stood with his mouth open. Renzo, seeing he could draw nothing from him, passed on still more afflicted than before. Suddenly, at a turn of the path, he beheld advancing towards him a person whom he recognized to be Don Abondio. His pale countenance and general appearance showed that he also had not escaped the tempest. The curate, seeing a stranger, anxiously examined his person, whose costume was that of Bergamo. At length he recognized Renzo with much surprise. "'Is it he? Indeed!' thought he, and raised his hands with a movement of wonder and dismay. His wasted arms seemed trembling in his sleeves, which before could hardly contain them. Renzo, hastening towards him, bowed profoundly, for although he had quitted him in anger, he still felt respect for him as his curate. "'You! Here! You!' cried Don Abondio. "'Yes, I am here, as you see.' Do you know anything of Lucy? How should I know? Nothing is known of her. She is at Milan, if she is still in this world. But you— And Agnes, is she living? Perhaps she is. But who do you think can tell? She is not here. But— Where is she? She has gone to Valsacina, among her relatives at Pasturo for they say that down there the pestilence has not made such ravages as it has here. But you, I say— I am glad of that, and, and Father Christopher? He has been gone this long time, but you— I heard that, but has he not returned? Oh, no, we have heard nothing of him. But you— I am sorry for it. But you, I say, what do you do here? For the love of heaven, have you forgotten that little circumstance of the order for your apprehension? What matters it? People have other things to think of now. I came here to see about my own affairs. There is nothing to see about. There is no one here now. It is the height of rashness in you to venture here, with this little difficulty impending. Listen to an old man who has more prudence than yourself and who speaks to you from the love he bears you. Depart at once, before any one sees you. Return whence you came. Do you think the air of this place good for you? Know you not that they have been here on the search for you? I know it too well, the rascals. But then— But I tell you, they think no more about it. And he, does he yet live? Is he here? I tell you, there is no one here. I tell you to think no more of the affairs of this place. I tell you that— I ask you if he is here. Oh, just heaven, speak in another manner. 
is it possible you still retain so much warmth after all that has happened is he here or is he not he is not but the plague my son the plague keeps everyone from travelling at present if the pestilence was all that we need fear i speak for myself i have had it and i fear it not you had better render thanks to heaven and i do from the bottom of my heart and not go in search of other evils i say listen to my advice you have had it also sir if i am not mistaken that i have truly most terrible it was it is by a miracle i am here you see how it has left me i have need of repose to restore my strength i was beginning to feel a little better in the name of heaven what do you do here go away i beseech you you always return to your go away if i ought to go away i would not have come you keep saying what do you come for what do you come for sir i am come home home tell me have there been many deaths here many cried donabondio and beginning with perpetua he gave a long list of individuals and even whole families renzo expected it is true a similar recital but hearing the names of so many acquaintances friends and relations he was absorbed by his affliction and could only exclaim from time to time misery 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 and it is not yet over pursued donabondio if those who remain do not listen to reason and calm the heat of their brains it will be the end of the world do not concern yourself i do not intend to remain here heaven be praised you talk reason at last go at once do not trouble yourself about it the affair belongs to me i think i have arrived at years of discretion i hope you will tell no one that you have seen me you are a priest and i am one of your flock you will not betray me i understand said donabondio angrily i understand you would ruin yourself and me with you what you have suffered what i have suffered is not sufficient i understand i understand in continuing to mutter between his teeth he proceeded on his way renzo afflicted and disappointed reflected where he should seek another asylum in the catalogue of deaths given to him by donabondio there was a family which had all been carried off by the pestilence with the exception of a young man nearly of his own age who had been his companion from infancy the house was a short distance off a little beyond the village he bent his steps thither to seek the hospitality which it might afford him on his way he passed his own vineyard the vines were cut the wood carried off weeds of various kinds and most luxuriant growth principally of the parasitical order covered the place displaying the most brilliant flowers above the loftiest branches of the vines and obstructing the progress of the miserable owner the garden beyond presented a similar scene of varied and luxuriant wilderness the house that had not escaped the visitation of the lansconets was deformed with filth dust and cobwebs poor renzo turned away with embittered feelings and moved slowly onward to his friends it was evening he found him seated before the door on a small bench his arms crossed on his breast with the air of a man stupefied by distress and suffering from solitude at the sound of steps he turned and the twilight and the foliage not permitting him to distinguish objects distinctly he said are there not others besides me did i not do enough yesterday leave me in quiet it will be an act of charity renzo not knowing what this meant called him by name renzo replied he it is indeed said renzo and they ran towards each other is it you indeed said his friend oh how happy i am to see you who would have thought it i took you for one of those persons who torment me daily to help to bury the dead know you that i am left alone 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 as a hermit i know it but too well said renzo they entered the cottage together each making numerous enquiries of the other his friend began to prepare the table for supper he went out and returned in a few moments with a pitcher of milk a little salt meat and some fruit they seated themselves at the table at which the polenta was not forgotten mutually congratulating each other on their interview an absence of two years and the circumstances under which they met revived and added new vigour to their former friendship no one however could supply the place of agnes to renzo not only on account of the particular affection she bore him 
but she alone possessed the key to the solution of all his difficulties. He hesitated a while whether he had not best go in search of her, as she was not very far off, but recollecting that he knew nothing of the fate of Lucy, he adhered to his first intention of gaining all the information he could concerning her, and carrying the result to her mother. He learned from his friend, however, many things of which he was ignorant. Others were explained which he only knew by halves, with regard to the adventures of Lucy and the persecution she had undergone. He was also informed that Don Roderick had left the village and had not returned. Renzo learnt, moreover, to pronounce the name of Don Ferrante properly. Agnes, it is true, had caused it to be written to him, but heaven knows how it was written, and the Burgomascan interpreter had given it so strange a sound that if he had not received some instruction from his friend, probably no one in Milan would have guessed whom he meant, although this was the only clue he had to guide him to Lucy. As far as the law was in question, his mind was set at rest. The Signor Podesta was dead, and most of the officers. The others were removed, or had other matters too pressing to occupy their attention. He related in his turn his own adventures to his friend, receiving in exchange an account of the passage of the army, the pestilence, the poisoners, and the prodigies. "'Dreadful as our afflictions,' said he, as he led him for the night to a little chamber which the epidemic had deprived of its inhabitants. "'There is a mournful consolation in speaking of them to our friends.' At the break of day they both arose, and Renzo prepared to depart. "'If all goes well,' said he, "'if I find her living, if I will return.' I will go to Pastoral and carry the joyful news to poor Agnes, and then, but if by a misfortune which may God avert, then I know not what I shall do, nor where I shall go, but you will never see me here again. As he stood on the threshold of the door, about to resume his journey, he contemplated for a moment, with a mixture of tenderness and anguish, his village, which he had not beheld for so long a time. His friend accompanied him a short distance on his road, and bade him farewell, prognosticating a happy return and many days of prosperity and enjoyment. Renzo travelled leisurely, because there was ample time for him to arrive within a short distance of Milan, so as to enter it on the morrow. His journey was without accident, except a repetition of the same wretched scenes that the roads at that time presented. As he had done the day before, he stopped in a grove to make a slight repast, which the generosity of his friend had bestowed on him. Passing through Monza, he saw loaves of bread displayed in the window of a shop. He bought two of them, but the shopkeeper called him not to enter, stretching out a shovel, on which was a small bowl of vinegar and water. He told him to throw the money into it, and then with a pair of tongs he reached the bread to him, which Renzo put in his pocket. Towards evening he passed through Greco, and quitting the high road, went into the fields in search of some small house where he might pass the night, as he did not wish to stop at an inn. He found a better shelter than he anticipated. Perceiving an opening in a hedge which surrounded the yard of a dairy, he entered it boldly. There was no one within. In one corner of it was a barn full of hay, and against the door of it a ladder placed. After looking around, Renzo ascended the ladder, settled himself for the night, and slept profoundly until the break of day. When he awoke, he descended the ladder very cautiously and proceeded on his way, taking the dome of the cathedral for his polar star. He soon arrived before the walls of Milan, near the eastern gate. End of chapter 32Chapter 33 of The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, translated by George William Fenshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 33 Renzo had heard vague mention made of severe orders forbidding the entrance of strangers into Milan without a certificate of health, but these were easily evaded, for Milan had reached a point when such prohibition was useless, even if it could have been put into execution. Whoever ventured there might rather appear careless of his own life than dangerous to that of others. With this conviction, Renzo's design was to attempt a passage at the first gate, and in case of difficulty, to wander on the outside of the walls until he should find one easy of access. It would be difficult to say how many gates he thought Milan had. When he arrived before the ramparts, he looked around him, but there was no indication of living being, except on a point of the platform, a thick cloud of dense smoke arising. This was occasioned by clothing, beds, and infected furniture which were committed to the flames. Everywhere along the ramparts appeared the traces of these melancholy conflagrations. The weather was close, the air heavy, the sky covered by a thick cloud or fog which excluded the sun without promising rain. The surrounding country was neglected and sterile, all verdure extinct, and not a drop of dew on the dry and withering leaves. The depth, solitude, and silence so near a large city increased the gloom of Renzo's thoughts. 
he proceeded without being aware of it to the gate nuova, which had been hid from his view by a bastion, behind which it was then concealed. A noise of bells, sounding at intervals mingled with the voices of men, saluted his ear. Turning an angle of the bastion, he saw before the gate a sentry-box, and a sentinel leaning on his musket, with a wearied and careless air. Exactly before the opening was a sad obstacle, a hand-barrow, upon which two monati were extending an unfortunate man to carry him off. It was the chief of the toll-gatherers, who had just been attacked by the pestilence. Renzo awaited the departure of the convoy, and no one appearing to close the gate, he passed forwards quickly. The sentinel cried out, Allah! Renzo, stopping, showed him a half-ducat, which he drew from his pocket. Whether he had had the pestilence, or that he feared it less than he loved ducats, he signed to Renzo to throw it to him. Seeing it at his feet, he cried, Go in, quickly. A permission of which Renzo readily availed himself. He had hardly advanced forty paces, when a toll-collector called to him to stop. He pretended not to hear, and passed on. The call was repeated, but in a tone more of anger than of resolution to be obeyed. In this being equally unheeded, the collector shrugged his shoulders and turned back to his room. Renzo proceeded through the long street opposite the gate which leads to the Canal Naviglio, and he had advanced some distance into the city without encountering a single individual. At last he saw a man coming towards him, from whom he hoped he might gain some information. He moved towards him, but the man showed signs of alarm at his approach. Renzo, when he was at a little distance, took off his hat, like a polite mountaineer as he was, but the man drew back, and raising a knotty club armed with a spike, he cried, Off! 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 Oh! Oh! cried Renzo, and he put on his hat, and having no desire for a greeting of this fashion, he turned his back on the discourteous passenger and went on his way. The citizen retired in an opposite direction, shuddering and looking back in alarm. When he reached home he related how a poisoner had met him with humble and polite manners, but with the air of an infamous impostor, and with a phial of poison— or the box of powder, he did not know exactly which, in the lining of his hat, to poison him, if he had not kept him at a distance. It was unlucky, said he, that we were in so private a street. If it had been in the midst of Milan, I would have called the people, and he would have been seized. But alone, it was enough to save myself. But who knows what destruction he may not already have effected in the city. And years after, when the poisoners were talked of, the poor man maintained the truth of the fact as he had had ocular proof. Renzo was far from suspecting the danger he had escaped, and, reflecting on this reception, he was more angry than fearful. This is a bad beginning, thought he. My star always seems unpropitious when I enter Milan. To enter is easy enough, but once here, misfortunes thicken. However, by the help of God, if I find... If I succeed in finding, all will be well. The streets were silent and deserted. No human being could he see. A single disfigured corpse met his eye in the channel between the street and the houses. Suddenly he heard a cry, which appeared addressed to him, and he perceived, not far off, on the balcony of a house, a woman surrounded by a group of children, making a sign to him to approach. As he did so, Oh, good young man, said she, do me the kindness to go to the commissary, and tell him that we are forgotten here. They have nailed up the house as suspected, because my poor husband is dead, and since yesterday morning no one has brought us anything to eat, and these poor innocents are dying of hunger. Of hunger! cried Renzo. Here, here! said he, drawing the two loaves from his pocket. Lower something in which I may put them. God reward you. Wait a moment, said the woman, as she went in search of a basket and cord to suspend it. "'As to the commissary, my good woman,' said he, putting the loaves in the basket, "'I cannot serve you, because, to tell the truth, I am a stranger in Milan, and know nothing of the place. However, if I meet any one a little humane and tractable, to whom I can speak, I will tell him.' The woman begged him to do so, and gave him the name of the street in which she lived. "'You can also render me a service, without its costing you anything,' said Renzo. Can you tell me where there is a nobleman's house in Milan named... Uh... I know there is a house of that name, but I do not know where it is. Further on in the city you will probably find someone to direct to, and remember to speak of us. Do not doubt me, said Renzo as he passed on. As he advanced, he heard increasing a sound that had already attracted his attention, while stopping to converse with the poor woman, a sound of wheels and horses' feet, with the noise of little bells, and occasionally the cracking of whips and loud cries. 
As he reached the square of San Marco, the first objects he saw were two beams erected with a cord and pulleys. He recognized the horrible instrument of torture. These were placed on all the squares and widest streets, so that the deputies of each quarter of the city, furnished with the most arbitrary power, could subject to them whoever quitted a condemned house or neglected the ordinances, or by any other act appeared to merit the punishment. It was one of those extreme and inefficacious remedies, which, at this epoch, were so absurdly authorized. Now, whilst Renzo was gazing at this machine, he heard the sounds increasing, and beheld a man appear, ringing a little bell. It was an apparitore, and behind him came two horses, who advanced with difficulty, dragging a car loaded with dead. And after this car came another, and another, and another. Monati walked by the side of the horses, urging them on with their whips and with oaths. The bodies were for the most part naked. Some were half covered with rags, and heaped one upon another. At each jolt of the wretched vehicles, heads were seen hanging over, the long tresses of women were displayed, arms were loosened and striking against the wheels, thrilling the soul of the spectator with indescribable horror. The youth stopped at a corner of the square to pray for the unknown dead. A frightful thought passed over his mind. There, perhaps there with them. O oh God, avert this misfortune. Let me not think of it. The funeral convoy having passed on, he crossed the square and reached the Borgo Nuovo by the bridge Marcellino. He perceived a priest standing before a half-open door in an attitude of attention as if he were confessing someone. Here, said he, is my man. If a priest, and in the discharge of his duty, has no benevolence, there is none left in the world who has. When he was at a few paces distance from him, he took off his hat and made a sign that he wished to speak with him, keeping, however, at a discreet distance, so as not to alarm the good man unnecessarily. Renzo, having made his request, was directed to the hotel. May God watch over you now and forever, said Renzo. And, added he, I would ask another favor and he mentioned the poor forgotten woman. The worthy man thanked him for affording him the opportunity to bestow help where it was so greatly needed, and bade him farewell. Renzo found it difficult enough to recollect the various turnings pointed out by the priest, disturbed as his mind was by apprehensions for the issue of his inquiries. An end was about to be put to his doubts and fears. He was to be told, she is living, or she is dead. This idea took such powerful possession of his mind that at this moment he would rather have remained in his former ignorance and have been at the commencement of the journey, to the end of which he so nearly approached. He gathered courage, however. Ah, cried he, if I play the child now, how will it end? Plunging, therefore, into the heart of the city, he soon reached one of its most desolated quarters, that which is called the Carrobio di Porta Nuova. The fury of the contagion here, and the infection from the scattered bodies, had been so great that those who had survived had been obliged to fly, so that, whilst the passenger was struck with the aspect of solitude and death, his senses were painfully affected by the traces of recent life. Renzo hastened on, hoping to find an improvement in the scene before he should arrive at the end of his journey. In fact, he soon reached what might still be called the city of the living, but alas, what living! Every door was closed from distrust and terror except such as had been left open by the flight of the inhabitants, or by the monati. Some were nailed on the outside, because there were within people dead or dying of the pestilence. Others were marked with a cross for the purpose of informing the monati that their services were required. And much of this was done more by chance than otherwise, as a commissary of health happened to be in one spot rather than in another, and chose to enforce the regulations. On every side were seen infected rags and bandages, clothes and sheets, which had been thrown from the windows, dead bodies which had been left in the streets until a car should pass to take them up, or which had fallen from the cars themselves, or been thrown from the houses. So much had the long duration and the violence of the pest brutalized men's minds, and subdued every spark of human feeling or sympathy. The customary sounds of human occupation or pleasure had ceased, and this silence of death was interrupted only by the funeral cars, the lamentations of the sick, the shrieks of the frantic, or the vociferations of the monati. At the break of day, at noon, and at night, a bell of the cathedral gave the signal for reciting certain prayers which had been ordered by the archbishop, and this was followed by the bells of the other churches. Then persons were seen at the windows, and a confused blending of voices and groans was heard, which inspired a sorrow not, however, unmixed with consolation. It is probable that at this time not less than two-thirds of the inhabitants had died, and of the remainder many were sick or had left the city. Everyone you met exhibited signs of the dreadful calamity. The usual dress was changed of every order of persons. The cloak of the gentleman, the robe of the priest, the cowl of the monk, 
In short, every loose appendage of dress that might occasion contact was carefully dismissed. Everything was as close on the person as possible. Men's beards and hair were alike neglected from fear of treachery on the part of the barbers. Every man walked with a stick or even a pistol to prevent the approach of others. Equal care was shown in keeping the middle of the street to avoid what might be thrown from windows, and in avoiding the noxious matters in the road. But if the aspect of the uninfected was appalling, how shall we describe the condition of the wretched sick in the street, tottering or falling to rise no more? Beggars, children, women. Renzo had travelled far on his way, through the midst of this desolation, when he heard a confused noise in which was distinguishable the horrible and accustomed tinkling of bells. At the entrance of one of the most spacious streets he perceived four cars standing. Monati were seen entering houses, coming forth with burdens on their shoulders and laying them on the cars. Some were clothed in their red dress, others without any distinctive mark but the greater number with a mark more revolting still than their customary dress, plumes of various colors which they wore with an air of triumph in the midst of the public mourning, and whilst people from the different windows around were calling to them to remove the dead. Renzo avoided as much as possible the view of the horrid spectacle, but his attention was soon attracted by an object of singular interest. A female, whose aspect won the regards of every beholder, came out of one of the houses and approached the cars. In her features was seen beauty, veiled and clouded, but not destroyed, by the mortal debility which seemed to oppress her, the soft and majestic beauty which shines in the Lombard blood. Her step was feeble, but decided. She wept not, although there were traces of tears on her countenance. There was a tranquillity and profundity in her grief, which absorbed all her powers. But it was not her appearance alone which excited compassion in hearts nearly closed to every human feeling. She held in her arms a young girl, about nine years of age, dead but dressed with careful precision. Her hair divided smoothly on her pale forehead, and clothed in a robe of the purest white. She was not lying, but was seated on the arm of the lady, her head leaning on her shoulder. You would have thought she breathed, if a little white hand had not hung down with inanimate weight, and her head reposed on the shoulder of her mother, with an abandonment more decided than that of sleep. Of her mother! It was indeed her mother! If the resemblance of their features had not told it, you would have known it by the expression of that fair and lovely countenance. A hideous monato approached the lady, and with unusual respect offered to relieve her of her burden. No, said she, with an appearance neither of anger nor disgust. Do not touch her yet. It is I who must place her on the car. Take this. And she dropped a purse into the hands of the monato. Promise me not to touch a hair of her head, nor to let others do it and bury her thus. The monato placed his hand on his heart, and respectfully prepared a place on the car for the infant dead. The lady, after having kissed her forehead, placed her on it as carefully as if it were a couch, spread over her a white cloth, and took a last look. Farewell, Cecilia. Rest in peace. Tonight we will come to you, and then we shall be separated no more. Turning again to the monato, As you pass tonight, said she, you will come for me, and not for me only. She returned into the house, and a moment after appeared at a window, holding in her arms another cherished child, who was still living, but with the stamp of death on her countenance. She contemplated the unworthy obsequies of Cecilia, until the car disappeared from her eyes, and then left the window with her mournful burden. And what remained for them but to die together, as the flower which proudly lifts its head falls with the bud, under the desolating scythe which levels every herb of the field? "'O oh God!' cried Renzo. "'Save her! Protect her! Her and this innocent creature!' They have suffered enough. They have suffered enough. He then proceeded on his way, filled with emotions of distress and pity. Another convoy of wretched victims encountered him at a cross street on their way to the lazaretto. Some were imploring to be allowed to die in their own beds in peace, some moving on with imbecile apathy, women as usual with their little ones, and even some of these supported and encouraged with manly devotion by their brothers a little older than themselves, and whom alone the plague had for a time spared for this affecting office. When the miserable crowd had nearly passed, he addressed a commissary whose aspect was a little less savage than the rest, and inquired of him the street and the house of Don Ferrante. He replied, The first street to the right, the last hotel to the left. The young man hastened thither, with new and deeper trouble at his heart. Easily distinguishing the house, he approached the door, raised his hand to the knocker, and held it suspended a while, before he could summon resolution to knock. At the sound, a window was half opened, and a female appeared at it looking towards the door with a countenance which appeared to ask, Is it Monati, thieves, or poisoners? Signora, said Renzo, but in a tremulous voice, 
is there not here in service a young villager of the name of lucy she's no longer here be gone replied the woman about to close the window a moment i beseech you she is no longer here where is she at the lazaretto a moment for the love of heaven with the pestilence yes it is something very uncommon is it not be gone then wait an instant w was she very ill is it long since but this time the window was closed entirely oh senora senora one word for charity alas alas for one word but he might as well have talked to the wind afflicted by this intelligence and vexed with the rude treatment of the woman renzo seized the knocker again and raised it for the purpose of striking in his distress he turned to look at the neighboring houses with the hope of seeing some one who would give him more satisfactory information but the only person he discovered was a woman about twenty paces off who with an appearance of terror anger and impatience was making signs to some one to approach and this she did as if not wishing to attract renzo's notice perceiving him looking at her she shuddered with horror what the devil said renzo threatening her with his fist but she having lost the hope of his being seized unexpectedly cried aloud a poisoner catch him catch him stop the poisoner who i old sorceress be silent cried renzo as he approached her in order to compel her to be so but he soon perceived that it was best to think of himself as the cry of the woman had gathered people from every quarter not in so great numbers as would have been seen three months before under similar circumstances but still many more than one man could resist at this moment the window was again opened and the same discourteous woman appeared at it crying seize him seize him he must be one of the rascals who wander about to poison the doors of people renzo determined in an instant that it was better to fly than to stop to justify himself rapidly casting his eyes around to see on which side there were the fewest people and fighting his way through those that opposed him he soon freed himself from their clutches the street was deserted before him but behind him the terrible cries still resounded seize him stop him a poisoner it gained on him steps were close at his heels his anger became rage his agony despair drawing his knife from his pocket and brandishing it in the air he turned crying aloud let him who dares come here the rascal and i will poison him indeed with this but he saw with astonishment and pleasure that his persecutors had already stopped as if some obstacle opposed their path and were making frantic gestures to persons beyond him turning again he beheld a car approaching and even a file of cars with their usual accompaniments beyond them was another little band of people prepared to seize the poisoner but prevented by the same obstacle seeing himself thus between two fires it occurred to renzo that that which was the object of terror to these people might be to him a source of safety reflecting that this was not a moment for fastidious scruples he advanced towards the cars passed the first and perceiving in the second a space large enough to receive him threw himself into it bravo bravo, bravo, bravo. cried the monati with one shout some of them were following the convoy on foot others were seated on the cars others on the dead bodies drinking from an enormous flagon which they passed around bravo that was well done you have placed yourself under the protection of the monati you are as safe as if you were in a church said one who was seated on the car into which renzo had thrown himself the enemy was obliged to retreat crying however seize him seize him he is a poisoner let me silence them said the monato and drawing from one of the dead bodies a dirty rag he tied it up in a bundle and made a gesture as if intending to throw it among them crying here rascals at the sight all fled away in horror a howl of triumph arose from the monati aha you see we can protect honest people said the monato to renzo one of us is worth a hundred of those cowards i owe my life to you said renzo and i thank you sincerely tis a trifle a trifle you deserve it tis plain to be seen you're a brave fellow you do well to poison this rabble extirpate the fools who as a reward for the life we lead say that the plague once over they will hang us all they must all be finished before the plague ceases the minority alone must remain to sing for victory and to feast in milan life to the pestilence and death to the rabble cried another putting the flag into his mouth from which he drank freely and then offered it to renzo saying drink to our health 
I wish it to you all, said Renzo. But I am not thirsty, and I do not want to drink now. You have been terribly frightened, it seems, said the Monato. You appear to be a harmless sort of person. You should have another face than that for a poisoner. Give me a drop, said a Monato, who walked by the side of the cars. I would drink to the health of the nobleman, who is here in such good company, in yonder carriage. And with a malignant laugh he pointed to the car in which poor Renzo was seated. Then, brutally composing his features to an expression of gravity, he bowed profoundly, saying, Will you permit, my dear master, a poor devil of a monato to taste a little wine from your cellar? Do now, because we lead rough lives, and moreover, we are doing you the favor to take you a ride into the country. And besides, you are not accustomed to wine, and it might harm your lordship. But the poor monati have good stomachs. His companions laughed loudly. He took the flagon, and before he drank, turned again to Renzo, and with an air of insulting compassion, said, The devil with whom you have made a compact must be very young. If we had not saved you, you would have been none the better for his assistance. His companions laughed louder than before, and he applied the flagon to his lips. Leave some for us. Some for us, cried those from the forward car. After having taken as much as he wanted, he returned the flagon to his companions, who passed it on, the last of the company, having emptied it, threw it on the pavement, crying, Long live the pestilence! Then they commenced singing a lewd song, in which they were accompanied by all the voices of the horrible choir. This infernal music, blended with the tingling of the bells, the noise of the wheels, and of the horses' feet, resounded in the empty silence of the streets, echoed through the houses, wringing the hearts of the very few who still inhabited them. But the danger of the preceding moment had rendered more than tolerable to Renzo the company of these wretches and the dead they were about to inter. And even this music was almost agreeable to his ears, as it relieved him from the embarrassment of such conversation. He returned thanks to Providence for having enabled him to escape from his peril, without receiving or doing an injury, and he prayed God to help him now deliver himself from his liberators. He kept on the watch to seize the first opportunity of quietly quitting the car, without exciting the opposition of his protectors. At last they reached the lazzaretto. At the appearance of a commissary, one of the two monati, who were on the car with Renzo, jumped to the ground, in order to speak with him. Renzo, hastily quitting the ear, said to the other, I thank you for your good kindness. God reward you. Go, go, poor poisoner, replied he. It will not be you who will destroy Milan. Fortunately, no one heard him. Renzo hastened onwards by the wall, crossed the bridge, passed the convent of the Capuchins, and then perceived the angle of the lazzaretto. In front of the enclosure, a horrible scene presented itself to his view. Arrived in front of the lazzaretto, throngs of sick were pressing into the avenues which led to the building. Some were seated or lying in the ditch, which bordered the road on either side, their strength not having sufficed to enable them to reach their asylum, or who, having quitted it in desperation, were too weak to go further. Others wandered by themselves, stupefied and insensible to their condition. One was quite animated, relating his imaginations to a miserable companion, who was stretched on the ground, oppressed by suffering. Another was furious with despair. A third, more horrible still, was singing in a voice above all the rest, and with heart-rending hilarity, one of the popular songs of love, gay and playful, which the Milanese call Villanelle. Already weary, and confounded at the view of so much misery concentrated within so small a space, our poor Renzo reached the gate of the lazzaretto. He crossed the threshold, and stood for a moment motionless under the portico. End of chapter 33